Hello, I'm Dr. Kent Holtorf, host of the Peptide Summit. I want to really thank you for joining us. I really think you'll be blown away with information that is almost too amazing to be true. Uh, but these experts see incredible benefits of peptides every day in their practice, as we do, and are willing to share their knowledge and their secrets. I think just about everyone will find the summit incredibly informative, and not only useful, but really invaluable and the information will improve your health in ways you really never felt possible. The Summit experts will explain how to get you feeling and looking at your best. Um, I think everyone really needs to watch the Summit. If you're a lay person who is just curious about peptides to stay healthy, and you've, you've heard about it from your friends or on the internet, you're a weekend warrior who's lost your edge, you wanna prevent or reverse aging, or you suffer from a wide range of chronic illnesses that you can't find effective treatments, which is so common nowadays. These experts have been using peptide therapies for years with conditions and situations, uh, ex expected results, proper dosing regimens and protocols, and they will provide countless treatment pearls uh, that can be used by patients, if you're a patient, and doctors to get the best results. So whether you're new to peptides or you're highly experienced in the use of peptides, I'm sure you will find invaluable treatment knowledge and pearls to help your patients, um, especially if you're a healthcare provider, but also really how to help yourself when you've been to numerous physicians or even just trying to gain that edge back, you know, and in a extremely safe way. So in summary, um, I want to thank you for watching this video and considering uh, signing up for the summit. I really think you'll find the information unique and just you'll really find that uh, you have new ways to basically either treat yourself and optimize your health or if you're a healthcare practitioner, a new way to help patients that you thought you couldn't help before. So I'm very excited to, to uh, put on this summit and just think that so many people can benefit from peptides and really trying to get the word out. And so I welcome you and uh, glad you can join us. I'm very excited to share with you information on the toxicity of EMFs. Uh, this is uh, one of those subjects that the more you dig in the medical literature, th the more you can't believe the massive amount of literature and data that's showing that EMFs at supposedly safe levels are very toxic um, and clearly showing that. So um, I'm going to uh, hopefully give you a, a little uh, taste of, of the literature and there are just massive amounts. I, I'm just scraping the surface here for you guys. Um, you know, if, if EMFs were a drug, they would never get approved. They would be immediately recalled. Um, and, uh, you know, I speak on a wide range of topics and I often hear, oh, there's so much you know, basically medical literature, why haven't I heard of this before? And the answer is usually money and, and or politics are usually both. Um, so, but I'll, I'll present a little bit and give you a, a taste of, you know, some of the data. When looking through it, I'm just blown away at the basically massive amounts of literature that are showing how EMFs are affecting our lives. So um, we'll get started here. So counteracting EMF toxicity with peptides, really the EMF's the silent killer. Um, disclosures, I'm owner of a Holdorf Medical Group, uh, Chief Medical Officer of the nonprofit National Academy of Hypothyroidism, um, and Chief Medical Officer of Integrative Peptides. And in uh, full interest of disclosure, the uh, uh, legal team is making me say this. So uh, I am Chief Medical Officer of Integrative Peptides. The opinions expressed are mine and, not and do not necessarily reflect those of Integrative Peptides and none of the information and claims contained within this presentation pertain to a specific product. 
and are not endorsed by integrated peptides and have not been reviewed by the FDA. And no statements in this presentation have been evaluated by the FDA. Uh, products from integrated peptides are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And you have the legalese on the right there. So, um, right, goals and objectives that we'll talk about what, what are EMFs and how do they work? Uh, we'll talk about man-made versus natural, which is a big difference. Types of exposure, the controversies, the effects of EMFs on, he on health, of course, and how it relates to really multi-system dysfunction that we see with other chronic illnesses and other toxic exposures. Uh, cellular effects, neurologic, immunologic, behavior, psychological effects, cardiovascular, thyroid, and hormonal effects. Uh, we'll go through basically a little intro to peptides and the basic major class of peptides, including really the core of all this will come down. I hope I can convey is that immune modulating and with all the common denominator of all these illnesses is immune dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, but with the peptides, you can get much more specific and with brain, uh, mitochondrial, um, boosting, you know, kind of anti-aging, anti-inflammatory. We'll talk about the importance of the gut-brain axis. And, you know, the more we learn about the gut-brain axis is the more we learn it's important and EMFs really affect that a lot um, and which then goes along to everything's a vicious cycle and really the synergy between multiple peptide therapies and other therapies as well. So what are EMF? So there's a typical cell tower hidden in a fake palm tree. Um, but uh, so going back to physics and don't get too hung up with this, but there's basically EMFs, electromagnetic fields are, there's the electrical field and the magnetic field, and they're perpendicular to each other. So there's basically a wave and you can see here, electrical field goes one way and then 90 degrees, there's the magnetic field. And where do these come from? So the extremely low electromagnetic fields are, um, uh, basically from the you know, that's like cell towers um, in which or the high tension wires where really you'll find that the magnetic part of that is the biggest problem rather than the electric field in those. We're more associated with leukemias and cancer. Then you start getting into where this is where we're really talking about is the um, EMFs here in the um, uh, range here where you get cell phones and the um, uh, the routers and the Wi-Fi's. Those are the are by far the biggest problems. And then you get also electromagnetic fields from wiring in your house um, and things like that, which they all cause problems. Um, but really, uh, I I think with the Wi-Fi and the cell phones, and I'll, I'll show you studies where just the, a cell phone can cause basically brain damage and, you know, showing with, with rats learning disabilities and actual uh, brain damage, uh, actually. So, and we're being bombarded with this and, and how they actually, all these um, EMFs coming from multiple sources in nature, they cancel each other out, but with artificial, they actually combine to be stronger. So that's that's a major problem. And this is the basically a uh, cell tower here, and this is the electrical field, but there's also magnetic field associated with that. And just another depiction here of the magnetic field when you have um, current going through a wire, there's electrical field and then a magnetic field around it, again, perpendicular. But, um, and, but a key is polarization. So in nature, basically the EMFs are created from uh, natural sources where basically electrons are changing from uh, 
basically uh, different states and they're putting off in random directions and they end up canceling each other out. So really all you get is when you get exposed to those, let's say it's the sun or the earth, is you can get thermal, um, basically an uh, excitation of uh, molecules, but they don't change. They don't cause an electric charge in the body like the basic artificial ones do. So the man-made here, you look at the, the waves here, and when they're basically in sync, they combine to cause a bigger wave, and they can also cancel each other out. Um, so all types of man-made EMFs are polarized. So they only have one direction. Well, again, naturally they're non-polarized. They're in all directions. And so when you have multiple sources, they cancel each other out. But when basically they're typically sent out in the vertical, like with antennas, that you get these basically spots that are additive and you'll get low spots. So you can get these and also coming from multiple sources, you can have spots randomly and also moving where are huge levels of electromagnetic radiation. Um, again, the, the, from the sun, light bulbs are non-polarized. So infinite number of, of planes, so um, they cancel each other out. Um, and where, as you can see here, you know, basically going from all around, it equals zero. But when you have them all in one direction, you're going to get additive parts and you're going to get parts that cancel each other out. Um, so in nature, there's no force on a charged polar molecule other than if there's just general increase in molecular uh, Brownian motion, basically it heats up the tissue. Um, but very different with man-made EMFs. Again, they're polarized. Um, and the problem is when they look at safety, they're looking at just what basically it can happen with the amount of thermal increase, like how much heat, but that's not the problem. It's that when it's polarized is, and also it's AC current, which goes back and forth, it causes all these cells in your body to line up, charged molecules to line up and go back and forth and, uh, and, and uh, oscillate with the current. And we have not, basically millions of years have not been exposed to this. Um, so basically you get uh, huge amounts of EMF energies at points that are unpredictable. They vary in location and strength depending upon the location and source and the frequency. Um, you get hot spots where all of a sudden they all come together and where you get huge, um, huge levels. And just some more here about where, how the waves will basically combine. Um, but if they're non-polarized, they cancel each other out. And what we're finding is that the biggest problem is the cell membrane sensors for the gated ion channels, especially the calcium ion channel, uh, will open. And this is the same thing that is happening with the cell danger response that allows calcium channels to be opened and cause mitochondrial dysfunction, which then becomes a huge vicious cycle, uh, vicious cycle with immune dysfunction, a hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction, and it just goes around and around. Um, and where natural EMFs won't do that. So, um, you know, throughout uh, evolution or, or time on earth, we've been exposed to non-polarized uh, EMFs, but we've never been exposed to uh, the polarized EMFs. Um, uh, and uh, so basically just a millionth of a non-polarized uh, EMF, a polarized can have a biologic effect. And when you, when you look at the studies, you'll find that if you look at industry studies, about 70% show that EMFs are totally safe, don't worry about it, and about 30% show they're harmful. But if you look at non-industry funded 
uh, studies, 70% show they're harmful and 30% show no effect. So you'll see that a lot, unfortunately, in medicine. Um, and uh, unfortunately, and this is also in the range of so-called accepted safe range of significant toxicity. So again, if this were a drug, it would never even be considered. And also when, when you look at how EMFs are put out artificially, they're put in pulses. And as you can see here, and the pulses are what get you. It's not the average because these high levels of EMF will now cause alignment of these, all the polar molecules in your body, whether they're, again, we'll talk more about the, the uh, 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 gated voltage channels and other things. And they have a huge effect on the body where, but the average is very low because they're, it's, it's basically their pulse. So a lot of times you won't have anything, but all of a sudden a big hit of EMF. Um, even just one watt emitted from a mobile phone can cause DNA damage. Um, the, the safety data standards um, estimate the potential thermal damage, again, using non-polarized, uh, but that's not the problem. It's the problem is, is this, how it caused your uh, body, these molecules to line up and, and um, oscillate. So the black tree of the EMFs correlate with the peak pulse is not the average, um, which is this is how Wi-Fi uh, work, your cell towers, your cell phone, it's always sending out pulses. Um, so they're much more uh, potent, able to elicit a biologic response at tiny doses that would never, you know, thermally heat up your body. Um, so they assume that they're safe, but it's a totally wrong assumption. So thousands of studies have shown and support the fact that very low intensity polarized pulsed non-thermally acting EMFs can result in abnormal activation of the voltage gated calcium channels at that are 7 million times lower than what is considered safe. So they, again, they just look at, well, it's gonna heat up the body. Let's look at electric cars uh, for a second here. Now, the middle body even of a car is a conductor of medical electricity. It's like a Faraday cage. And I don't know if you know what that is, but if you remember the pictures of Tesla in a cage where all the electro, um, lightning bolts are all around him, but he's, he's totally fine. So that insulates the person inside from the electromagnetic field. But if you have electromagnetic field coming from inside the Faraday cage, it is amplified tremendously. So anything that's going on inside the car, whether it's if you have a cell phone, the Bluetooth, um, all the electronics in the car, they're hugely magnified because they don't escape. The car, I mean, it's not a perfect Faraday cage, but it, it is pretty good. And modern cars have so many different um, computer parts that are sending out um, you know, EMFs and connecting to one another and Bluetooth, um, that it's a problem. But then when you look at electric cars, now we go to even bigger uh, level here. Um, they pose a significantly larger, they have, you know, huge electrical currents and batteries. Uh, the tested magnetic fields exceed 30 times levels that are seen in very close proximity to the high tension wires. So with high tension wires, you get about 0.2 to five um, uh, micro Tesla uh, magnetic field units. But you can see here on the left that in like the BMW, if you sit in the back seat, it gets about to a hundred and the Nissan uh, about a hundred in the front seat with the Tesla about 50 in the back seat, uh, the Volkswagen about you know 86 in the front seat. So huge. And the Australian um, uh, Radiation Protection Nuclear Safety Agency states that areas having um, uh, oscillating magnetic fields between two and 100 
uh, micro Tesla must have an appropriate warning sign. Okay, and these are right there in the hundreds and fields above 100 must be controlled by a permit. So it's like, it's like toxic. You got to warn people. I, I've never seen a warning label on an electric car. And just looking at a pulled analysis of nine studies reported a twofold increased risk of childhood leukemia in children exposed to 0.4 micro Tesla or higher. And again, we're talking about a hundred here um, where they're, you know, average in here, again, average is not, is not the big problem, but, you know, like five, six, seven, but, you know, getting up to 150 to 100. So at 0.4 higher increase leukemia. A meta-analysis of 15 studies showed a 1.7 increase in childhood leukemia among children with exposures of 0.3 units, uh, uh, micro Tesla or higher. Again, the electric cars are way above that. Hundred, you know, uh, hundreds of times higher. And um, basically another uh, study showing 1.4 increase at again, 0.3 or higher of leukemia. So people, you know, with the electric cars, hey, I want to, you know, decrease my carbon footprint, and um, that's all, all great. But uh, you're you're getting into a basically huge electromagnetic field, and you know, what's the biggest way you can reduce your carbon footprint is not have children, and you may not be able to have children if you're driving around an electric car. Um, and I, I did, I took out this, the studies on on fertility, but just because we had uh, too many things to go through, but um, it's it, it, it's a major problem. And then, you know, put children in an electric car that are much more susceptible to electromagnetic fields. I, you know, I, I won't get an electric car, but um, uh, I'll probably get, you know, Tesla will send a hitman off after me, but, um, well, what are the effects of EMF? So let's talk about that. So uh, we see in the studies, um, anxiety, depression, ADD, OCD, stress, uh, more emotional, uh, you know, lack of sleep, I think is, is the biggest thing you don't. If you have like Wi-Fi and electromagnetic fields when you're sleeping, you don't go into deep sleep. Um, and hugely associated with Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative diseases, ALS, huge association. Cognitive dysfunction, learning and memory, and we'll look at a lot of studies with that. Hypothalamic, pituitary, tons of hormonal deficiencies, uh, pineal, thymus gland dysfunction. So, um, and we'll talk about which is kind of a key to aging. So it's really an accelerated aging. These EMFs are making, making us age so much faster. And we're getting all these diseases of aging when we're younger. And, you know, and I, I look back, you know, 20 years ago, I don't remember everyone being sick, but it seems like everyone's sick and everyone has these kind of diseases of aging and they're young. Uh, again, sleep disorders, insomnia, brain tumors, tinnitus. Um, um, the um, uh, but, but basically a, a brain blood barrier and even just almost instantaneously your blood brain barrier will open up in electromagnetic field um, it's it's crazy and goes along with the gut so all these people have leaky gut which means leaky brain uh, emfs are certainly contributing and a lot of things contribute so it's another thing that is causing huge problems uh, it's also, you know, shown to uh, basically stimulate the growth of toxic molds and make them uh, stimulate them to secrete mycotoxins at a million fold times higher in, in the presence of electromagnetic fields. So it's, it's getting us multiple ways and you were finding all these, you know, mold problems, which, you know, no one was talking about mold problems 20 years ago. Um, EMFs are making mold just grow everywhere and much more toxic, much more toxic. And it's making the bacteria also become uh, resistant to antibiotics. So it's, it's bad stuff. Uh, inflammation, cause lots of inflammation, um, uh, IL-6 interleukin-6, and we'll talk about that. 
And a core thing, and again, we've kind of turned into an immune modulating clinic because all these things have a very underlying common pathophysiology of this immune dysfunction of a Th1 Treg to Th2 Th17 ship. So Th1, basically think about it, gets stuff inside the cell. Th2 gets stuff outside the cell. Usually they're balanced, but with chronic illness, with EMFs, um, basically toxins, aging, inflammation, your Th1 goes down. You can't fight intercellular infections, but the Th2 goes up you get all this inflammation, autoimmunity, and all these problems. And then also TH17 goes along with that. So, uh, don't want to make it too complicated there. Mass cell activation, uh, huge problem that we didn't see 20 years ago. Uh, again, stimulates pathogens that I was talking about. Other toxins are synergistic with it. Showing, you know, heavy metals that you be fine with heavy metals until you get into an EMF field. Autoimmunity. Uh, it's causing uh, diabetes and insulin resistance, mitochondrial dysfunction. And uh, it's very interesting when you look at those calcium, those voltage gated uh, calcium channels and all the work by amazing work by uh, Navio and looking at the cell danger response where the mitochondria, where we think of them as just creating energy, but they direct so many things in the cell. And what happens, they get leaky. Um, and so it just, and they can't produce energy. Instead, they produce inflammation. And this is what happens when you basically get in, in, uh, in EMF field, your mitochondria get leaky and calcium floods in and you don't make ATP, but you make inflammatory reactive oxygen species um, and you just become totally inflamed. Uh, cardiovascular dysfunction. And I can't tell you how many people you know, with palpitations and um, sensitive is that if they get out of the Wi-Fi and um, uh, but basically like shut off their Wi-Fi at night and, you know, and, and basically protect themselves that all of a sudden their palpitations and heart problems go away. And again, with that, because of that calcium channel uh, that is causing uh, basically the heart to flutter uh, and palpitations. Uh, hypertension from inflammation, fatigue, weakness, pain, increased cancer, we'll talk about, DNA damage. And, you know, it's basically called non-ionizing uh, radiation. It's not powerful enough to, to basically directly damage your DNA, but it certainly indirectly damages your, uh, damages your uh, DNA. And also epigenetically, meaning that it will turn on certain genes and turn off certain genes. And it turns on all these inflammatory genes and genes that are not healthy. So you get leaky gut, leaky brain, infertility, EMF sensitivity syndrome, which um, more and more people, uh, it, it's occurring in kind of the multiple chemical sensitivity where, where they're treated like they're just making it up. Uh, but I'll show you some studies where they're not making it up that they uh, are blinded to the fact that they're in a field or not and they have total um, change their physiology. So really over the last 20 years, a robust, uh, a ro a robust body of independent science has emerged showing significant negative biologic uh, impacts of exposure from EMFs. And there's clear evidence that you children get developmental delay, neurological and cognitive dysfunction or degenerative diseases, heart abnormalities, thyroid and hormone deficiencies, reproductive effects. And also with a mother just holding her cell phone, you know, basically on her stomach, not only affects the baby, but if affects because it's it's basically affecting the gonads of the baby. So it's the baby's baby as well. So it's multi-generational. Um, increased lots of inflammation, again, immune dysfunction, the mitochondrial, um, epigenetic is is huge. Um, abnormal activation of the uh, voltage-gated ion, which again, we'll talk about leaky gut, uh, just some serious health problems. And um, this was in the 70s, Dr. Robert uh, Becker, twice nominated Nobel Prize, uh, said, I have no doubt in my mind that at the present time, the greatest 
uh, polluting element of the Earth's environment is the proliferation of electromagnetic fields. So he understood it then, and it's gotten much, much worse. So here's looking a study looking at people's symptoms uh, in relation to their distance from a cell tower. And you can see how there's a direct you know, basically decline, you know, increase the closer they get, especially with fatigue, sleep disturbances, headaches, just uncomfortable, like want to jump out of your skin. And we hear that a lot, poor concentration, depression, memory loss. And you can see this direct correlation with the distance from a cell tower. Um, and like, doesn't this, you look at these symptoms, they sound very much like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, uh, Sears, Lyme, diseases of aging, and they all share the same immunological phenotype, that shift in the immunity, that Th1 to Th2 shift, mitochondrial dysfunction in that vicious cycle that occurs. So these calcium-gated channels that again, are the core of the cell danger response uh, cause abnormal cell signaling, um, poor mitochondrial function, so the body can't make any energy and you get cell toxicity and death. And it's really occurring in everyone. It's just a matter of the degree that it's happening and who's sensitive. And for instance, if you just have just EMFs, you're probably okay, but if you add in a chronic infection, you add in stress, you add in mold, mycotoxins, uh, hormone deficiencies, everything's a vicious cycle. So um, again, here's a, another study looking at people uh, living within 300 meters of a cell tower, um, all the symptoms that they basically had. And again, it's broad-based, which makes it you know, easy to discount. Um, here's a, they looked at interleukin-6 levels in technicians with long-term low-level EMF uh, occupational exposure compared to their um, counterparts working in the office. So the workers currently exposed to long-term safe, so-called safe levels of EMFs uh, were found to have increased levels of IL-6, so, and that's, you know, IL-6 has been in the news because of COVID as the major issue with who's going uh, to basically go on to potentially have morbidity mortality with a COVID infection is you can't turn off that IL-6, you can't turn off that inflammatory cycle. So exposed workers were shown to also have significant increase, the interleukin 1B, white blood count, RBCs, mean cell volume, uh, so a number of different things, and you can see here, when you look at the non-exposed people here, like they're basically at zero, right? And as you get more exposed, these levels just get much, much higher. And uh, you can see just such a huge difference, especially in these people that have um, higher magnetic fields. And they're talking about magnetic fields here, where we'll talk about more both electrical and magnetic fields. So um, yeah, basically they're, they're causing EMFs developmental delay, chronic illness, and it's really very similar to rapid aging. And so prenatal exposure to 900 megahertz, which is like the, the cell phones, result in dysfunctional thymus and spleen. And we'll talk about thymus. So the thymus uh, basically involutes, it's in your breastbone. And when that happens, as you age, it, it basically causes all the, increases your, your risk and all these diseases of, that we associate with aging. Uh, diabetes, uh, autoimmunity, cancer, uh, all those things. So the EMFs just speed that up tremendously. Uh, then you also get mitochondrial um, uh, dysfunction. So your body can't make the energy which also it's a vicious cycle, causes the immune dysfunction, which then causes more mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, increase in inflammation, so they decrease glutathione and uh, uh, decrease superoxide dis uh, disputase. So your body can't get rid of these uh, inflammatory 
byproducts, reduced natural killer cell function, which we see so much of. Um, you'll see that in you know, Lyme patients, chronically ill patients, where they can't fight intercellular infections. And all this is additive to it, whether it's stress, uh, insomnia, diabetes, autoimmunity, you don't have the intercellular immunity. And that's where the same thing, it monitors your body for cancer. So you get cancer, you get reactivating infections, you, but you get lots of inflammation. Your body's trying to fight it, but it doesn't have the right part of the immune system. Gut dysbiosis, which then causes, you know, basically a vicious cycle, increased permeability of the gut and the brain, uh, cardiac dysfunction, arrhythmias, chest pain, hypertension, fatigue, depression, anxiety, cognitive dysfunction, headaches, um, ADD, OCD, uh, infertility, um, tinnitus, osteoporosis, neurodegenerative diseases. We'll talk about all this. Um, and everything is a vicious cycle. Now, this is like, oh my gosh. And you really should be thinking, oh my gosh. Um, uh, but the good news is there are things you can do to mitigate and prevent the safe amount of EMF toxicity. One is don't, you know, stay as much, you can't, you can't get rid of it because it's everywhere, but you can do certain things to minimize your exposure. And when you ask like, well, how much since 1917, they, they looked at the difference in EMF exposure, polarized EMF exposure since 1917 and asked people, they all oh, maybe a thousand times more. Nope. Nope. Million times. Nope. Basically a billion billion. So 10 to the 18, so 10 with the, well, it's a one with 18 zeros. That's how much more EMFs we're exposed to just since 1917. So very short period of time. Uh, this is just a quick one of uh, patients um, that I had, 37 year old uh, female, with long history of chronic fatigue syndrome, severe fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, cognitive dysfunction, night sweats. Uh, she had POTS, so um, you know, when you sit up, uh, basically low blood pressure, palpitations, interstitial cystitis, which is um, inflammation of the bladder, which is a mast cell activation, swollen legs, uh, and so they get leaky vessels. Um, and they also get the kind of the skin. If you see where you get kind of a lace pattern in the skin, um, with kind of purplish, really think of Bartonella. Um, urinary incontinence, uh, hair loss, irregular periods, multiple food and other allergies, and other multi-system symptoms. She was mostly house and bed bound. Uh, she's been sick for over nine years. Uh, she said she had seen too many doctors to count. She had been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, mast cell activation syndrome, POTS, pre-lupus, pre-rheumatoid arthritis. You know, go to a rheumatologist, you're going to get some autoimmune uh, basic diagnosis. And you do find that, um, uh, you know, basically, you know, the chronic fatigue syndrome patients, the Lyme patients, and now we're looking at EMF patients or post-COVID patients, that you'll have autoimmunity to, to a number of different things. Oftentimes, it doesn't fit into a little box, but whether it's antiphospholipid syndrome, it'll get multiple um, autoimmunities, but when you fix underlying immune dysfunction, those go away. Um, she, uh, again, she had antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, her Lyme test said was negative, but when we actually tested her with a decent test, she ended up positive for Lyme, Bartonella, um, toxic mold, uh, Jed Sears, immune activation of coagulation, uh, which I'd love to go into, but uh, that's for another day. Uh, severe immune dysfunction, so she had uh, very low natural killer cell function, uh, but lots of uh, low Th1, but very high Th2, Th17, hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction, so a lot of hormone deficiency, but the standard tests look normal, especially thyroid. The TSH looks normal because the hypothalamus pituitary is not secreting TSH, um, so Doctors look at the TSH, if it's low, they think the thyroid's high, 
But in this case, which is so many people, the low TSH is actually associated with low thyroid. Um, again, hypothyroid, she had normal thyroid function tests, but when we did our tests where we look at their basal metabolic rate was terribly low. She was burning like uh, maybe uh, 60% of the calories that should be, should be burning uh, throughout the day. Um, and her thyroflex, which measures the relaxation phase of uh, muscle reflex by a computer um, and shown to be more accurate than blood tests for thyroid was extremely low. She's hypometabolic, um, shown to have mitochondrial dysfunction. So uh, long story short, we got the uh, patient feeling much better uh, with uh, time release T3. Uh, she was on bias progesterone, uh, between six to eight peptides, um, uh, ozone, exosomes. Uh, she had short course of antibiotics. We tend to use a lot less antibiotics now um, because we don't need them. And we find that just, you know, I did on myself when I had, terrible Lyme and just bed bound and heart failure, you know, three and a half years of the highest dose IV antibiotics that I would never give a patient didn't do anything, you know, until I fixed my immune system, poly MVA, phosphatidylcholine. So she had, she had dramatic improvement, in all her symptoms, but she can suffered from uh, this anxiety, insomnia and her natural killer cell. We, it was, stuck. we couldn't get it above five. It should be above 30. And so I asked her about her potential EMF sources. She said no major power lines. Uh, she didn't know about any cell towers. Her, she did have a Wi-Fi router in her bedroom and she sleeps with her iPhone and TV and her house alarm and smart thermostat and TV. So we told her to um, basically turn off her Wi-Fi and if she could hit the breaker and you know basically put her phone on airplane mode and just take it out of the bedroom. Uh, she returned several months later, uh, noted the significant improvements in insomnia. She feels that she's getting deep sleep, uh, which she never felt that she got before. Her anxiety was better and felt much healthier overall. And I just kind of just happened to ask her, you know, what she does in a typical day. And she mentioned that she goes out with her husband in his Tesla. And I told her, well, don't do that. You know, drive your, I think she had a BMW gas powered, uh, but she said she wasn't ready to drive. Uh, but she said she'll try not to go with her husband in the Tesla. So we also adjusted a few things and uh, do some new labs. But uh, she came back three months later, saying that her anxiety was dramatically better uh, since not being in the electric car. Um, and she's actually able to drive now. Her anxiety was down and she just was able to drive, wasn't uh, overwhelmed with it. So again, with the electric cars, uh, it's, it's a big problem. But, and this is from um, when I was a chief medical officer of the Fiber and Fatigue Center. So we had 22 centers, but in 2003, and this, this still holds true. And it's this vicious cycle. And you look at all these things that just basically go in a circle and doesn't matter where you start. Normally, like with chronic fatigue syndrome um, or uh, Lyme disease. So it's it usually stress has an issue with it, which unfortunately makes doctors think like, oh, it's not real because they're just stressed. But I'll show you how stress really doesn't lower the immune system. It modulates it in a negative way. But, and then you get two terahepatic dysfunction and, and then mitochondrial dysfunction and then reactivating infections and it goes around and around. Now with EMFs, it's you basically down here with the environmental toxins causing the mitochondrial dysfunction and the immune dysfunction. And you again, just get in this whole chronic vicious cycle and it kind of doesn't matter what the initial cause is, it just sets everything off. And so all these patients look, look the same on blood tests. You look at a chronic fatigue syndrome patient, a Lyme patient, an autistic patient, uh, and they have their immune system and their mitochondria are shot. And you fix that, they get much better. Um, and so IL-6, again, uh, maybe common denominator in this vicious cycle. Um, 
where you get that immune dysfunction. So all these things here are associated with that Th1 to Th2 shift. Um, even diabetes, obesity, cancer, infertility, hypothyroidism. Um, and that these uh, two figures took me about two hours to do. So you can sit here for a second and marvel at the wonder of them. Um, but uh, so, so basically, yeah, so your TH1, the T regs are too low and the TH2, T17s are too high. Um, so when you look at stress, we always think of stress as lowering the immune system, but what it really does is cause the cellular, I mean, the TH1 with natural killer cell function, to go down, but causes increased TH2 with mast cell activation, increased inflammation. So it's immune modulatory. And then again, becomes a fish cycle. So stress plays a huge part in all these things. And they all basically combine together in, in a vicious cycle. So you hear a lot about mast cells now, um, and it's a major concern for Lyme patients, chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, Sears, of course, mast cell activation syndrome, uh, patient with POTS. Um, it's basically out of balance immune system. And direct mast cell inhibitors are kind of the mainstay of treatment, but look upstream and fix the immune system. And then that mast cell activation gets better. And EMFs causing a huge problem with mast cells. Let's, let's finally talk about peptides here. So what are peptides? So peptides are naturally occurring or analogs of short chains of amino acids. Um, arbitrarily, if they're less than 40 or 50, are considered a peptide. If they're longer, they're considered a protein. Um, peptides uh, work different than hormones. Peptides are generally cell surface uh, signaling molecules that will uh, basically cause a cascade of effects where hormones go into the cell, go into the nucleus, change protein synthesis, uh, uh, basically um, have the body uh, uh, epigenetically change. So slow on, slow off, where peptides are generally fast on, fast off. Um, and so they tend to be much safer. So hormones work on specific receptors in the nucleus, again, affecting protein synthesis, uh, where peptides are pleiotropic, much more like vitamins where they have multiple effects and where you actually you, you think, well, multiple effects, so that's, that's a problem. But they tend to be much safer, like a vitamin, where when you give a drug that has like one specific effect, it tends to throw everything off. Um, and that's where you have issues. But uh, Peptides in general are exceedingly safe. A number of them, you can't, they can't find a toxic level. A, you know, a thousand times a typical dose that it's non-toxic. Try that with anything. Try that with Tylenol or try that with water. <laughs> they're so safer than water, um, but they're very synergistic. Um, they regu regulate most every known process in the body. We usually think, you know, hormones were the master regulator, and but we're finding that the peptides are the much more precise modulators that that work with the hormones, but more of a, a another layer that is um, more tissue specific. Um, again, trying to be extremely safe, a hundred or a thousand full time, and you, you don't see any drug or anything like that. Um, and the increasing number of peptides becoming clinically available. So let's, let's look at the different categories. So immune modulating peptides. So the ones that where we want the peptides to uh, essentially um, convert that where the abnormal balance of the immune system, that low TH1, high TH2, back to normal. And peptides tend to be homeostatic, meaning that they bring the body back into balance. For instance, BPC, body protection compound um, 157, you have high blood pressure, it brings it down. If you have low blood pressure, it brings it up. If you're hypercoagulable, it brings it down. If you can't coagulate, it brings it up. 
So they, they tend to bring it, everything back into balance. So immune modulating, um, like thymosin alpha-1, think mostly of increasing Th1, um, where the BPC, think of mostly lowering Th2, and then thymosin beta-4 and TB4 fragment, uh, which we'll talk about, think of more as modulating both of them. And there's um, different thymic peptides come from the thymus, um, thymulin and thymogen. Um, uh, the uh, uh, thymulin tends to be more uh, uh, basically anti-inflammatory, works great for people with Herxheimer's. And then you have also what works for immune modulatory are the uh, pineal hormones, um, epitalian and pinealion. And these will um, uh, basically modulate the thymus, also increase melatonin, um, but they do a lot more. They're, they work very synergistically with the thymus um, in terms of immune modulatory effects. Sleep peptides, um, epitalian and pinealion, they will again raise melatonin levels. Um, and for people that can't sleep, there's delta sleep inducing peptide and which sounds like, oh, it's a peptide, you take it and you go to sleep, but no, it, it doesn't. It, it's not like a sedating peptide. It basically reduces inflammation in the hypothalamus, which calms down the sleep center. So if you don't have a problem sleeping, it won't do anything for you. But if you have a problem sleeping, that you combine the epitalian, the delta sleep inducing peptide we're finding with a growth hormone secretagogue. I'm not gonna talk a lot about those, but um, that's a whole nother area. But all of a sudden people are like, oh my gosh, I'm getting deep sleep, especially if you're out of EMF fields and the you know, being in electromagnetic fields gonna cause inflammation of the hypothalamus, which keeps from going to deep sleep, causes insulin resistance, leptin resistance, weight gain, anxiety. And then um, AOD anti-obesity drug um, is a fragment of growth hormone. Um, but there's other effects, uh, brain peptides for memory, depression, traumatic brain injury. There's C-Max, uh, C-Lank, and we'll talk about those, cerebral lysin, uh, which has been uh, for IV and IM injection, but they made it a biologic now, so you can't get that in the US, but it is available orally. Um, Dihexa is a, it's a synthetic, um, uh, angiotensin 1 7 analog, which the one going to, but it, it helps memory. Uh, Corgin, all these are very synergistic, by the way. Growth hormone secretagogues, um, again, most are natural, but uh, some of those are synthetic. Antimicrobial peptides, I won't get uh, too much into. LL 37 is natural produced in the body, but also thymus and alpha 1 uh, is approved in. 30 or so countries for uh, hepatitis, HIV, for cancer, um, the TB4, TB4 active frag, um, very antimicrobial BPC-157, uh, shown to be more potent antiviral, for instance, against the herpes virus than a cyclovir at one one hundredth of the dose, but people tend to not think of it as that because it has so many other effects of healing but it has, it, they're very antimicrobial. Just kind of general rejuvenation, um, body protection compound, and we'll, we'll go through that. It tends to heal so many different uh, systems in the body. When you take it orally, it works systemically, uh, as well as uh, TB4, they work together. That's more of, again, that thymic peptide, where TB4 fragment is the part of TB4 that's the immune modulator and it's actually orally active and takes out a part that stimulates mast cells. Um, epitalian and pinealion, uh, again, the pineal uh, hormones, delta sleep inducing peptides, uh, growth hormone releasing, mitochondrial peptides. So I'm not gonna go into much detail, but MOTC, 5-amino-1-MQ, humanin, uh, SS31, tons of studies are uh, actually being conducted now on reducing neurodegenerative diseases and so many different issues by boosting mitochondria. Uh, BPC-157 actually 
um, prevents the uh, calcium uh, voltage gated channels from being overactivated. So uh, very potent actually mitochondrial protecting peptide, TB4 and TB4 frag. And then the melanotropic peptide, so um, alpha monocyte simulating hormone, and there's melanotan one and two, which are analogs of alpha monocyte simulating hormone, which stimulate your body, the melanocytes, to get tan in response to sun. Now, the melanotan will do the same thing. It's an analog of that, but it also will reduce inflammation, increase libido, um, uh, decrease body fat. So you get tan, increased libido, and you get skinny. So it's called the Barbie doll peptides. But you, the tanning part tends to be an issue if you're older because it will bring out kind of age spots and things like that. Now, KPV is just a three amino acid part of alpha monocyte stimulating hormone. And it has all the actually even more anti-inflammatory effects that uh, alpha monocyte stimulating hormone does, but it doesn't stimulate the monocytes, which is great. And it's actually orally bioavailable and hugely um, basically anti-inflammatory. So mast cell issues and we uh, just, uh, KPV is now available and uh, we're having great success with that. Uh, uh, and patients are loving it and doctors are loving it. Um, Side effects, really some nausea, really that's with kind of the PT-141. So that's actually approved as a drug for female libido. Um, uh, but uh, it does, it definitely works for male erectile dysfunction. Um, but you tend to get nausea with it. The other ones, not so much. Um, so, so EMFs, really they accelerate aging. Now, even when you look at aging, according to the CDC, okay, approximately 80% of age individuals are afflicted with at least one chronic disease as a result of the decline in the thymic related immune function. So 80% so of age individuals are basically suffer from a, from a you know, basically uh, illness because of their thymus is no longer working. So many things have negative effects on the thymus and pineal uh, gland function as well. Uh, age, genetics, inflammation, EMFs just speed that process up. Again, they speed up the aging. Uh, diet, you know, bad diet, lifestyle, stress, toxins, low thyroid, low growth hormone, zinc deficiency, all these things kind of speed up this, this thymic involution, which causes um, basically the immune dysfunction. So you basically end up aging faster and getting a lot more of these multi-system uh, degenerative diseases that you tend to see in older individuals, but you're still young. So thymus in evolution uh, basically starts around age 15 and uh, around 40 to 45, it hits a, it hits a low. And so you get, again, where you get that immune shift, so increased up to infections, um, you have more autoimmune disease, more cancer, cardiovascular disease, more inflammation. And you can see here the thymus, as you age, it just starts dropping right around to age 10, 15, and then by 40, and usually right around between 40 and 50, that's where you start getting the red line here that I drew in, you can tell it's not uh, professionally done, but uh, I get the point that where this is the increase in um, uh, basic diseases of aging. You'll get childhood diseases, you'll get a bump in diseases here, um, and then diseases of aging just rapidly increase here because of the thymus. So let's fix the thymus. Um, and uh, with stress, so I think I went through this, um, where the stress is a major immune modulator. So the thymosins, they again modulate the body to be more uh, immune balanced. Uh, see if repair, restorative and healing properties, um, maintain normal antimicrobial activity. 
boost mitochondrial function. Again, you'll see all these things connected. Uh, thymus works by activating secondary messengers, stimulates wound healing, um, stem cells, stimulates stem cells, uh, increases antioxidants and glutathione production, uh, needed to maintain a healthy um, GI mucosa. So really a combination of BPC-157 um, uh, is kind of the go-to for gut inflammation, but also inflammation throughout the body, but is known for that. But the, the TB4 fragment you can take orally works in the tight junction and we're finding KPV is the one very anti-inflammatory and really heals the gut very quickly. Um, and a big problem we're finding with Lyme, all these, uh, you know, this, this inflammation is basically brain on fire. So microglia activation. And so you'll find with BPC-157, the thymus and beta-4, thymus and beta-4 frag, KPV, they'll lower the microglial activation, also cerebral lysin. So the brain inflammation goes away. And you'd be amazed at how many symptoms go away when you reduce brain inflammation. And brain inflammation, particularly the hypothalamus, uh, is what causes uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. Um, thymusins and also BPC blocks the effects of neurotoxins, endotoxins, mycotoxins. Um, they boost natural killer cell function. And so thymus and beta-4 is a long molecule. And so uh, 43 amino acids has different parts that do different things. So what they found is that the fragment 1,4 possesses all the immune modulatory and angiogenic and healing and anti-inflammatory and cellular protective, um, but it takes out the part that stimulates mast cells. Um, and it also now becomes orally active because it's very short. A long peptide is not going to absorb. Even short peptides can be difficult to absorb. But this one absorbs whole and is clearly totally bioavailable. And you get all the benefits of thymus and beta-4, which you normally have to do with a shot. But you can take it orally. And it's about 10 times as potent as well. So. Um, it's a more potent antifibrotic, so it will prevent like diabetic cardiomyopathy, diabetic um, nephropathy, you know, or kidney damage from diabetes. Again, it's 10 times as potent per weight. It doesn't stimulate mast cells, um, it's orally active. Um, it uh, crosses into the blood-brain barrier. It's much smaller, where TB4 is too big to cross. Gets into biofilms and breaks up biofilms. It inhibits um, uh, uh, growth factor beta, induced plasma inactivator inhibitor. So it prevents that hypercoagulability, which also BPC-157. And, and we actually, if you check the coagulation status of chronic Lyme patients, chronic fatigue syndrome patients, about 80% plus have immune activation of coagulation. So what's happening is they're laying down, they're not causing a clot, but laying down fiber and trying to wall off that infection, which is good in the short term, but in the long term, now the body can't get at it. And also nutrients can't get in and waste products can't get out. And oxygen that usually takes two seconds to get into the cells, can take up to two minutes. So the cells are also starving for oxygen. So uh, cleaning up that fibrin actually with either uh, really low dose heparin uh, which is safer than aspirin, or also, you know, with immune modulating, um, also some of the vascular enzymes will help, but uh, just another, again, in this vicious cycle that we see. Um, and a lot of times when nothing's working in the patient, you know, we'll I'll say, hey, uh, I got good news, I got bad news. Good, the bad news is you got immune activation of coagulation. The good news is you got immune activation of coagulation, and we can treat it all of a sudden, treatments that weren't working because whether it's a hormone or a drug or a nutrient wasn't getting into the cells, all of a sudden you clean it up, now it gets into the cells um, and starts working. So here is just uh, basically these are amino acids of thymus and beta-4 and then TB4 active frag is the first four amino acids there. 
Um, BBC 157, you know, and these two are, are kind of the go-to and kind of the core treatment um, and available as uh, a supplement. Um, it's a 15 amino acid, which normally would not absorb, but it is basically uh, secreted in the gut. So normally we also, most peptides, things are broken down from the, with the enzymes um, and with the acidic gastric uh, juice, but this is very stable. Um, that's where it's, that's where it's made. Um, so it's resistant to hydrolysis and enzyme digestion. Um, it's shown to have a wide range of healing mechanism. It's almost embarrassing showing the studies because it sounds like snake oil, like name it, it kind of, it helps heal it. Um, but it really changes epigenetically the body into a healing, um, uh, basically turns on all the genes for, for healing, lowering inflammation, um, you know, improving the immune system, uh, gets increased blood flow uh, to, to areas that are needed. Uh, it uh, modulates the uh, neurotransmitters. Um, great for leaky gut. And again, the gut brain access, and it's great for the microbiome. Uh, oral and systemic um, administration uh, shown to improve cardiovascular issues blocking many of the toxic effects of EMFs, including the immune dysfunction, the mitochondrial dysfunction, the excessive reactive oxygen species. And again, by inhibiting that abnormal activation of voltage gate of calcium channels. And I'm telling you for, I know there's a lot of you out there that are suffering from whether it be Sears and chronic mold, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic Lyme, and just have palpitations all the time. Get out of the EMF um, fields and take BPC to block those calcium channels, um, which will also help your mitochondria. Um, and you can just get, again, it's a start of this whole multi system treatment. So, um, works for heart failure, hypertension, uh, hypertension or hypertension. You know, I went into heart failure with chronic Lyme, and the cardiologist said, no, you maybe able to get 10% better in 10 years. I couldn't stand up uh, straight. I couldn't like walking upstairs, forget it, taking like an hour. Um, I'm, I can't live like this. And that's when I went basically around the world looking for treatments. And that's where I found peptides. But, um, and I went back a year later and my heart was normal. And the card says, oh my gosh, I've never seen that. Of course, he's even asked what I did, but he said he's never seen it. Um, it actually prevents arrhythmia, it shortens that uh, QT interval, um, which again with COVID, you may be hearing about, you know, the QT interval um, with uh, Zithromax and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we look at that, but actually BPC-157 will shorten that as does thyroid. Um, but BPC-157 also will, um, is great for arrhythmias. We had um, one of our employees' husband uh, was an AFib and gave him a big shot of BPC-157 and broke his AFib, went back into normal sinus. Um, so it works for central and peripheral nervous system, uh, uh, treating neuropathies, um, and all the, you know, with EMFs associated with them, we'll look at, you know, traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neuropathies peripheral nerve damage, uh, mood disorders. It's shown to be a better antidepressant than antidepressants. Uh, blocks an exaggerated stress response for constant fight or flight. Um, let's see. So I think that's the same slide. And so yeah, just even a brief period here, seven days after just a brief exposure uh, from a mobile phone, they found the blood brain barrier opened up. Um, uh, so again, we have the brain is protected by a uh, network called the blood brain barrier, which makes it difficult for certain things to get into the brain. It protects the brain from toxic substances. But if you're in an EMF field, it opens it up. And also, you know, leaky gut ends up being leaky brain and vice versa. 
So in some of these studies, just two hour exposure to a low level cell phone level uh, in rats found immediate disruption of this blood brain barrier um, protection, increased permeability, allowing these big molecules, even albumin, which is a big protein, to be able to get in and out. And it, it's crazy. And the just the brief exposure for a couple hours, the increased permeability for two weeks. And they also found significant brain damage was found 20 and 50 days after um, the exposure in the rats. Um, and now if, if they were to give anti-glutamate antioxidant therapies, it did help prevent some of that permanent brain damage, um, but not all of it. And anyone who was already sick, it actually, it, it was much worse for them. And that, that's what you see. And so with the, um, in terms of the microbiome, we heard a lot about the blood brain um, uh, access. So the microbiome affects the neurologic system and really most every system in the body and also, but the brain can determine what the microbiome is. So again, it's a two way street. So if you have leaky gut, you have leaky brain uh, almost instantaneously. Um, now radio frequency, radio frequency similar to those emitted by mobile devices or Wi-Fi typically cause pathogenic bacteria it's E. coli, the stereo, they grow faster, become more resistant to antibiotics. I mentioned that. Causes toxic molds to grow faster and secrete millions more of um, mycotoxins. Uh, it's, it's crazy. And so here's a basic look at the blood brain barrier. Um, so, numerous studies show an importance. Um, and looking at BPC-157, KPV, uh, TB4 active FAG, uh, those combination works on all the different parts of the uh, dysfunctional, the leaky gut, and thus leaky brain. Um, studies there. And then we get into the microbiome. So the viruses that are in there, that uh, they're called phages that feed on the bacteria, then it's exponentially more complicated, but we haven't heard about that yet, but you will. Um, so let's see, that is, uh, we already talked about that. Um, so BPC-157 stabilizes the gut and the nervous system, um, which we talked about. So much of the safety attention has really been looked at, again, ionizing radiation, which is powerful enough uh, to break up DNA, um, where so it's felt that anything less powerful does not cause DNA or, or damage. Um, but that's not the case. So even short-term, low-level exposure to non-ionizing radiation, well within the safety limits has been shown to cause DNA damage. Um, you increase in what's called senescent cells. So the cells just basically they're sitting there, they're dysfunctional, they're a mitochondrial dysfunction, they can't do their job, but they're secreting all this inflammatory um, byproducts and causing a lot of problems. Those are the ones that turn to cancer. Um, and uh, and, and basically, with, they don't have enough energy to even go under apoptosis or really die and get rid of those. So um, they get basically, um, uh, if you get the mitochondria going, they can actually go under what's called apoptosis and get rid of those old cells that are causing all these problems. So free radicals, especially interaction with transitional metals like um, iron and heavy metals. Um, play a big role with EMF toxicity on DNA. So if you have these metals that you have know, a Fenton reaction um, or with the heavy metals that you can get DNA damage, certainly. So here's basically just looking at the incidence of glioma, so uh, brain tumor and the amount of cell phone use. And here's looking at 
um, uh, the thymosins um, and the pineal peptides, uh, battalion and pineal and cancer reduction. So uh, with thymus, you get CDF increase in lifespan and um, uh, also boost, which correlates with the boost in immunity and the pineal gland, same thing. So increased lifespan, increased immunity. Um, they go together. So demonstrate the high efficiency of epitalian uh, therapy for prophylaxis of age-related pathology, including cancer, showing a new physiologic way to slow down the pathological process and to extend human lifespans. Uh, quote there uh, from the studies below. And this was, they just basically injected uh, thymic protein into my starting at age 3.5 months. They found that increased lifespan by 28% and decreased rate of cancer by 2.8 fold. Um, in terms of they had uh, cancer, a few female mice where they had their bred to have the breast cancer gene. So genetically prone to breast cancer. Um, they received a battalion five times per week from the second month of life. Uh, and the percent of mice that developed breast cancer was 3.7 fold higher in the control. Uh, so 73% reduction in cancer in the treatment group. Uh, it decelerated the rate of aging of the reproductive system as well, with only 8% of mice having irregular menstrual cycles versus 52% of age control. So uh, it's actually very good for um, uh, people with infertility. Um, this is looking at um, age-related insulin resistance, uh, also neurotransmitter levels. So um, a battalion uh, improved insulin resistance. This was in rhesus monkeys. Uh, the melatonin levels also uh, basically went up to uh, that of young animals. So the older animals looked like younger animals. And the area under curve of the glucose challenge was on average 294 in the young monkeys versus 479 in the old monkeys. So they had a lot of, a lot of insulin and glucose. When they get the epitalian, it normalized that glucose area under the curve. So significant improvement in insulin resistance or improvement in insulin sensitivity, I should say. The authors concluded epitalian obviously shows promise as a remedy to restore age-related endocrine dysfunction in primates. Very safe, don't see any side effects from it. Uh, stimulates the synthesis of serotonin and melatonin. Uh, restores telomere length. So the cells in order to divide, they need the telomeres keep shrinking every time it divides. And when those are too short, it can't divide. It do actually will lengthen those. And so your cells are actually younger. So it's the Asian reproductive um, uh, system actually increases T4, T3 conversion and also increases thyroid production and uh, improves glucose tolerance. We just said slows aging, increases longevity, protects against senescent cells and cancer, activates gene expression. Um, so it basically makes the, makes the body younger. It's probably the best anti-aging um, substance that we know of. So the geroprotective effects of um, a thymic uh, peptide, thymulin, and pineal peptide epitalium were investigated over a six to eight year period. 266 elderly patients after being treated for the first two to three years of the study. Um, they basically found a two to 2.4 decrease in acute respiratory disease. So they had improved immunity, reduced incidence of clinical manifestation of systemic heart, disease, so less cardiovascular disease, less hypertension, less uh, degenerative diseases, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, compared to controls. So such a significant improvement in health state of the peptide-treated patients correlated with decreased mortality rate um, during the observation, basically uh, two-fold decrease in mortality uh, in the thymulin-treated group, uh, 1.6 to 1.8 fold in the epitalian-treated group, and when they're treated with both a 2.5 reduction. Now a separate group that was treated uh, with peptides for six years, retired was decreased, was one fourth 
compared to controls when you use both those together. Um, so EMF effects on the brain uh, significantly impacts on memory, learning, anxiety, um, even at these so-called safe levels. Um, uh, with structural and physiologic changes in various parts of the brain, again, opens up the blood-brain barrier. The hippocampus, which is very responsible for memory and learning, is very susceptible to oxidative stress and EMF toxicity. The cerebellum, the amygdala, which is kind of that um, uh, like kind of basic drive, um, uh, and also cerebral cortex, so uh, higher functioning and activation of the glial cells. So we get, again, the brain on fire uh, with brain inflammation, uh, also neurotransmitter levels. Um, so possible causes contributing with the EMF, well, what does it do? It increases reactive oxygen species and again, increases the permeability of the gut and the brain. Um, uh, um, activation of the apop, uh, apoptotic pathway, so it causes cell death. Effects on the DNA, you get direct damage and also epigenetically, meaning that it turns on and off genes that cause damage. That calcium influx across the membranes. Um, so it's likely a combination of all these things causing significant problems. So um, a study here, they exposed pregnant mice in utero to a mobile phone, um, just on active call mode throughout gestation. The offspring were shown to have memory impairments, hyperactive behavior compared to unexposed mice. Uh, another one here exposed 28 days of just the mobile phone, altered neurobehavioral performance, impaired spatial memory, damaged blood-brain barrier, um, uh, impaired uh, uh, learning and reference memory, uh, also found brain damage in the hippocampus. So all these things from so-called just cell phone exposure, um, neuronal you know, degeneration, um, all these things from so-called safe levels of just cell phone. So here's uh, basically groups um, in terms of time it takes them to complete a task and the more exposed, the longer it took them to, to learn a task. And looking at Alzheimer's, um, neurodegenerative diseases, um, there's just so many studies here, uh, looking at the ratio here, you know, five times the risk for people that have high EMF exposure. Um, uh, numerous studies all showing uh, neurodegenerative diseases, suicide, and depression symptoms with EMFs. Uh, ALS, strong data showing EMFs causing ALS. Um, but the nice thing is TB4 is shown to reverse that. Um, so TB4 or TB4 active frag, whether it's the neurodegenerative diseases, peripheral neuropathy, diabetes, traumatic brain injury. Um, talk about uh, uh, basically nootropic peptides, a cerebral lysin, so it's a uh, mixture of neuropeptides. It's been around for 40 years or so, tons of studies on it. It's approved in 44 countries for treatment of dementia and stroke, very neuroprotective, um, very neuroreparative, penetrates the blood-brain barrier because uh, they're small molecular weight uh, peptides. They stimulate central and peripheral nerve growth factors. They improve cognitive function. Uh, lots of studies on traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's stroke, shown to be effective in uh, Alzheimer's, excuse me, with autism and Asperger's on the spectrum disorders. Uh, historically given intravenously, but uh, no longer available, uh, but it is bioavailable orally. Um, this is the study on Alzheimer's showing the improvement. Um, here's in terms of reducing microglial activation, so that brain inflammation, the identification of new compounds with neurotrophic properties becoming a new strategy for the prevention and treatment of neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, in this study, we described the use of two different models to demonstrate the ability of cerebralis to reduce microglial activation. The results of these in vitro and in vivo studies indicate that cerebralisin might exert a 
neuroimmunotrophic activity, reduce the extent of inflammation, and accelerate their, um, accelerate neural death under pathologic conditions, such as those observed in neuroregenerative diseases. Um, another study here showing that oral cerebralicin, um, basically a single dose, um, significantly improved the cognitive performance of elderly individuals. Uh, C-Link and C-Max, they're very similar. Um, C-Max uh, will help, help with memory as well as C-Link. C-Link's more calming, will also help deal with stress. So we like to give that when uh, people are anxious. It also reduces brain inflammation as well. Um, they um, stimulate nerve growth factors, um, shields the body from neurotoxins as well. Uh, protect, uh, protective against stress and depression, improves memory and attention, even in healthy adults. Uh, beneficial learning and memory uh, increases actually dopamine and serotonin levels, which decline with age. Improve recovery from stroke. Um, you get uh, neurologic regeneration, increase uh, dendritic, uh, uh, basically all the connections. Uh, I have never seen side effects from these. And looking at the cardiovascular system, I um, mentioned how so many patients have those palpitations. If they can get out of the um, EMF field, especially with BPC, often those palpitations go away. Um, and they kind of get out of that sympathetic fight or flight uh, response. Um, this is just showing that how it, the EMFs add to that immune activation of coagulation where just exposing the blood, this is the person's blood to EMF fields, they start clumping um, after 10 minutes and 70 minutes. So significant effects. So this is a, a person who basically was uh, EMF sensitive. Uh, and they have the person sit in a room and then turn on and off the Wi-Fi. So basically, uh, pulse at 68, and then all of a sudden, turn on the cell phone, goes up to 122. Um, fake turning on the cell phone, goes back to 66, turn back on the cell phone, 129. And... Then also, so they found that really you get that, again, that sympathetic, parasympathetic, where we're, all these illnesses are causing just that sympathetic overdrive or just fight or flight um, instead of that calmness. And again, not getting deep sleep, the brain on fire. Um, and this person would actually go into arrhythmias um, uh, with the EMFs. Um, so, epitalum of cardiovascular disease. So, this was trial 79 uh, patients, age 60 to 69, with severe cardiovascular disease, half of them receiving just six courses of epitalin. Um, and they, all the patients continued their standard basic therapy. Over, so, followed for 13 years, the cardiovascular functional age was 16 years older compared to seven years in the epitalum group. So, it really kind of slowed that aging. And the uh, mortality rate was about half that of the control group. So cut mortality in half. They um, actually increased their endurance while the control group declined on their endurance. And they also had normalization of their circadian rhythm. So it increased the melatonin. They um, slept better, more, um, uh, standard sleep cycle. You know, people say, oh, as you get older, you kind of lose that sleep cycle. So brought them back to that younger, um, nice awake sleep cycle, improved carbohydrate, lipid metabolism. Um, this is uh, showing that TB4 frag and BPC prevents EMF induced cardiovascular dysfunction. So they, um, the TB4 active frag cardioprotective effects in diabetic subjects reduced both ventricular um, uh, interstitial and uh, perivascular fibrosis. Um, 
Oral and stomach administration of BPC-157 simply improves a wide range of cardiovascular by blocking and many of the toxic effects of EMFs, including that mitochondrial dysfunction, the excessive rectum oxygen species, and inhibiting that abnormal calcium um, voltage-gated uh, calcium channel. So helps with heart failure, hypertension, hypertension, post-MI damage, arrhythmias, um, vascular repair. We talked about the QT interval. Um, so also we're finding, you know, is that really with EMFs, everyone's exposed to is that everyone's really low with thyroid, actually multiple hormone deficiencies. So you look at that 72 hamster divided into three groups, control group, um, uh, and then group two was exposed to cell phone EMF for 10 days. Group three was exposed to cell phone EMF for 50 days. They tested T4 and T3 and cortisol levels. The cortisol level in 50 day exposure went up. So they had that increase in the, in the cortisol, the stress response, but they found T3 levels um, were higher than the control group. So the T3 levels in the exposed group dropped. Now the T4 levels went up and so Doctors think, well, hmm, well, higher T4 means that they're, and especially when the TSH is lower, they didn't test TSH in this study, but I can pretty much guarantee the TSH drop, but then we'll see in the next study. So low TSH, high T4, doctors go, oh, high thyroid. It's actually low thyroid because they have hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. The body is not producing TSH. Then on top of that, with the mitochondrial dysfunction, you need active transport for the T4 to get into the cell. So the high T4 shows that it's not getting into the cell. And you can see that by the, the T3 and the T4 um, thyroid transporters are different. The T4 is more energy dependent. So with low mitochondrial function, it doesn't transport T4 um, uh, it, it much more affected. Uh, now, reverse T3 has the same pharmacodynamics, same pharmacokinetics as the T4. So with high reverse T3, it's not, it shows it's not getting into the cell. So with high reverse T3, you know T4 is not getting into the cell. So that's why all these patients do so much better with straight T3 because although it is somewhat affected, not nearly as much as T4. So, but doctors look at their TSH being low normal and their T4 being high normal. They go, oh, well, you're kind of high thyroid. No, 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 they're low. Um, so it's, it's the opposite. So here they said the author stated that the high cortisol resulted in decreased T4 to T3 conversion, which is true, but that's not the main problem. You do get less T4 to T3 conversion, but the big problem, the cause of the high T4 is it's not getting into the cell. Um, and again, EMFs causes mitochondrial dysfunction along with other things, chronic infections, and then causes immune dysfunction, uh, low thyroid, then you basically get all that vicious cycle. Um, and then, so a different study here, um, so the major sugar of a T4 is a lack of T4 transport. Um, so we assume that they had low TSH, but um, so everyone really exposed. If you want to learn more about this, um, go to our nonprofit National Academy of Hypothyroidism, nahypothyroidism.org. Wrote a couple review articles on this. Um, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Um, but another study um, where they exposed uh, to cell phone for 30 minutes a day for five days a week for four weeks. Um, one group basically has control, another group as the sham, so falsely exposed. TSH, uh, T3 and T4 levels are measured. As expected, the TSH and T3 and uh, uh, T4 levels were lower in the EMF groups. Um, so the T4 can either be a little high normal, normal, or low, depending on where they are 
in the chronicity of the illness. Um, but so the T, uh, T4 is not the proper treatment for these patients. So TSH was lower, um, their T3 was lower, and in this one, their T4, but T4 can be either high um, because they have, you actually have less T4 because the TSH is the thyroid's producing less T4. So you're competing um, uh, with not getting into the cell, what's going to win out in terms of serum level. So serum level does not tell you what's inside the inside the cell, which is what matters. Another study showed male volunteers exposed to cell phone fields for two hours a day, five days a week for one month at a 21% reduction in TSH levels, uh, showing central hypothyroidism, um, which would again be missed by the overall majority of physicians. Uh, is showing here that giving Italian brought melatonin levels back to normal. Um, and I know I'm going long here. The monocord alpha monocyte stimulating hormone, um, melantan one and two we talked about, KPV. It's a fragment of that, very potent immune modulating anti-inflammatory, inhibits mast cells. Um, it actually reduces the hypothalamic inflammation. So you get reduced insulin and leptin resistance. Uh, Delta sleep inducing peptide does the same type of thing. So it, when you take it, it doesn't put you to sleep, but over a couple of weeks, it will lower that inflammation of the hypothalamus and where you can actually get deep sleep. And also the Delta sleep inducing peptides highest is the highest levels are in the gut. So it lowers inflammation there as well. And just I'll mention uh, GHKCU. You'll see that a lot in cosmetic. It helps um, heal skin and produce collagen, anti-inflammatory, uh, also helps with hair restoration. Uh, I'll just mention that we like the mitochondrial peptides, um, which include uh, well, BPC-157 protects the mitochondria, 5-mino-1-MQ. We found great results with like bipolar and OCD. Uh, MOTC is another one. Again, tb 4 frag SS31. Increased metabolism, um, neuroprotective, increased stem cell function, increases NAD. So really, uh, you know, peptides very synergistic uh, with, with each other. Um, here again with thymulin and epitalin. Um, and I think we looked at that study here. And so to summarize, and I know I went way over and I apologize for that, but um, I hope I gave you a little taste of the problem with EMFs and hopefully, you know, one way to counteract that in a lot of things is using peptides, but also, you know, try to minimize your exposure to EMFs. Um, they contribute to a wide range of illnesses and immune dysfunction uh, and are a key component of vicious cycle of multi-system illness. Uh, the key is this healthy, balanced immune system. Remember by the gut-brain axis, it's a core contributor and um, uh, improper function deficiency of uh, certain peptides. Again, they're natural in your body which they decline as we age, can, can heal and protect you from toxic exposures um, and uh, works well in a multi-system treatment. Um, so in terms of dosing, who's get asked that, uh, I'm going to just quickly use your dose, again, is uh, one cap twice a day, but uh, it's, you can't basically overdose on those. Um, if they have GERD open the capsules, um, uh, but so usually we do BPC-157, then add in TB4 frag, and then add in whatever in, in particular, if they have, if they need a neurotropic for memory, um, when I'd like the cerebral lysin, or I have lots of inflammation, add in the KPV, or the, you know, uh, epitalian or pineleon, whatever it may be, or maybe an antimicrobial, which I didn't talk much about. Um, mitochondrial peptides. Again, you, the nice thing with the peptides is you can't go wrong in terms of the different orders that you're not going to screw it up, that it kind of 
uh, and ends up working out. If you're enjoying these presentations so far, consider taking home lifetime VIP access to the entire Peptide Summit at a special discount right now. Uh, and remember, you're not only getting the on-demand access to all uh, the expert interviews and the bonus gift, but you're also helping support our mission and getting the, the groundbreaking health information out to as many people and practitioners as possible. Hello, this is Ken Holtorf with another episode of the Peptide Summit. Um, today we'll be talking with uh, Kashif uh, Khan, um, who is the executive officer and founder of the uh, DNA company, where um, you know, basically personalized DNA, checking uh, your DNA and seeing how that affects the system. Uh, well, welcome. Thank you so much for, for, for taking the time. No, it's awesome to be here. Thank you. Great. And uh, a little bit more um, uh, about uh, Kashif is that uh, he's uh, this is in personal life medicine. He's been a pioneer uh, through unique insights in the human genome. Uh, we, they've done the largest study of its kind globally. Very impressive. Uh, the DNA companies develop a functional approach to genomic interpretation, overlaying environment, nutrition, and lifestyle on the, ge the genetic blueprint to create personalized and deterministic health outcomes. Uh, prior to his tenure at the DNA company. He's done quite a few things, pretty amazing. Um, uh, he's been involved in a number of high growth uh, startups where he took an active role as an angel investor and advisor, ran two successful marketing firms where his client list comprised uh, Canada's top earners and most in, uh, affluent individuals. Um, from Canada's largest company to small neighborhood businesses, He's advised on business strategy and in industries ranging from uh, luxury, retail, technology, finance, fine arts, healthcare, tourism, and real estate. So smart renaissance man. He's participated in over 300 million in revenue in his own uh, retail businesses uh, prior to launching and consulting services to help others thrive. So he's uh, grown up in Vancouver. Um, his drive started from witnessing his immigrant parents struggle to establish themselves in a new country. Inspired by an ironclad work ethic and resourcefulness, uh, he developed an, an uh, industrious uh, entrepreneurial spirit at a young age. While he was in high school, his peers were languishing at minimum wage. He was uh, starting his first business. And it's interesting, as CEO of DNA Company, he learned you know, that his genetics and his neural wiring Actually, uh, that's how he was wired. He's designed to be entrepreneurial. And he has since made his mission to build the DNA company into a business that has impacted um, and uh, whose success is measured not in dollars, but in lives that have improved. And I've been very impressed with, with genetic companies. I think they've solved some problems that we've had and everyone else has had that, that we'll talk about. So uh, uh, again, thank you for coming on. Yeah, and, and, and well, what got you interested? So it was your own health that you looked at. Yeah. So as you mentioned, first of all, I'm blushing because I didn't realize how long that bio is. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. So in that, you know, you mentioned the marketing business. So I did that for some time. I realized my core strength was that public relations, marketing, helping people find their place, you know, in distribution and getting going. And I, I was sick. Like I, my literally my business partner used to drive me home in the middle of the day because I had crazy migraines. I had eczema, I had psoriasis. I was not, I didn't look right. Like you could see, like I was not in shape, right? <clears throat> I wasn't sleeping properly, which I didn't even know was a problem. You know, I, when a, a typical young entrepreneur, sleep almost seems like failure. Like, no, you got to work, work, work. Oh, I know. It's like, you know? I hate going to sleep, but then I hate getting up. <laughs> yeah. So through that, it was bad. Like I got to the point where on a monthly basis, I was crashing, spending a couple of days at home because I just migraine, nausea. I just couldn't handle it. You were it. working your butt off at this yeah. time too. It was too much. It was too much. And I didn't know that the environmental exposures that I had working in downtown Toronto, big city, pollution chemicals in our building, there was a manufacturing company and there was fumes coming through the vents. I didn't realize. So in my genetics, what I learned, this is what got me to this. 
the key glutathione genes, glutathionization is your detox pathway, right? So glutathione binds onto toxins, send it to the liver to metabolize, get rid of it. I didn't even have one of the most important genes. So forget about what version or what SNP or what variant, didn't have the gene. Uh, the other one, I had the suboptimal version and one I was doing okay. So this toxic exposure I was having was creating a heavy load on my cellular health because I couldn't clear the toxic insult. And then you lead, you get to this metabolic inflammatory state where all of a sudden you think you have some kind of autoimmune issue because all these spoke yeah. the central hormonal <laughs> problem trigger, right? So that led me to discovering myself, making myself healthy. And it was genetics that got me to the true answer. Like what was actually wrong? Here's my instruction manual, my human instruction manual. What was broken in the code, right? And that's where I literally took the keys to my marketing company, handed it to the staff and said, thank you very much. You can keep this. I found what I have to work on. I, I literally walked away, funded the company and we started going. Well, you need, you need the power right there. And and I really like it because it it almost always correlates clinically. Like someone has this problem and then you go, oh, no wonder you're missing, yeah. you know, this enzyme is very poor. You have this buildup. Yeah, you can't detox. And then you can focus on what actually to do. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the key thing about the genetics is if you're doing it right, and if you're meaning if you're interpreting the report properly, you're removing all the trial and error. It's no longer one size fits all. Let's try this. Let's try this. That's, we actually know yeah. what to do up front, right? And, and all of a sudden outcomes are better. So exactly what you just said. And you tend to over-treat everyone because you don't know. You kind of you kind of shotgun it. I remember yeah. when I did mine, the guy says, you don't like hard alcohol, do you? And yeah. I'm like, no. I, I go, I wish I did. Like, you know, single malt scotch, just stiff, <laughs> and, you know, and I just, I can't even smell it. it it's so funny. Yeah. But um, yeah, we find it really helps where, you know, our patients come on with just a ton of supplements and you go, you don't need that one, you don't need that one, but right. you need... Two, two of this one, you know, exactly, and, and I, I think that really helps. And, uh, but the problem is it's another thing is for a doctor to learn. Yes. And it is very technical and you've got to learn a lot. You got to know for years. Yep. So I, I think that's how your, your business model uh, helps. That's, that. that's the gap. So what, so see, I came from the outside. I don't come from this space. I came from marketing, luxury goods, fine art, that type of thing. So I didn't have sort of the blinders that the sort of biotech industry has that this is the way we do things, right? I didn't have that bias. So coming in, I could, yeah. So I, I could see that it was being done wrong. You're forcing your, if you're a clinician, you're busy. Your staff is busy. You don't have time. You hardly have time for your family. Forget about learning genetics, right? So, and even if you do learn it, what does this gene mean? What You still can't interpret it functionally, meaning how do I now action that? How do I apply that to diabetes or cardiovascular disease or breast cancer? You have to be able to reverse engineer and interpret it. So what we said is it only will get adopted if we make it easy to use. And so we sat down with our science team and literally for months and months and months built this giant algorithm, right? So the algorithm was, what are the steps, the rule sets and the brains of our scientists that they go through when they're interpreting? Because they know what it means, right? And we built an AI platform that now does that. So when you get our reports, typically when you get a genetic report, it will tell you, you know, you got this gene, this gene, this gene, this, and then you got to figure out, okay, so what does that mean? What's the impact yeah. of this gene? This gene? So what we say is anxiety, low, medium, high risk. And by the way, if you want to know the genetics, here it is. Weight loss, you know, uh, prostate cancer, uh, anxiety, depression, et cetera, you name the big buckets of things that people are in. We've reversed engineered those genetically, meaning how do they happen? Why do they happen? And give people that, including the clinician, because it's so much easier to just speak to the problem with the recommendations at hand. Recommendations meaning what's solving that root cause, not the symptom masking, right? And that's how we go about things. And we found that all of a sudden, it just become very easy to use and actionable. Yeah, because even like we'll have a report and they have these four genes where you don't, you know, you can learn everything about this gene, this gene, but it's how they interact. And they, yeah. so you really need some sort of computer algorithm to help. Yes. You know? And that's what we spent. So we spent two years downloading the information from our scientists' heads. 
we spent a year building the AI platform that can then read that information and produce the reports. And one key factor, so going back to one of the earlier things you said, the genetic industry really is focused on solving genetic problems, meaning that this gene variant directly correlates and equals a problem. Sickle cell syndrome, some forms of autism, you know, things that you're, you're born with, it, right? You're not born with type two diabetes. You're not born with cholesterol. Even these happen 50 plus because it took that long of making the wrong decisions for it to express into a disease. So what does genetics have to say about that? That was the gap. You know, what are the choices I should make that I don't end up there? So the only reason we were able to do that, there's two things there. In, in our research, we, we realized there was enough information about genes. What does this gene mean? What does that gene mean, right? We had to layer it into the systems that mirror the biochemistry of the body. So that was the first thing that we did was the mapping. The, the body isn't 22,000 independent genes doing independent things. It's a cardiovascular system. It's an endocrine system. You know, it's, it's a hormonal system. What is those, what's the cascade for each system? So we looked at how those work and then we figured out what genes instruct each step along the way. We then met with patients. So we spent two years meeting 6,000 people one by one by one by one by one to say, okay, this profile leads to 80% chance of Alzheimer's. But why did 20% not get it with the same profile? That came down to environment, nutrition, lifestyle. I have a suboptimal profile for which the genes are not supporting my ability to fight off Alzheimer's, but I still have to do something to trigger it. I'm not born with Alzheimer's, right? right, right. It was studying those environment, nutrition, lifestyle loads that are put on the genes. And that's really the most important part. Because now all of a sudden we understand why these diseases happen. And not only can we prevent them, we can also start to reverse them. Because so that's the it's, work we did. it's nice. I think it's, you know, your genes aren't your destiny. It's, you know, you can turn them on and turn them off. Yes. It's, it's um, you know, with, with, with epigenetically, again, lifestyle, you know, nutrition, lack of whatever, you know, replacing lack of uh, uh, nutrients, whatever it may be. And, and I think that's such a problem. We're just getting bombarded with so many toxins and our food is devoid of nutrients. And so, and they, if you're genetically prone to get it, you know, or it's like my mom would smoke five packs a day of cigarettes yeah. and she'd say, oh, well, Lois didn't get, didn't get cancer, heart disease, yeah. you know, well, what you die of heart disease and cancer, you know? Yep. Yeah. Um, and some people may have some protective gene that others don't. And there's, uh, there's a perfect example. So the, the endothelial, like why does heart disease happen? The endothelial, that inner lining of the artery is where the inflammation starts. Right. And that's the very beginnings of most cardiovascular diseases. Yes. It's not oh, a cholesterol problem. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an cholesterol is your body trying to reduce the inflammation. Your body sends cholesterol there to say, hey, you have an inflammation issue because of some toxic load or something. And guess what? We're, I'm going to send cholesterol to actually help you. But when the cholesterol meets toxicity, it hardens and gets deposited. And all of a sudden you have a problem that looks like cholesterolemia, right? But this question, the first question, there's different versions of the endothelial. There's a stainless steel version. There's an okay version. And there's like a paper thin papyrus version that you can poke right through, right? So now the question of, well, this person spoke till they're 90 and had no problem. This aunt smoked till she was 50 and died of a heart attack. The hardware was different. Yeah. And that's genetically determinable. And this is where we say that we can understand genetically that you have the poor endothelial, but you're not sick. You're not born sick. Yeah. Put the wrong load so on you it. better pay attention and do exactly. the things that really are needed. Because you know what's scary now is I'm having guys I went to college with playing golf drop dead of a heart attack. You know? Yeah. It's like, damn. You know, yep. and I'm sure they had bad genes and then bad lifestyle on top of that. Yep. I can Where... tell you, we actually have a, one of our early stage investors is a pharmacist. Uh, we did sort of a, a, a early investment round when we were funding our research. And this guy was 38 years old, had a crazy, crazy cholesterol issue. And it came down to that he golfed too much which nobody would ever think is a problem. But what's the problem in Canada, because we have such a long winter, especially in Toronto, the usage of pesticides and chemicals oh. is highly unregulated here. It's much more regulated in the US than it is here, right? This guy, like- That's like terrible you, here. Yeah, it's, it's already bad enough. Now imagine it's worse here, 
right? So now this guy was golfing four days a week in the summer because he was trying to jam it in because in the winter he didn't get it, right? So four days a week, four hours at a time, he's breathing in all these toxic chemicals for which he was missing the key gene that helps you clear them. He was also missing, not I shouldn't say missing, but had a suboptimal methylation pathway, yeah. the anti-inflammatory, yeah. and he had this weak endothelium that equaled that inflama inflammatory insult, which led to cholesterolemia, right? So all of a sudden he's on Lipitor, can't understand why the number keeps going up because you're fueling the fire with those chemicals. That's the root cause, right? And getting rid of golf is what healed him. Wow. That's yeah. a... That it's a big price for him, but uh, or wear a gas mask or something. Yeah. Well, even even supplementation, you can do things to support. If you know where you're suboptimal, yeah. if your glutathionization process is suboptimal, then support that and then keep golfing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. All that information is such power, and it can be one little thing. Yep. That's just because everything's a vicious cycle, and it gets stuck at like you know the weakest point. Yep. Yeah. And yep. what, what typical things do you find are uh, the most benefit or the most common that really help some people that are, that are feeling bad? And then, or what else do you find in the typical person that you can change based on their genetics? That's a, that's sure. a huge benefit to them. I would say there's sort of three answers there. One, the easiest thing to identify and reverse is all the cardiovascular stuff because it's so mistreated in terms of what's really happening. Like we just talked about. Yes, the it's the number one killer. It's the number one killer. It, it, it happens because of all these reasons we're talking about, right? It's more prevalent than ever before because the toxic environment, nutrition, lifestyle loads are worse than they've ever been, right? So that's one that it's so prevalent that it just kind of keeps happening. Diabetes, cholesterolemia, et cetera. Then there's two where because our approach is so unique, in areas that are very gray, we have really good outcomes. And I would say the number one is female hormone health. And why? Because that's an area that first of all, the delta value between how bad the experience currently is, right? When they go to your typical primary care MD, well, it's your hormones, you're supposed to have problems, right? That you're yeah. supposed to pay. Yeah, I've heard that before. That's typically, yeah, so the women believe it's supposed to be bad. I'm supposed to have bad men, you know, menstruation issues, fertility problems, horrible menopause. Yeah, all my right? friends have it and they say, don't take hormones. And I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. So or that, or if, if they do, they put them on birth control pills. That, exactly, yeah. Not knowing that, well, what if this, you know, hormonal issue is rooted in estrogen toxicity, right? Which causes that inflammatory load. But guess what? Giving them a birth control pill, the genetics of it, that gene is still instructing to convert all that estrogen into estrogen toxicity, the byproduct. So you're just fueling the fire again, right? Yeah. So female hormone health, I would say, because first of all, the current, you know, current uh, sort of experience isn't the best and we're very precise about it. That's the one where literally women are crying. They come and they're crying. I can't believe I this many years of pain or whatever. And it, there's a big flip. The and other so, one, or just a little bit more on that. Sure. So what you'll find that they have a gene that will uh, tend to uh, cause the estrogen to convert to more toxic metabolites. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the hormone cascade uh, is very deterministic when it comes to the genes, but in com regular practice, it's not treated as that deterministic. Like we're using things like the Dutch test and trying to understand what's happening today. Well, guess what? My menstrual cycle looks like this. So tell me today, it doesn't mean next week or the week before, right? The circadian rhythm of the menstrual cycle is peaks and valleys. And so, standard reference ranges are zero to, you know, yeah. like 400. Yeah. Nope, you're normal. You yeah. Know. So that day to day, what's happening doesn't really inform you. You need to understand the full cascade. So what we look at is progesterone converts to testosterone, converts to estrogen, and then you create an estrogen byproduct, either two for our 16 hydroxy estrogen. But even in this cascade, you may go from testosterone to DHT, the manly man toxic version, or you may clear it as a clean androgen before converting it to estrogen. Or any one of these steps, you may do a little slower, or a little faster, right? So there's so many variables. And this is why you have things like, you know, Kim Kardashian looks like this and Kendall Jenner, her sister looks like this, right? Because they have the same mom, different dad, 
the genetics are so different that she is highly estrogen dominant. So she has the curve, she has the skin, she has the hair. Kendall is highly androgen dominant, right? The, the cascade is different. So she looks very different. She's thin, you know, lean muscle. So now look at those foundations and you can start to point to the diseases. Over here, it's like fibromyalgia, breast cancer, bad menopause. Over here, it's PCOS, infertility, acne, hair loss, right? And yeah. instead of topically dealing with all these things as independent silo, they're all the same thing. Yeah, They're about hormone dominance and hormone tox toxicity. And, and we've really found that is if a woman comes in who's like full figured versus like, you know, athletic and, you know, that this woman's going to need uh, more estrogen Yeah, um, that grew up with more estrogen. The other person, a lot of times you're like, I hate estrogen. Okay, just a little bit. It's got to be yeah. balanced with the testosterone and they're different ratios, you know, and that's how they grew up and they're physiologically what what they need yep. uh, i think that's totally true or or you look at men with you know say the gene they're converting a lot of testosterone to dht you know they're bulky yeah. hairy but bald you know but bald, so, yeah. yeah and then the prostate issues right that's the dht yeah. also causes the inflammatory load to prostate and we we have men we deal with a lot of professional athletes so i can't tell you how many NHL players? So Toronto is the hub for NHL training. This is where all the guys come in the summer to train, right? How many times has some clinic sent us an NHL player saying that this guy has man boobs, gynomastia? Why? Because, you know, performance, he's not recovering the same, he's he energy, so they give him an andro gel pack or some kind of testosterone. Oh, and if he's converting it into estrogen, all you've done is given him more estrogen, even though you're giving him testosterone. Right? I think that's the number one thing we see is, especially also if anyone with diabetes or, or obese, and they put especially creams and you get upregulation of the aromatase, they're just making tons of estrogen. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, you can do things to block it. Well, we'll tend to use a combination of like nandrolone and testosterone. Right. Yeah. So a testosterone that does not convert to DHT or, or estrogen and then kind of combine it yeah. um, and, you know, and, and tone it a, a lot of ways to do it. It's kind of like a, you know, asking five chefs the best way to make a cake. <laughs> you get six different answers, but yeah. Um, I find that, and I, I find too, women love like, um, you know, nandrolone, it's, it's less androgenic. Right. Uh, great for bones. It's, it's funny. Some women will drive home and just go, oh my God, I feel so good. Another one will call and go, I just had road rage. I, I called <laughs> some guy home. So uh, it's yeah. interesting. And the genes tend to correlate with that. Yeah. So the genes are now imagine there's no trial and error. We can actually tell you upfront exactly what your cascade is doing and how many problems that result. So, so then going back to your question, the, the other area uh, where we feel there's major impact is uh, mood and behavior. So mental health, mood and behavior, personality, because again, it's so great, right? The clinical experience is objective. Like you're as asking questions, you're trying to gauge, how does this person even perceive it, right? Maybe they say it's nine out of 10, but it's actually four. So all of that in terms of the neurochemicals, what drives personality, emotion, stress, trauma, et cetera, we've decoded all of that. So when we have someone's genome in our hand, we can literally describe your personality to a T without ever speaking to you, right? We understand how you Isn't deal with cool? people around. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. And we use this with executives for like team formation. We've used this in, in athletics with the teams also, but just day to day, we use it for young teenage girls that are taking an anxiety pill that don't even know why it's happening, right? And, and how many is that? It's just tons because that's medicine now here. At least they go to the doctor. Oh, here, take an antidepressant, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and for speaking of antidepressant, I'll give you myself as an example, right? So that entrepreneurial gene that you talked about at the very beginning. So what is that? Dopamine is your pleasure and reward seeking chemical. Either you enjoyed something or you achieved something and dopamine is released. You get to feel it. There's just eureka moment, right? So the cascade looks like this. You produce dopamine, you have to bind it to, to experience. Then another gene called MAO, and there's, by the way, a gene called DRD2, which determines how dense your receptors are. So to what degree do you experience that pleasure, reward, emotion? Oh, right? you know, I've not seen that on a, on a genetic test. Though. You'll very rarely see that because that's, again, it's not a genetic condition. So genetics yeah. is believe it's actionable, right? You have to study people to understand the traits. 
How do they behave? And this is why we studied 6,000 people in person, because we literally studied their behavior. How do they behave? And how does that correlate back to the genes, right? So we, it was, we, and this is why you said largest study of this kind in the world, that's what we actually did. So now for me, dopamine receptors, I have the least possible density. So the, the weakest version of DRD2, right? There's a, a gene called MAO, which is sort of a metabolizer, breaks the dopamine down. I have the fastest MAO. Oh, so you got to be thrill seeker to yeah. get that dopamine up. Yeah. And then my comped enzyme, which is the clearance enzyme, I also have the fastest comp. So I'm feeling it way down here. And before it's even halfway through, it's broken down and it's gone. So I have three outcomes. Depression, because I just don't get to feel anything. Right. Addiction because I go down the pleasure path and I feed it with whatever. Because you have to, you need something. You need something, yeah. right? Or achievement, because I go down the entrepreneurial path, which is unintentionally what I did. And you probably need multiple things too, right? You often need multiple things. Now I got to keep it in check where, you know, why am I a, a, a marketing PR and uh, in, in luxury goods businessman running a biotech company, changing the way genetics is done in clinical practice when I have, no background in, in the and and I'm teaching geneticists and clinicians how to do this when I have no right to be doing so, right? See, I, you know, I I love that, and I say, you know, I don't care about someone's degree; it's what they learn or doctors. Oh, they're a specialist. They stop learning, yeah, they and say. they just keep doing what they've been doing thirty years ago. They're board certified in that, yeah. Or it's like the old you know joke: if you got a in chronic infection, don't go to infectious disease. If yeah. you've got a hormone problem, don't go to an endocrinologist or an OB. They're just doing what they were taught in residency. Yeah. It's yeah. it's terrible. Yeah. yeah. We we had that experience all the time. Like myself, again, I don't have the background or the my a piece of paper with my name on it. But just like two weeks ago, I spoke at a medical conference. There was maybe 70, 80 uh, doctors in the room who primarily were focused on female hormone issues, right? And it started off like, who is this guy and why am I here? Right? The, the See, with goal, right? The snob doctors because yeah. they don't know. And yeah, the less a doctor knows, the more adamant they're right. <laughs> you know? and, yeah. so, so then I spoke and I gave the example of how we deal with breast cancer, which we can get into and I can tell you guys. And at the end, it, I'm not kidding you, no exaggeration. It was three hours. I couldn't leave the room because of the questions three straight hours and I was exhausted after, but the example I gave them was, wow, you know, when it comes to breast cancer, everyone has heard about the BRCA gene, right? And when you say BRCA, it's a scary word. It's a four letter word. You don't want to hear it. Right. And women, I, I don't want the BRCA gene. Then ask that same woman, what does the BRCA gene do? They have no idea. They you ask, I should get my breast taken off prophylactically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Joe, what's her name? Joanna. Angelina Jolie. Angelina right? Jolie. Got Double mastectomy. Right? Because she was told that there's a gene that points to future risk of breast cancer. So what is the solution? Cut the breast off. Right? Uh, Who? Nobody asked the question, why does the breast cancer happen? Right? So we've already touched on this, but to complete the story, the BRCA gene doesn't cause breast cancer. It's a gene editing gene. What it does is when something else is not working, it goes and fixes it. Right? If you have a bad editor, you're not doing the repairs. So if you have the bad version of the BRCA, there's more likely that other stuff that's not going well is going to continue to not go well, which then leads to that inflammatory load that causes problem to cells, which eventually leads to disease. So then we have to look at, well, what's not going well? Why breast cancer, right? When you look at breast cancer in terms of demographically, it's typically menopausal women on the for the most part. It's not 19-year-olds, although you have some, and it's not... 80 year olds, although you have some, it's mostly in that menopause bracket, right? So what happens during menopause is you stop having a menstrual cycle. You're no longer clearing that toxic metabolite. And for the women who are 4-hydroxy or 16-hydroxy fast, the, the, the version of the genes that convert the estrogen into that, just because you stopped having a menstrual cycle doesn't mean you stop doing that. The genes are still there that convert any estrogen into that, right? That's what those genes are doing. So now all of a sudden, you're still producing this stuff, maybe not to the same degree. And you have low progesterone that's not protecting it. That's yeah. not protecting yeah, exactly, yeah. And you may also have poor detox genes like me that are not clearing it, right? So now what does the body do with toxic insults when you don't clear it? It stores it in fatty tissue for women at that age, right? Where do you have fatty tissue? 
in the hips and in the breasts. What do you have in the breast that was never meant to deal with that level of toxic insult? All these glands and everything, you know, what is the breast made of, right? So all of a sudden you get into a Y root cause, which is actionable. The BRCA gene maybe is not instructing the repair and all the damage that's being done. And so you have a greater chance, but it doesn't cause the breast cancer. It's the estrogen. The thing that you need to get rid of is the estrogen toxicity. That doesn't matter what version of BRCA you have. Right. I, I totally agree. Yeah. I so just, this is, yeah. This was the example we spoke of at that conference a couple of weeks ago. And people were like, oh, like I've been in medical practice for, like you said, 30 years. I've never heard this. Yeah. Well, that, you know, this is, it's not yeah. that it's new science. Uh, all of these pieces are known. But nobody's functionally built the maps, which is what we've been doing. Because it reminds me of, I mean, things are moving very fast in this integrative, I hate the term alternative, whatever space, right? Right. Um, and things in standard medicine move very slow. Right. It's like, you know, that takes on average 17 years for a proven new concept to get accepted. Let's say you're a test. Uh, to accept as a mainstream medicine, unless it's a new drug or there's a sales force out there, you know, right. and uh, everything is like, look at, look, look, look at oncology. Okay, you got this breast cancer. No, we're not even going to test and see what it's sensitive to or anything. We're going to give you this cocktail. Yeah. You know, no matter who you are. It's like, it's barbaric. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't change. Yeah. And that, I mean, that wave of change is now coming. It's tough. I mean, first of all, you have sort of safety guidelines where you need, you know, evidence-based, you know, medicine coming out, which I understand takes time. But if you have some, I don't know, <laughs> the death of evidence-based medicine. <laughs> and that's I'm a problem. little jaded with this whole COVID thing, but that's the problem. Is what 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 came out as something that was meant to be protective, ended up being sort of protective of the wrong thing. It, protective of better solutions entering the market, right? So ultimately you have stuff that we know works. You as a clinician are free to use what you think works, you know, as an example, but the solution I just talked about, um, it's not that most people will never hear this. No, right. And it's, it's criminal. Yeah. You know, and someone has their, oh, just take your breasts off, you know? Uh, and then if you tell them otherwise, it's like, well, and here's, Here's 50 studies. Exactly. All doctor, even. No, 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 no. My patients are different, you know? Yeah. Um, or or a patient. They're just they're scared because you know, they read on the internet, they hear from their friends, they their doctor says one thing, and nope, this way you gotta do it. And uh so it's a it's a tough time being a patient nowadays. Yeah, especially when you have access to so much information, but you can't take action on it because it's almost like uh you know, you got you got to worry about the clinician's ego more than what's best for you. <laughs> you know, very very yeah. true. Yeah, and it's kind of like I found that which I'm used to it now. But you would think if let's say a patient sick for ten years, doctor seeing them, they have a good relationship with their doctor, but they come to us that we send them back better. You think the doctor would be happy? Yeah. No, they're they're pissed. Yeah, and they're, they'll discharge the patient. You know, yeah. instead of going, hey, what are you doing? You know. Yeah, but the great thing is we have this wave now of clinicians like yourself and many others that aren't happy with the status quo and are doing a lot more, right? So if somebody comes to see you, that's not the experience. Like they're going to get something very different. So it starts there, right? Somebody has to pioneer. Somebody has to sort of have the arrows on their back and fight the, you know, yeah, and, and then eventually it adopts. And I think there's really something there because, you know, we love the genetics, but the problem is, is you got to spend so much time learning genetics right. and yep. it sounds like you solve that problem. Well, you'll have your experts, you know, read it and, yep. and, and go through it. And uh, so what, what, again, name of the company, how do people get it? Can, can patients order it directly or yeah. doctors? So it's both. So the, the, it's the DNA company, literally, the DNA company.com is a website. And we started off uh, direct to consumer first because our research was done with sort of high net worth people, meaning it, the, 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 tech, the technology used to be expensive, right? We, were, we weren't just doing a typical, you know, you see on TV consumer test. It's a much more in-depth process for what we do. For example, 
when you buy a typical DNA test, you're getting what are called SNPs, which are like spelling mistakes in genes. This letter was a C instead of a T. So that's one test you can run. We do that, but we also test for what's called an indel, an insertion or deletion, meaning it's a whole paragraph is wrong, right? So that- oh, very go, go, go back with that. I have not seen a test that offers that. So that, so meaning that, so here's a dirty secret of the industry. Let's get dirty. <laughs> <laughs> the secret is this, that, you know, there's all this concern over data privacy and, you know, my data, my DNA, et cetera, right? So the, everyone knew that we had this jewel in us, the, our DNA, this thing that we needed to decode and it was going to fix everything, right? So what happened was uh, genetic testing companies got funded in a big way and they started selling these tests. What then later happened is investors said, this business kind of sucks because we test your DNA once and then what? Because your DNA doesn't change. It's not like cholesterol or blood work where you just have a clinic partner and it just keeps going and going and going. Test once, done. Your DNA ch never changes, right? So I got to find a new, part, yeah. Yeah, so the new business model became sell the data, right? And how do you sell the data? You have to get mass evidence-based style, you know, let's get big numbers data, which is study as many genes as you can, find all the SNPs. So it's like average-based, pass them on there's more you can test for than SNPs. And that was the problem where you have genetic reports from this model, which tell you you've got an 80% chance of this, 60% chance of that. You're taking your instruction manual that's definitive and giving back probability, right? You're, you're taking my cellular, like my cellular code and telling me you got an 80% chance of something. Well, it's the 100% answer is actually here, right? So that's where we got to. And that's why clinicians started to say, well, DNA is not really that actionable because the product wasn't designed for you or the consumer, it was designed for the data buyer, right? As an example, uh, 23andMe's big funding around two years ago, $300 million was Glaxo, right? That's who their big funder was, $300 million. And that's when you started seeing billboards all over Times Square, et cetera. Oh, data, that. Yeah. Right? So that's how the industry works. So now what we said is people still know that there's something here that they're not getting and they're probably willing to pay for it. So we started with the high end. We started with, you know, celebrities, professional athletes, et cetera. And it wasn't, it wasn't cheap because we were doing the SNP test, but we were also doing the indel, like I was talking about, meaning spelling mistake, whole paragraph missing. Imagine you're reading a book and there's a paragraph not there, right? Or there's an extra paragraph. The implication, if a SNP means this much to a pharma company, what does the paragraph mean, right? There's yeah. also something called a copy number variation. The whole gene is missing. Forget about a letter or a paragraph. You didn't even get the gene. Or you have an extra copy of it. Now, if it's See, been... when, when you mentioned that, it was, that was a problem with you. I said, I've never seen any genetic test report on that. Yeah, it's, it's not for this model of collect mass data and sell it. It's not economically viable because you're now doing three separate tests for one person. Right. And you also have to know how to interpret it. So what they do in these tests that are the SNP based is they assume. So there's studies that show if somebody has this gene, this gene, this gene, this gene, they've got an 80% chance of having the missing gene. Right. But that's still not certain. So what we yeah, do is but you're not certain. testing for it. Yeah. So now that allows us to be so much more actionable because we're not saying you've got an 80% chance of something. We're saying that if you have this environment, nutrition or lifestyle load, it's a hundred percent chance, you know, and nobody can be that certain. You can't predict the future. Yeah, make, make your, that, that's a good motivator uh, to make a change, right? Yeah. Cause, but all of a sudden the, the science is there. There's plenty of studies that are published to back everything we say, but we're interpreting it better. We're, we're putting the package together in terms of how do I take that's this? That's the key is trying to filter the big data. There's like, you know, yeah. when I grew up and writing a, book or a paper you have to go down to the medical library find the damn research <laughs> article if the book's even there photocopy it you know and it's whoever had those things and people would sell their files of studies right yeah, now yeah. it's bombarded with so much information it's who can sort the information yeah, yeah. uh is is the big difference yeah and that's so, what we our yeah. core strength is that it's anybody can run a DNA test. You can literally go buy a DNA machine and put it in your basement and start running DNA. Right. I had a, I had a patient who got her whole genome, uh, you know, basically done and just a line of just 
yeah. DNA coach. He puts on my desk. She goes, tell me what's wrong with me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I could spend 10 years. I can yeah. Tell you. yeah. Yeah. So we uh, have, so a lot of your audience probably knows Dave Asprey, you know, the founder of Bulletproof Coffee, right? So he's actually an investor in our company. He's one of our advisors that helps us learn solutions, et cetera. So why did that happen? He did a $50,000 full genome sequence. It's out of Europe and they're one of the more expensive ones. You can get a full genome sequence for $1,000 now, right? But these guys just dive a lot deeper and give you more interpretation. He said that the reason he invested is he learned more from our $400 or $500, whatever he paid at the time than he did from the 50,000. You know, because again, we don't do the whole genome sequence, the 22,000 genes, because most of them you can't do anything about. Yeah, right? and, and we're not looking for genetic conditions. There's enough people out there doing that. We're not looking for sickle cell. What we're looking for is 90% of the healthcare budget is spent on chronic disease, yes. which for the most part yes. is preventable. And genetics doesn't address. Yeah, so, so you focus on the stuff that you can change. If yes. you can't change it, here's, hey, you got that. Okay, thanks, you know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that's what we do. And it's uh, it's been an awesome ride because now all of a sudden we see the change, the outcomes. And we believe, like you said in the very beginning, this is going to sort of shift the gears of medicine. It's going to make things more personalized. Nice. And is it, do you have uh, one test where it's everything or do you have subsets if people want them or? So what we do, the core test, um, we have a flagship product that comes out of the test, which we call the 360 report, meaning it covers all of what most people seem to need. Cardiovascular, mood and behavior, which kind of drives everything. Uh, immunity and inflammatory response or so your detox and you know <laughs> right uh, diet and nutrition so at a personalized level how do you deal with carbs fats you know macronutrients micronutrients even vitamins like c d a etc uh, fitness and hormones so body type acne skin um, you know what are your hormones doing not quite the uh, health concerns yet but more the lifestyle and body type right uh, and then the last one is sleep. So chronic sleep. What are what is it in the genetics that are driving you to either not sleep well, not be able to fall asleep, or I fall asleep but I wake up in the middle of the night, right? And we've we've kind of cracked the code on all that stuff. So that's the core product that people get. But from there, we have coaches that can drill further. And for the clinicians that are listening, we have coaches that can work literally for you and your patients. And this is a big part of what we do is like you said, it needs to be made easy. So instead of us trying to teach 500 doctors how to do this, we're saying we already have a team that knows it so well, they, we will package it up so it's your team. Your client calls, they're gonna answer with your clinic name and they're gonna work for you because we know that's what you need. And now all of a sudden it goes from the six systems I talk about to the hardcore like prostate cancer, breast cancer, you know, fibromyalgia, fertility, anti-aging, you know, uh, career planning, all the big, buckets that people want to talk about, the coaches then can dive deeper and from the same test, interpret more. Yeah. Right? So that's how we do things. And, and where they see patterns and go, hey, this is, you got a big problem here where if you just try to read it and learn it, you're in, it's, it doesn't come across well with patients either when they know you don't know because there's yeah. so much to know with it, you know. This, our, I mean, our chief scientific officer always says that the problem with data is data is dumb right? You need to know what question to ask it. So even yeah. the reports that we give, we're giving what people, what we think people need for the most part, but ask us a question and there's going to be more information that's not in the report, right? And we yeah. know how to take that question and sort of ask the DNA for the answer, right? How to interpret. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And tell me more about the study that you, that you did. So what we did was uh, we started with female hormone health, we trickled then into cardiovascular, and then we branched off into other things. So we said that going back to the evidence-based model, we're not trying to get a drug. We're not doing this to work with Health Canada or FDA. We're doing this to truly figure out how to best help people. And we figured the, the only way to do that is you have to go N of one, meaning that each individual person is a separate study. If we truly want to take what DNA was meant to be, personalization, why are we depersonalizing it and creating an evidence-based study of this works on seven out of 10 people, right? So that's what we did differently. We self-funded it because, you know, when it comes to those types of studies, you don't fit the mold. That's not how research is done. Well, we're not trying to reach that outcome. We're looking for a different outcome. So we self-funded, we had some investors, we had some clinic partners that worked with us that also got involved. That doesn't sound cheap either. 
No, we, I mean, we, we, we dove in, you know, it was 6,000 people, right? So we dove in and, and it, it, some of it was paid, some of it was us paying for it, some of it was clinic partners. We worked with, for example, like the U.S. military on the Black Ops Special Forces, PTSD, trauma, who should actually be deployed in active combat, who can actually pull you the know, trigger. That's huge. I kind of took a dive into that because I had to give a talk and I'm like, damn, like with chronic illness, PTSD is a big part of that. And yep. uh, yep. and uh, we've decoded where that, how and why that happens. There's a couple of different paths to get there. Where, where you can tell who would like to get PTSD yep. before they have it. Yeah, before they go with, out. Yeah. With certainty. It's not like a maybe. We can tell you for sure this person is wired for PTSD. Right. But this thing, what, how much that could help the military? Yeah. Yeah. And we've done that with, so we haven't done it on a big scale. We've done it in research, meaning it was just the Black Ops Special Forces. Uh, and then we, you know, so we, we tried to work with different communities. So some athletes, some executives, some, you know, stay at home moms that have fertility issues, right? We tried to focus different, like a diaspora of different stuff. And that allows us to get this end of one where now anyone that calls us, we've kind of seen it before, right? The context is very important. You know, the, the yeah. same mood and behavior profile as a student, as a dad, as an executive, three very different contexts in terms of how you're gonna behave. So we have to understand what gets triggered by that load. And that's, that's why we did this end of one research, which is very unique. Genetic companies don't do this because their intention is how do I discover something about this gene, which then becomes very valuable in the pharma industry? We're not trying to do that. What we're saying is, how do we become valuable to people and become their quarterback, right? That's what we're trying yeah, to do. It's scary. Everything's data selling, you know? Yeah. yeah. They may not, you know, they'll take your name out of it, but they're selling your data, you know? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't had a chance to use your uh, um, to use your test, but everything I went through, I'm like, damn, they're doing it, they're doing it different, and it's it solved the problems that we were having with it. Yep, yeah. So that's that's what we did is we literally interviewed. Uh, we spent one month interviewing sixty different clinicians of different sorts to literally ask them, what is your problem, right? Why don't you use genetics in practice? And so we didn't say, here's what we make, go sell it. Yeah. We said, what do you need? And that we'll go make that. So that's what you we did. Try to put the square peg in the round hole. Yeah. Because we know this, this tool is so powerful, whether for the consumer or whether for a clinician, if it's not usable, if it's not easy. Right? And, and this, I'll actually give the credit to one man. There's a gentleman uh, named Jason Tapler who was the chief digital officer for Rogers, which is one of Canada's big telecom, equivalent of your AT&T, right? The Rogers here. So he, he was our patient. His, his son uh, has behavioral development issues. And so he loved what we did, but it was a deep clinical, like our scientists were with him working. He said, all you need to do is make this easy to use. That's all that's missing, right? He said, that's your biggest problem. And so literally we did that for the next year. We funded the AI, the, the platform. We interviewed a bunch of doctors saying, how can we make this easier? We interviewed consumers and said, how can we make this easier? And we're there now, right? So that's what we did. Nice, uh, impressive, impressive. Um, so if a doctor or patient wants to get to you, find you again and order these kits, uh, where would they go? So yeah, the dnacompany.com. Um, I would suggest that, um, you know, if it's a clinician, uh, contact us and we'll help you. We actually do, even though you don't need it, we have training. There's tons of video and resources. And even if you just want to learn, forget about whether you want to be testing or not. Yeah. If people just want to learn, we have tons of uh, educational, like we have a full course that we built for people to learn functional genomics. So if anyone wants to go there, they can. Uh, yeah, so the dnacompany.com is the website. And from what I understand, for the purpose of the summit, there's a special offer, you know, that's being offered and that'll be, uh, I'm sure shared somehow to everybody. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was going to, I was going to put you on the spot and say, Hey, is there a special deal for the summit? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. in <laughs> fact, I think there's another, there's like a webinar that's explaining that. To, so we'll share that with everybody. And if they want to attend, listen, they can, and whether just to learn, we invite you just to learn, you know, uh, we'll dive deep into a couple of things. 
uh, but if you also want to participate and work with us, we're happy to work with you. Sounds great. I, I think you got solved a, a major problem in, in this industry. And uh, um, so I'm going to go and order them for our clinic. And first of all, I'll do it all myself and uh, see why I'm, why I'm so crazy. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, no, this, this sounds great. Congratulations. And um, how long like, have you guys been in business? How long have you? So we informally started the research in 2017 and we ended up uh, formally like incorporating in 2018 where we put in investor money into the company and we just worked 24 hours a day for three years and here's where we're at, you know. Nice, yeah. nice. Congratulations. You obviously know your stuff and uh, um, really enjoyed uh, speaking with you and, and learned a lot. So uh, it, it's nice because I I think I I know what's missing in our genetics test too. So, and, yeah. and th that's what it is, you know. Yeah. So um, I'll be uh, I'll be ordering some and maybe I'll, I'll call you when I get my results back and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll dive deep and figure out what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> Take a while. <laughs> so, all right. Well, 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 thank you so much. Um, I think this fits right with, you know, it's a, it's a peptide summit, but all these things go together, you know, they go you together. Right? optimize yep. until you know what's wrong. Yeah. And if you're going to be getting into peptides, which is a great thing to do, understanding the personalization of it like what do i need why do i need what's going on hormonally what's going on up here what's going on with my skin my head it's all genetically driven so now all of a sudden when somebody's working with you there it could just be so much more effective you know where to focus yeah. right it's yeah. make the process smoother it's it's you know it's good for win-win for everybody and and that's a, a, a mention that we're able to take people off of things that you know because doctors don't know this you, you you tend to shotgun or trial and error right but with this now you know okay here's your problem here's right. your problem and you can get from point a to b much quicker and then that's that's the key or exactly. you don't miss that thing that you've been stuck on why is this patient getting better right and right yeah. you know, oh my god they can't they can't metabolize this so they build up this like you know yeah. So you've probably heard a lot of great, a lot of great cases. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So great. Well, thank you again. And um, look forward to uh, working with you uh, more and, uh, and uh, checking everything out. So appreciate, appreciate you taking the time and, uh, and being a sponsor of the summit. So uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks a lot. Before we bring up the next speaker, please make sure to share these powerful health and anti-aging protocols by clicking the button below the video to help get this information to people who need it the most. Hello, this is Dr. Kenton Holtor with another episode of the Peptide Summit. Um, today we have the pleasure to have Dr. Melissa Gallagher and uh, she's a naturopathic physician, and um, uh, she's uh, trained uh, as a lymphatic specialist, practicing in Dallas, Fort Worth for the past 15 years. And uh, she's been working with individuals addressing digestive disorders, hormone balance, detoxification therapies, and primary and uh, secondary uh, uh, lymphedema, which I think is totally undertreated, and really not many people know much about it and also case of lymphatic de, uh, uh, decongestive uh, treatments. She believes the more, a majority of disease is rooted in digestion, which I totally agree with. How we eat, well we eat, food preparations, and how the body reacts to food as it travels through the digestive system. A malfunctioning digestive system can cause imbalance in the body, and we all know about you know, the gut-brain access, the brain-gut access, and how all that just everything's a vicious cycle. Uh, with hormone imbalances, allergies, arthritis, joint pain, autoimmune disorders, gout, eczema, uh, you name it. Um, all these illnesses, the gut is, is part of it. And so we talk about a number of supplements today and uh, also immune, immune modulatory supplements as well. 
and uh, she has clients uh, uh, often come to her uh, after they've sought traditional resources and been very frustrated, overwhelmed, and unheard. And I think that's kind of the story of so many so-called alternative practitioners that uh, get people better when their standard doctors don't. So uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being on the summit, Melissa. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Great, great. So and uh, I don't get kind of about your background. How did you initially get involved with, uh, you know, basically uh, this type of medicine, this crazy type of medicine, mm -hmm. And, and also with our organics, the supplement company and, and that. Sure, excellent. So I, like many of the viewers of the summit, had my own health crisis. Um, I was in my early 20s when it happened and I was basically between my undergraduate uh, degree and then it propelled me, my own health crisis, propelled me into getting a master's in nutrition mm -hmm. and then a doctorate in naturopathic medicine. and really what, what drew me to this line of work was um, finding my mentor who I sought out when I had a severe case of Epstein-Barr virus and just had you know completely wiped out, uh, been wiped out by the virus and overwhelmed with stress. And you know, I was in my early twenties and starting um, a career <laughs> and try to prove myself and kind of burning the candle at both ends as many 20 somethings do. And my mentor, um, I was recommended to see a doctor of Chinese medicine. And I remember leaving my office and going to her clinic. And it was just a totally change, uh, just an energetic change, just a, a feeling of calm and peace. And there was just some draw to the line of work she was doing. Um, but I was not interested in needles or uh, doing acupuncture at that point. And um, I just remember saying out loud, I think the second or third visit saying, I want to do what you do. Like, I'm so inspired by this because I had really been very responsive and receptive to the therapeutic she had put me on. And, you know, we did acupuncture and um, she actually went out to um, Bastier to uh, learn um now it's more popular, but she was training in PRP and was using PRP, um, my own PRP at that time and doing can injection you, can work. Can you just say what PRP is? I think most people know, but. Yeah, so it's um, uh, platelet-rich um, plasma, and it is a very powerful way to utilize your own body's natural healing um, capabilities to tap into that. And so basically what she did, she did a small blood draw and then she centrifuged it. And the kind of middle point is when, when it's, when the blood spun, you can actually identify the plasma, but there's this middle space between the plasma and where and, the and she was using those in the acupuncture point. She was, it was really unique. And, and it took me, I mean, I had, I had, it was, it was phenomenal, life-changing. And um, I told her I wanted to do what she did. And she's like, well, you're going to have to get your master's. You know, I was a liberal arts major. And so, uh, I had thought I wanted to be an attorney. And so she. Oh, um, my gosh. What a difference. right? Oh, yeah. Total change of course. So we don't need any more attorneys. No, mm -mm, no. So she uh, she definitely inspired me. And that work, you know, fast forward 20 years later. PRP is now a leading rejuvenative medical treatment. And we're seeing it more in anti-aging and, and uh, rejuvenative medicine. But I mean, I was, I was at her guinea pig and I was, I told her I'll, I'm committed. I have all sorts of money and just heal me. Um, but in that journey of healing, I dove right on into everything I could read, any conferences, books, um, you know, this is pre like webinars and digital courses and things like that. So yeah, big it, different time in that. Now oh, it's, yeah. you're bombarded and you got a filter, you know, yeah. then you had to go to the damn uh, medical library, find a <laughs> damn journal, put yes. it on the copier. Yeah. I Absolutely. Know. Oh yeah. I remember like my first visit from her office was to a GNC. And I think I spent like two hours there. I was reading like all, I had all their books. It was like a reference library, <laughs> But that was really the turning point for me and in, in really shifting my life's focus. And um, so I was able to put myself through school and, 
and continue down my healing path. And then there was a point with my, my doctorate where I had to make the decision <laughs> of actually entering this field on my own and um, starting a practice. And, and that's where I really honed in on, um, you know, we are what we eat. So our nutrition, what we feed now, our body. Is, wait, did you have a PhD at this point? So with her, I didn't, but, um, you know, seven years later I had my master's and I had completed my doctorate work up in new England. Wow, that's impressive. Um, and I did clinical work in, uh, the associated with, um, Harvard's, um, Harvard has a really unique program where they have, um, public health and they have a lot of research happening at some of at all of the Massachusetts, um, and Boston based hospitals, but I was able to get into, um, a very large alternative wellness clinic um, where I was exposed to lymphatic work and some of the trials that they were performing and, and um, studies for Dana-Farber, their cancer institute. And that just opened up like a whole new pathway. So I was all about well, like- Lymphatics you... and cancer. I yes. usually don't think of those together. Yeah. No. Yeah. So I, that was a huge, that was another turning point. You know, we can consume as much, we can limit, you know, toxins and, and try and really go as clean and, and nourish our bodies, but our detox pathways, how are we supporting our core immune and detox organ, our lymphatic system, um, was something I, I didn't hear about in school. And, you know, we had a little bit of it in anatomy and physiology, but when I go back to my books, it was like that much. It was maybe two little paragraphs of 10 sentences. Yep, yep. Um, and so I just thought, okay, what's going on with the system? Why aren't we talking about this? I want to learn more about that. And so um, I kind of blended all of that together. Wow, that's, that's, that's awesome. And, and so you got hooked up with, with organics who, mm -hmm. uh, but they've been around some, some great products and um, what, what are some of your favorite products with, with organics that really fit into your way of treatment? Yeah. All, well, first of all, I love all of their products. I, there, there are several, um, potent, uh, products that they have. So, you know, today I know we're going to talk a little bit about, oh, sorry. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, they have collagen. They have a clean source collagen, which is pretty amazing. So I'll show you what it looks like here. Um, and this is really unique because they have more than just type one and type three. So you're going to get type one, two, three, can, five, can, and can 10. You to, to explain all that? Like what yeah. So one, the, what is... there are different forms of, um, collagen and they have different effects on certain parts of the body. Um, and what I find in prescribing or recommending, uh, collagen to my patients is when we take an assortment of sources. So marine and bovine, so um, animal, both are animal based. And we blend those together, you're able to pull in an, a multitude of the collagen sources. So a lot of collagens we're gonna see on the market are just bovine only. And then others are just um, focused on the like eggshell. You might see um, an eggshell kind of, um, membrane as listed. So that has a different type of collagen based on that in, inside membrane that's feeding a, a, a chick that might develop. And then we see marine based collagen adding another assortment of collagen that complements when we put it all together, we're able to see the max benefit of uh, rejuvenation of uh, cell tissue we're able to see greater strengthening of our elastin fibers. And so those are the horizontal vertical structures of our skin. We see uh, faster wound healing. I do a lot of post-surgical work, elective and, and, and required non-elective surgeries. So for, you know, patients that might be dealing with hip replacement or, you know, the Brazilian butt lifts or, <laughs> you know, post-cancer mastectomies, collagen has a, a broad uh, scope in terms of helping heal, uh, the incision site, it helps the skin heal, um, faster. So we can get to a kind of white, clean, very, uh, minimal scar versus a keloided kind of chunky. And, and so when you take this orally, you'll see effect uh, on the skin. 
Yes, yes. Um, generally, what we see is within two weeks, you will notice a, a significant difference in wrinkles on your face. So the face tends to be where people get more of the compliments when they start taking collagen. Um, but we will see, you know, fine lines and wrinkles starting to fill in because there's a suppleness. And it is one of these accumulative type of benefits where, you know, you take it for two weeks, people are going to start saying, what are you doing? And then you keep taking it and you're taking it every day. Um, it, you know, we're talking about peptides, there are peptides, um, an assortment of peptides in collagen. And we actually see the marine and the uh, bovine sources be very plentiful an assortment of um, peptides that are going to help send signals for cell rejuvenation. And we will see a greater increase in antimicrobial peptides. So that's another kind of thing where we can look at if we're look if we're dealing with a patient that has an autoimmune uh, dysfunction, or in many cases now with COVID, um, cytokine reactivity. We can see peptide immunotherapy by way of food-based um, peptides really come into play because we're more open to the bioavailability of of those peptides. So I always kind of go food first. How can we do it and, where and I think that's totally true. And, more and I think even, you know, it was thought that you take collagen, it's going to break it down to individual amino acids, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Yep. It actually absorbs in different variable, you know, uh, lengths of amino acid chain, mm -hmm. you know, actually the dipeptides, you know, would actually absorb faster than a single yeah. And there's some larger, you know, yeah. chains that absorb the whole, which, which was thought wouldn't happen. You know? Yes. But yeah. You can tell yeah. We see that, that the, the yeah. pentapeptides and the hexapeptides and, you know, that, that takes me back to, you know, the <laughs> organic chemistry and all that good stuff, all those like chains and bonds and stuff like that. But yeah, our, our body, um, what I've witnessed, um, just clinically with, with patients it's it's been phenomenal um, the capacity for them to max their healing, but also I work with high performance professionals. Um, I have several professional athletes that I work with and collagen's approved. And so that's really exciting because a lot of the associations, um, are very limiting, uh, you know, the Olympics and, you know, a lot of the professional associations, they are very cog conscious of, um, any synthetics that might, um, lead to, you know, doping or enhancing performance unnaturally. Well, with collagen, we can also see some of the repair and recovery. So if a, a patient who is uh, semi-pro or is a fitness enthusiast that's doing the Alta uh, marathons and things like that, they have tears, labrum tears and things like that. We can actually use the collagen um, and those peptides to help send those signals and to help the healing process. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting and you talk about the different forms of, of collagen. And when you look and it breaks it down, it actually has these other peptides in there. Mm -hmm. And so do you think evolutionarily that makes sense because you're chowing on these animals or whatever it is, or, and you get it and you break it down to these peptides that are immune modulatory, they're mm -hmm. healing, they're, you know, uh, basically, you know, in increasing growth and, and, uh, you know, all these, uh, mitochondrial function, immune modulatory, um, and anti-inflammatory. It, it's interesting what this collagen strand has, because they're pretty big and you chop them down, you get a ton of peptides. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, we're at, right now it's, it's, we're kind of heading into the cooler months and it's the winter season. My son loves those, um, hot chocolate bombs. <laughs> so it's kind of like the hot chocolate bomb, you know, this is beautiful, great chocolate on the outside. And then there's all sorts of goodness on the inside. And so you can tap into, um, all of those really, really healing, uh, the healing power of, of collagen, but what's really unique is with you know, going back into the peptide world, it, every organism has peptides. And so we see it in the plant kingdom. We see it in the fungi um, kingdom, and we see it in um, the, the human and the mammal um, kingdom. And I think it's oh, very- it's, it's, it's totally true. And you yeah. look at, 
you know, all these peptides we're using were, you know, basically you, you uh, break down whatever organ it is and find the fundamental peptides yeah. and they really stimulate that, that organ and yeah. usually exclusively. It's, it's very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it's a, it's an exciting, um, way to tap into rejuvenative medicine for me, I feel like as a practitioner, it's more natural in its alignment with, you know, I'm food forward, forward, food first, natural. And, you know, one of the things that I, I like with organics is that they, um, they ferment, uh, for instance, they have their mushroom blend, it's called seven M plus, and they, they not only have the potency of an assortment of mushrooms, which are in that fungi, uh, kingdom, they for, ferment it. And so there's kind of, when we look at how do we tap into the power of um, the peptide world, you know, fermenting it is one of the multiple ways to uh, harness the power, um, the bioavailable, uh, bioavailable power. Yes, that's key. And potency. Yeah. yeah, so that's really, I think, where I align really well with organics because they are food first, very natural in the orientation and bioavailability is at the forefront, which is critical because you can take a ton of things, but if they're not going to actually be potent and be able to be absorbed and utilized by your body, it's, what's the point? No, it's, it's very true. And you look at the studies on, on these mushrooms and they're, I mean, there's tons of studies. Yeah. And if it were a med, it would I mean, it, it's just weird to be handled so much differently, you know, it'd be the miracle med, you know, everyone would yeah. be on it. And, yeah. and, well, and what, you, so you this is really interesting. It. The, um, if we look at the pharmaceutical world, oh, almost 50% of the pharmaceuticals that are manufactured, their base comes from a fungus. So you look at penicillin, that's a fungus. Yeah. Penicillin the is a, um, it is a dipeptide. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there, that's where we can really harness functional mushrooms and, uh, you know, med medicinal mushrooms. That is definitely a big popular topic right now. Big, you know, obviously this has been ancient civilizations all across, um, all the continents have consumed mushrooms. It's nature's medicinal, medicinal cabinet, um, if you will. And so what's exciting is we now have technology, we've got research, we can pair it up and look at how can, what can we eat that is out there in the natural medicine cabinet um, that is going to be formulated in the most bioavailable form to tap into the peptides that they contain. So for instance, 7M plus, that's the one brand, the one um, product that I, I really love that has all of the mushrooms that are highly potent and going to contain things like polysaccharide peptides. And turkey tail's the core, the number one ingredient. So it's very forward with the turkey tail. And turkey tail has a ton of research on the ability for it to be um, able to minimize cell damage. It's super antioxidant rich. It helps your liver health, your gut health. And the interesting part with the peptide, the polysaccharide peptides, we call it PSP, that actually we've identified research that support shows that the PSP supports rejuvenating genetic material. So when we look at epigenetics, you know, our environment and our genes, if you're dealing with, you know, maybe not the healthiest genes or gene defects, and you've identified some areas within your genes that might have you be more likely to have X, Y, and Z illness then we could utilize the PSP, these polysaccharide peptides to support cell turnover, to minimize tumor growth if there's any uh, yeah. precancer cells. And, and so all, all these mushrooms seem to be very much like thymic peptides mm -hmm. and they're very immune modulatory. They'll increase that, that TH1, Treg, lower that TH2, TH17, which we, you know, as we age or we have stress or chronic infections or inflammation yeah. and all those mushrooms do all that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, they do it obviously naturally. And, you know, there are folks in the labs that are trying to have that, uh, created, uh, trying to create that from a, a pharmaceutical 
perspective. Yeah, they want to they want to take it and make a pharmaceutical out of it. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> I mean, you, you look at the studies on everything from cancer, autoimmunity. I mean, you know, all these diseases of of chronic illness, right? Um, I I mean, there's hundreds of studies on these things. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, even. You know, so I've I've been to uh, I've done different uh, functional mushroom training, and and it's funny because you know a lot of the pe- a lot of my patients I ask, do you consume mushrooms, and they're like, oh yeah, I eat button mushrooms or <laughs> or, or, or magic dog. mushrooms, yeah. But there's some good studies coming out on the microdosing of the magic mushrooms. Actually, yes, right? yes. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I th- I think we're gonna see um, big shifts. Uh, in that in the next five and, years. Yeah, there's a big bet with big, even big pharma, you know, thinking that the uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms are going to be legalized. So mm-hmm. yes. Yep. Um, yeah. I think it, the, the psychedelic mushrooms are on track where we saw THC. I feel like it's about seven years behind, but yeah, um, I'm, yeah, I'm surprised. I mean, that that's a good surprise. The other surprise, I can't believe where we are as a country and the suppression of medical, you know, truth is so bad, but uh, I won't get into that because I'll keep going. But um, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, these mushrooms have been so under uh, promoted, I think, mm-hmm. you know, for, for what, what they really do. Yeah. And yeah. I, they, I think also um... the collagen with, you know, and they actually in Europe, they call them collagen peptides. Yeah. And you, I, I find that the brands, you know, I'm always looking at the label. <laughs> so I always want to see, you know, what, where are the ingredients? Where are they sourced? How are they labeling them? And I find it interesting in that I can distinguish a really good quality brand if they have it labeled as a collagen peptide. Um, and it tells me more about how is it processed? Yeah. You want the info on the label. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we want full uh, disclosure. And if brands are not going to disclose that, we have to question why are they not yeah, being transparent? Yeah, pass them by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, yeah. What, what is your typical patient you'd use these products on? Sure. Um, well, it, they, they are applicable, you know, functional mushrooms, collagen. It, it's applicable for individuals of all ages. But my kind of base of patient that I see generally has um, multiple diagnoses of autoimmune disease, um, cardiovascular disease, um, and even I have a, a large um, practice of, of cancer thrivers and survivors. And so what we're looking at is mitochondrial uh, impairment. We're looking at nutritional deficiencies. We're looking at um, a slowed aging or, or an accelerated aging process, our goal is to slow that down. And ultimately what I'm trying to do with an assortment of my kind of cornucopia of natural resources for my patients is to really help them harness the youthfulness and the healing power of their body. And so we'll use labs like, you know, other providers and kind of figure out, okay, you know, what are we dealing with? Where are the stress levels at? where our micro um, nutrient levels, where we have vitamin D, vitamin K, and then really digging into even epigenetics, neurotransmitter uh, levels to, to really look at the whole body. But it all comes back down to a few systems that are imbalanced. Gut health is always at the core of uh, imbalance. Um, the liver being a big organ that tends to be um, overwhelmed in their, their bodies. Um, the lymphatic system is a huge, huge system that I really focus in on because of the dual capacity to support our immune system. And what, what, what do you do about the lymphatics? Sure. So I, with, within my practice, I, um, am very hands-on for my in-person patients. Um, so I'm trained to, to do manual uh, lymphatic drainage, which is a motivation of primarily it's the superficial lymphatic system that we're moving. Um, but deeper, I pull in my naturopathic training. And so I look at how overall cortisol, the stress hormone has a negative influence on our lymphatic system and all systems of the body are, are overwhelmed by stress. 
So that's one thing we have to harness is control, balance, cortisol. And then the next thing I look at doing is drilling down on the systemic inflammation within their body to lower the inflammatory response uh, system and to also help ease that lymphatic burden. So when a patient is inflamed, it's not always going to register as, you know, like let's say you have a little, uh, you know, wrist pain or carpal tunnel. You might not always see that kind of swelling, but we're going to see that be presented as a symptom, brain fog or hormonal imbalance or, you know, gallbladder imbalances. So it, it really is trying to help offset the burden the lymphatic system has in trying to alleviate cellular junk and debris and really help the body turn from being the core garbage disposal system to more of that immune immunotherapy. So I created, actually, that is kind of how I got into video content. Um, I found that an hour, it's usually the amount of time I spend with all my patients, but especially with my lymphatic patients, it's not a lot of time if I'm really trying to get all of the motivation in their body. And generally I see them several times a week. They're really progressed. But what I was finding is, you know, it's an hour of a 24 hour day. And if I saw a patient once a week, it's still not enough. And so I started creating videos on, I think it was like my iPhone three, <laughs> I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't even see like myself. I just turned my phone and, and so, you know, they leave and I think, oh, I forgot to tell them something. I'd, I'd record a little video thinking, okay, there are probably other patients out there that could benefit. And so that kind of morphed into me creating my protocols of, okay, these are the things you can do when you're not seeing me because my goal is not to see you all the time. My goal is for you to be independent, to take care and manage this lifelong disease um, and to reduce its impact so that you're not coming to me when you're in a crisis or you, know, you had a wedding and you drank a little bit more alcohol and ate a whole bunch of salty foods. And now we have limb, limb circumference that has expanded out beyond your compression garments. Um, so that is really kind of where I've uh, kind of shifted. I work with patients in person, but there's so much, so now so many more resources, especially with the advent of Amazon and, you know, rebounding, uh, catching wind, I can equip patients with, um, lymphatic pumps and compression and put them on food regimen, a, a very specific lymphatic promotive food protocol. Wow, with um, yeah, specific so, herbs and let's homeopathy. Let's say someone has um, le uh, lymphedema, you know, really just bad. What, where yeah. would you start or just kind of brief yeah. overview of that? Yeah. So one of the things with lymphedema, there are multiple, there's different staging with uh, lymphedema. It is not one of the um, disorders that is going to happen overnight. So it tends to be a gradual pro progression. And unfortunately, um, it, it affects individuals in a way where it will appear that they're holding more excess of, a lot of times they get kind of recommended or referred to have um, gastric bypass surgery where they'll say, oh, you're overweight. You just need to, you know, eat clean and exercise. And, and it, that doesn't everything. Right. Yeah. 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 So with, um, with lymphedema, I stage them. So I do all my measurements and then I um, get a sense either palpating or through imagery, you know, images and um, scans. And, and now we have ability to, you know, have a dye test where they can identify how functional is the lymphatic system. Like some folks, not every lymphatic system in each body is, is the same. So your lymphatic system is different than mine. I might have 1200 lymph nodes and you might have 500. And so that variance it plays a big role. If somebody, let's say a woman has had a mastectomy and now she's had 30 lymph nodes removed from the breast and underneath the arm and the axillary and all those lymph nodes drain the arm and the head and neck. And so what happens is there's this pooling because we basically lymph nodes, I kind of describe them as highway exits. And so if you cut off 30 highway exits in your town on your interstate, well, what's going to happen with all the traffic? It's going to back up. So with lymphedema, um, and this plays into both the collagen therapy and using functional mushrooms, we can utilize peptides to address fib fibrotic tissue. So with lymphedema, the fluid accumulates 
inside the lymphatic uh, tissue. So we have lymph vessels, capillaries, and it's just kind of this vacuum, small little vacuum. And it's just motivated generally by muscle movement or external pressure. And when that's dysfunctional because of all these highway exits that are gone, the fluid doesn't have a good pathway. So sometimes we're gonna train the body to create new pathways, something called alternate routes for removal of the fluid. But then we have to look at just over time, if that fluid's in a stagnant state, the lymph fluid itself is just a, a comprised of all different types of proteins. And so where we look at peptide therapy, with these, this protein dense lymphatics, we can use the peptides to help break up some of the density. So for instance, natto or natto kinase and serapeptase, these are high, um, higher metabolic enzymes and the, we call them proteolytic enzymes. And those along with functional mushrooms, we can use those to help the body literally help break up the protein and to help get that traffic flow moving better. Does it reverse lymphedema? No, so does, not does in all with, cases. With the osmotic pressure or so, just kind of too big to get to the vessels type thing? Yeah, well, basically I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you a sense. The, the largest vessel, the largest duct is our thoracic duct and it's no wider than a pen tip. And so that's not, I mean, you think about like, if you have a drain, a clogged drain and, you know, we get frustrated and we put drain or whatever, however you go snake your drains, it gets clogged. Well, there's no snaking process for the lymphatics other than enzymatic therapies. So we can use these enzymes and peptides to break up the density of the protein. But then most importantly is to have some sort of pumping mechanism. So a lot of times when we're looking at helping the fluid move, it's, you'll see people that have compression garments on and really anything past stage one in uh, lymphedema, those individuals should be wearing compression for about 22 hours a day. That doesn't happen all the time uh, for an, an assortment of reasons. Insurance doesn't cover it. They don't have a therapist locally uh, or they don't even know that they have lymphedema. Um, so generally people kind of do searching and that's how they, they a lot of times it's self-diagnosis. Um, there aren't specialists in terms of like a core, just a lymphatic doctor that you go see. Yeah. 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 So that's a huge gap, but you know, so compression's big compression, uh, manual motivation, like easy, easy to do is dry skin body brushing and anybody it's applicable for everybody. If you want to motivate your lymphatics, you can do a dry skin body brushing technique to move the lymphatic flow to help detox cellular debris. So it, it, have cellulite. How, how does that work for the lymphatic? Yeah. So um, usually I have a brush where I demo, but um, basically the brush itself um, will give us the, um, the effect of a manual treatment. And so manual treatment is this kind of pumping mechanism. Like we kind of have this type of technique where we're helping move through the channels of the lymphatics. But when we dry skin brush, people just basically take a natural bristle brush and put on their skin. And we start um, where we open up kind of, there's a whole process where we open up all the kind of channels and then move the fluid. But basically you just press, you just put the um, brush on your skin and without any pressure, you just do circle, circular pattern and you can sweep up or you can do circles up the arm or up the leg, but the heart's the level plane. So the thoracic duct is right here, right near the heart. And so if we're moving lymphatics, let's say an individual wakes up puppy in the morning, I have a ton of video where you can do these like techniques on yourself, but there are ways for you to drain the lymphatics of the head and neck, but we're draining towards the heart. And then everything below the heart, we're draining up towards the heart. And so there's that technique where you're just moving towards oh, the heart. So do, up. Does the skin stimulate the lymphatics that? Yes. So that, um, that pressure and, and, you know, again, with dry skin brushing, it's so gentle. The roughness of the brush is enough to give us that pumping movement that we need. Oh. And so we just follow the channels of the lymphatics. And basically 
We have lymph nodes um, all throughout our body. They, they kind of end at our uh, lower, you know, the, the extremity. So your hands, you're gonna have lymph nodes that are here in the wrist. We have lymph nodes down in the ankles. And then every organ has clustering of lymph nodes. Uh, you know, so if you think about it, if individuals have any system that is imbalanced or not having, you know, their slow cell turnover or um, pain and it has inflammatory uh, condition, motivating the lymphatic system is going to be very, very beneficial to not just that core organ or area of the body, but it's going to benefit the overall lymphatic system. So the, the lymphatic system is less bogged down by garbage and more capable of being an immune responder to be able to send signals and to communicate the immune needs of those organs or our tissue that might be uh, plagued with inflammation. Oh, cool. And I guess, yeah, we didn't think there was any lymphatics in the brain, but we found that there is, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, um, you know, it only works things, when you're sleeping, as, right? Yeah. Well, as lymphatic therapists, we all, we all knew that just where we know we have lymph nodes and the way the structure is, but the, it's amazing the advancements. Even just yesterday, there's uh, new information about um, lymphedema and the genetic um, connectivity to uh, the lymphatic system being not fully equipped to process. And so some people are living with this impairment, but it takes a cancer diagnosis or surgery to tip it off and to have them end up dealing with or, this. It yeah, they don't pay attention until it's yeah. really bad. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you're doing some, some great work and thank you for sharing. And, um, uh, basically the, the website, if you could spell that out and tell everyone sure. to get those, the, the two main ones that you like, um, yes. well, it's the mushroom, the seven M right. Yep. So seven M plus, and so um, organics is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-X-X. -X. So you just type in organics.com and you can find that there. And then um, this is the collagen. It comes in a packet. And what, what I tell my patients, like this packet is a scoop and you have about 20 scoops in uh, a packet. We have three of us in our family that are consuming this. So we go through this in about seven to nine days. And so how, how does it taste? It, you know what it has, um, they, they have not added anything that makes it, um, taste terrible, but it doesn't take, it doesn't have a flavor or do you put it in love. water or put it in something yeah, else. So or? you can do, they actually have a recipe. They have a keto brownie recipe where you can put it in. These are the kind of recommendations I have. So I have a lot of folks that consume coffee. That's kind of like their staple. So I, if, if they're consuming coffee or keto coffee, um, you can add collagen and it's still a keto coffee. Um, I recommend you add it to coffee or tea in the morning. So you can add it to a hot liquid. Um, you can also add it to smoothie. So you can add it in just like you add your protein. Um, and then you can also bake with it. So we do a lot of home. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. gluten-free products. And, you know, like I have, um, you know, some of my raw protein balls where I'm using a cashew butter, I add collagen in. And so you can really fortify a lot of your foods with collagen in ways that you don't always think like you can add it to soups. So for instance, you know, with holidays, you can add it to dressing, you can add it to gravy, you can add it to stuffing, you can add it to you know, if you're using sweet potatoes, yeah, no, I, or, you know, I, I like that because I don't, mm -hmm. they're taking that stuff every morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is, out. um, you, you know, and that's, that's the great thing about a lot of the, the products, especially with organics. It's so clean, even the seven and plus I have folks that will open up the capsule and add that into their coffee or like my son, he can't swallow capsule E6, but I open it up and I put it in his, uh, nut yogurt that he consumes in the morning. So I'm sneaking in a lot of stuff and I you like can it. even do, like you know, put the mushrooms in, you know, baked goods that you have as well. Awesome. I, th I think all, all that is great. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And, uh, I think it's some, some cool, cool things.
Uh -huh. And uh, I really think, yeah, lymphatics is is huge and, um, you know, some good products that people can get on and start feeling better. Um, so I want to thank you. Thank you. For yes. your time. Uh, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Great. Thanks so much. Do you know it only takes a few seconds to change someone's life? By sharing the Peptide Summit with friends and loved ones, you're giving them the key to health and happiness that they may never hear about otherwise. They're not going to hear it from their standard physicians, um, even you know, the integrated physicians. Many don't know about the power of peptides. So all you have to do is click the share button below to help spread the word. Hello, it's Dr. Ken Holtorf with another episode of the Peptide Summit. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about supplement nootropics, analytics, and some other things with Dr. Gregory Kelly. Uh, he's director and product development of Neurohacker Collective. He's a naturopathic physician and author of the book, uh, Shape Shift. He was the editor of the Journal of Alternative Medicine Review and has been an instructor at the University of Bridgeport in the College of Naturopathic, uh, Naturopathic Medicine where he has taught classes in advanced clinical nutrition, uh, counseling skills, and doctor-patient relationships. Uh, he has published hundreds of articles on natural medicine and nutrition, contributed three chapters to the textbook of natural medicine, and has more than 30 journal articles indexed on PubMed. That's tough to do, let me tell you, especially in natural medicine. They don't like to publish that stuff. Um, his areas of ex expertise include nootropics, and we'll talk about what the heck are nootropics, anti-aging and regenerative medicine, weight management, sleep, and the chronobiology of performance and health. Welcome, um, uh, Dr. Kelly. I appreciate you taking the time and, and being on the Peptide Summit and sharing your uh, expertise. No, my pleasure. It's great getting to have a conversation with you and share some things together with your audience. Nice, nice. And when I, I looked at your uh, uh, website there, and I've known those, known of those products for a long time, and I've uh, looked at them and said, wow, this, this company or this person knows what they're doing. Um, so it, it really shows in the quality of, of your um, supplements. But yeah, tell me, how, how'd you get into this? Yeah, so um, I've been on a long, windy road for a career. I, I started out as an officer in the U.S. Navy. Um, believe wow. it or not, back under um, the Reagan years when the Navy was 600 ship Navy, I think was the goal during the 80s under Reagan. Oh and then, um, you know, they had paid for my engineering degree. So I, uh, you know, I um, was committed to do a certain amount of time. And towards the end of that, I was the like the kind of wacko officer on my ship, right? Like ate well, exercised. And, um, you know, when I got out, I had just got more and more interested in um, healthy living and self-care. And um, got out, kind of went to Hawaii, started taking courses at the University of Hawaii, trying to stitch together more the, the natural end of things. So I, I, my, my master's degree would have been something close to what would be nutritional or medical anthropology, kind of how indigenous cultures figured out how to take care of themselves. And during that time period, I ran into some nature paths in Hawaii and thought like, wow, you're, you've, there's a whole profession doing <laughs> what I seem yeah. to be interested in. So. Um, you know, kind of shifted gears from then, went to naturopathic school in the early 90s. And even as a student, I um, was keenly interested in supplements. It's one of the big tools naturopaths have and started working with one of the leading um, professional um, supplement companies back in the day. And so I feel like I've just been in and around the space for, you know, most of my time since the Navy, you know, going back 25 years now. And um you know, in terms of Neurohacker Collective, you know, we're, um, we're probably more known, as you mentioned, for Qualia, which is our brand of supplements. So like you'll see Qualia Mind or Qualia Life or Qualia Vision as example. Um, and the Neurohacker Collective, some, for many people sits more in the background, but the, the Neurohacker idea is like we started first and foremost as a brain company. But, and, and the goal and thought process was if we want to make the world a better place, one of the most direct ways is by making people's brains work better. And we'll get into Great. more of why that's true. And the collective was this almost we is smarter than me. So recognizing as a new co that a bunch of us had connections with really bright people and that collectively we could make a bigger in, um, impact through things like, you know, um, getting on 
the peptide summit or, you know, having our own podcast to impact because, you know, health's more than just supplements. That, that's great. And with the collective, you guys have gotten along. <laughs> Cause that's yeah, a- well, what we do is, I mean, we have our core team, but then we have a, um, like experts that we can tap into for different things, you know, and then I, like I said, we try to highlight people on our podcast that will know way more about some, some specific area than me or anyone else on our team could ever yeah. hope. And you know, what, what is the name of your podcast and your website? Just to- the, the podcast is called Collective Insights and the website is neurohacker.com. Okay, cool. Excellent. And the same on, on social, like Instagram is a big um, social channel for us. We would be Neurohacker on and, you know, Twitter. Podcasts, you know. How often? The podcast, we usually have uh, about two a month. Um, one's much more health and the other one's, um, we have two different hosts. So one's uh, um, a female, Dr. Heather Sanderson, host that. It's much more about health related topics. The other one's Jamie Wild, who's best known maybe for things related to flow state. So much more about, you know, consciousness and, you know, so they have some of the, some of the same audience listens to both, but some are more attracted to one of the the hosts as opposed to the other. That's great. That's great. In fact, I was just reading a couple of weeks ago or so that they're predicting that uh, dementia is going to increase 50 percent in the next you know 10 to 20 years i mean i think the brain is it just we're getting assaulted from from so many things and i think uh you're right with the nootropics are gonna are, are a must and i think you need to start earlier until you know once all this stuff sets in and it's such a devastating issue when you lose your your mind it doesn't matter how healthy your body is it's it's forget it you know Oh, yeah. And it, just think of over the last, you know, like almost two year period, you know, the, all the, you know, social isolation, stress, all the mood and of cognition have really been taxed, even for, you know, not old brains, for everyone's yeah. brains. I'm telling you, like here in California, the People's Republic of California, um, it's everyone is just so stressed out. And, you know, the, the whole, you know, drug use, alcohol use, overdoses, and, you know, all these uh, psychological illnesses are just going crazy. Everyone, you know, is just stressed out of their mind. Yeah. And the the way, I mean, this is going to obviously oversimplify it, but like two of the biggest jobs of the brain is predicting the future and keeping us safe. And so the the brain and, and, really any complex system, a, a huge chunk of what it's doing is anticipating the future and trying to be prepared for it. And everything that it would have predicted going into COVID for any of us alive today would have completely changed, right? And the way energy is a huge theme for both, you know, like cells, cellular health, but also for brain, like the brain you know, the, the estimates are it's 2% of the weight of our body and uses 20% of our energy, you know, so it's, it's just a huge consumer of energy. And um, so I'll, I'll throw out a question to you and see if you know the answer. So if we had an expert pianist, someone able to play piano well enough to be, you know, perform, you know, in a symphony versus someone just learning the piano, whose brain would be using more energy? I would say the person learning, I would guess. A lot more, right? Yeah. Expertise, like part of the benefit of expertise is it you really dampen down how much energy. So anytime there's something new, the brain, you know, like just think of learnings, that, that simply is the way to say it, the brain has to use a lot more resources for that learning. So always, yeah. and I, I think it kind of goes to just life, like, you know, go outside your comfort zone. And I see so many people, which is not me, I get so bored so quickly and I could not do the same job every day. But I know people that if they deviate at all, they go crazy, you know? And I know my ex-wife's mom worked for AAA for like 40 or 50 years. She goes, if you make me learn anything new, I'm quitting, (laughs) you know? Yeah. uh, so he yeah, had a different mindset, but, uh, well, in, in part, like that's a, it's almost an adaptive thing, right? Like if we don't, energy is a, a resource, right? That if we use some here, we have less here. So in a way, what those people are indicating is 
like I'm conserving my energy, which you know isn't not smart, right? Like that's, but flexibility is important. Like it would be a more a higher cognitive thing, right? Yeah, where, where so, you can where you can tolerate, and I think a lot of these you know peptides and supplements allow the cells to survive that stress, you know, and also give it enough energy to deal with that. Right. And I, like my belief is when our brain has more energy, we innately can get to these higher cognitive things. So what I think of executive functions and social cognition as the top of the pyramid. So if, if we're short in brain energy, the things that are going to not um, get done would be, you know, um, pro-social things and empathy or like executive function would be the suite of things that includes changing our mind, right? Yeah. So when yeah. we don't have enough like mental energy, those behaviors, we just, we can't get to. And I think that's true. I just think of like when you're sick, low energy cells aren't working, you're short with people, you have no patience, you have no empathy. Um, it's just, I need this now, you know? And I, I think it's uh, it's very true with a lot of brain energy. I got energy. You could, no, oh, don't worry about that. I'll take that. I don't take this on. I think it's very true. And I, I think, you know, look at all these diseases they, what do they have in common, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, you know, all these neurodegenerative diseases and, and just everything's a vicious cycle as, as, as you know, immune dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, yep. you know, reactive oxygen species, all, all these things. And uh, it, so yeah, tell me about what, what are some of your favorite um, like supplements or, or tactics, I should say, for health? Like what, what, what do your products target? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, we started first and foremost with just one product, Quality Your Mind. And, and the idea was that if the brain has more resources, like, you know, better able to perform, lots of other things then kind of take care of themselves. So even like, you know, you and I have both worked with patients at different points, you're still actively doing it, I'm not. But one of the things as a naturopathic doctor, we would routinely ask people to do is to change their behaviors, right? So Very I just difficult. mentioned that <laughs> like you and I doing our normal behaviors that we would be asking someone else to do, we would be like the expert pianist. It's not taking our brain nearly as much energy to do those things as it would take someone trying to start those and be like become good at them right so um one of the things i think in terms of where nootropics benefit really anyone is that if we're needing to make change in behaviors or some other area of our lives our brain needs the extra plasticity the extra energy that things like nootropics can benefit so yeah and i tend to think and say what, what what is a nootropic Oh, yeah. So a nootropic, um, like quick history lesson. So um, the idea of nootropics was started in the 50s and 60s by a Romanian chemist and psychologist. He was trying to create um, a sedative, basically something to induce sleep and made paracetam. So it was the first of a category called racetams. And he found it wasn't very good at um, inducing sleep. But when he gave it to animals, it help them be more resilient to things that would normally affect their um, ability to learn or their like behaviors. It um, was essentially neuroprotective. So it, you know, was protective of the brain. And so he coined the, the word nootropic in the early seventies. And it basically it's from two Latin or French words, and it would mean something like bending the mind or mind bender, but think of it plasticity would be what we would think today, right? Like that idea of neuroplasticity, something that's going to upregulate the ability to retrieve information, learn new information, and then put it all together to make sense. So nootropics in a general sense would be things that help us think better, right? like anything related to having the brain perform better. And usually with the implication that um, we're not trading off performance for some unwanted side effects. So gotcha. something like caffeine would be a nootropic, but in a, a fairly narrow dose range. So a lot of nootropics are not more is better. I think of them like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? There's a, a just right amount or just right range where they tend to have the, the more 
nootropic benefits and caffeine if if we go above getting, that getting then you start to get sophisticated you know yeah. as the uh research is there and and i think it's nice and and you look at i think you know standard medicine moves so slow and we're all the stuff is happening is this integrative space right and uh and supplements of course the fda hates it you know because they're w- with big pharma but you know what it reminds me of is i think i was in high school my mom had the book from uh dirk pearson and sandy shaw life extensions yep uh, yeah yeah that they're Maybe really the big into nootropics then i don't yeah that was a long time ago yeah i mean it, it dates back like i said to that um early 70s with you know the racetams and then you know, the Russians did some like and created compounds like Nupapt. But what, you know, modern really jump started in Silicon Valley in the 2000s with these high performers, you know, code monkeys and um, other people involved in startups that rely on their brain and, you know, like being able to focus and perform at a high level for long chunks of the day, starting to experiment with nootropics. And then I think the movie Limitless around 2011 came out of that. So nootropics were definitely adapted by high performers in Silicon Valley in the 2000s, college students kind of at the tail end of that. And then, you know, Reddit's like there's a subreddit on nootropics. And I think one of the things that's then emerged is a lot of these, you know, what you think of as um, almost tonic, brain tonic herbs from things like Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, it turns out like these have nootropics qualities you know so yeah and they've been using for them for hundreds of years right yeah so they didn't have like the term nootropic but um like we use in quality of mind an ayurvedic um it, we use it, the seed of a tree that's called it would translate as the intellect tree um okay. the, the plant is celestial and and so that seed has been used for you know basically more than two thousand years to do things that we would you know collect that I collectively think of as helping someone think better. Gotcha. Gotcha. And it kind of seems like, you know, I guess they found out, you know, used to think that, you know, that stimulants like cocaine and uh, Adderall and things, uh, I would think they're nootropics for a period of time, you know, and, but then you get that downside to them. Right. So those would um, like a lot of people would try to use nootropics as an example to maybe get off Adderall. Adderall will get them the focus, but there's there's trade-offs they're getting yeah. at that. So um, yeah, so that's, um, you know, I, I think, you know, our audience can probably relate. Like caffeine is by far the most widely used nootropic substance on the planet. You know, whether that's as coffee, green tea, uh, mate, you know, it's, you know, um, you know, super popular, but, what caffeine does really, really well is it helps with arousal, so staying alert and awake. And then in neuroscience and in um, actually the DSM-5, there's this idea of cognitive domains. So you, know, so you have a memory domain, you have executive function, you have attention, you have language, you have social cognition. And where coffee excels is in that attention domain. So reaction times and being able to um, process information quickly but that happens at a relatively modest dose of coffee. And more and coffee doesn't like make that performance bell-shaped curve where you yeah. want to be aroused enough, but over arousal, you, you don't do well. Right. Yeah. So that's the, I think that's the, like I call that the Yerkes Dodson curve, but that that upside down curve, you know, so more like a hill than a hole, is um very true for a lot of nootropics. And so you're trying to like uh, what I would say, one of the things we do is we stack different things together. So more than a certain amount of caffeine, you're not going to get further. You just start to slide down the opposite end of the hill. But if you maybe add something like theanine, which would be an amino acid from green tea, that gives you something that the caffeine doesn't. So by stacking you know, some of these different things together that we would have in quality of mind, you start to then be able to tap into these other cognitive areas, you know, like executive function or social cognition. Yeah. And, and my you. goal would be, you know, so caffeine, like I, I love this study. So um, they gave people caffeine um, alone, basically with water or caffeine with, with something with sugar. Um, I think it was sugar and then caffeine and yogurt. And 
over the first 30 minutes that it, those things related to attention improved no matter what, you know, so people processing speed, reaction times, arousal were all better. But 60 to 90 minutes later, the caffeine and water like tank, they were more fatigued than they were starting. But and then caffeine, you do it again and then. Right. But caffeine, yeah. when it was taken with something the brain could use to make energy, performance stayed higher. And the other thing that happened when caffeine was alone, by you know, 40, 50 minutes, irritability and those downsides of caffeine went up. But when caffeine was taken with what I think of as resources, it didn't. So like mood stayed better. So I know when I um, you know, make up nootropic formulas, I'm always looking not what happens immediately, but what happened over the whole day. Because but you know, my goal, if someone took one of our nootropics, is that you know they're going to perform better the first couple hours, but they're not going to have a crash in the afternoon. That they're going to be able to sustain that high level of brain performance across you know their whole working day. Yeah, we're in kind of a calm energy, you know. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's key. And in all in all your research, what has been some of your biggest kind of favorites or surprises or? Or what have you said? Damn, this is awesome. So um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. So that one with energy would be one. Um, oh, well, what we got back to, I think one of the my biggest wake ups was um, like the original nootropic when th this Romanian researcher was trying to figure out what mechanism, you know, paracetam was working by the, his the earliest thing he published was, you know, he thought it had to do with improving ATP to ADP ratio, you know, so like mitochondria, right? So I guess one of my biggest uh, ahas, and this wouldn't be a surprise to you, is how frequently mitochondrial performance and dysfunction just show up in, in whatever area of health we're talking about. And that if we can make that, like that community, right? Because um, the way I think of mitochondria is that, you know, they're a network of things within each cell, right? So a cell could have hundreds to thousands of mitochondria, right? And it's that network that's constantly reshaping itself to better match us to our environment, right? So I, I think one of the big ahas that's come up in my life for sure has been that, that role of this incredible like network of mitochondria. But another would be, um, and you mentioned in my bio, in my um, biography when you're reading in was um, chronobiology. And, and so just for your audience, chronobiology would be the study of timing. So circadian rhythms, seasonal rhythms for women, uh, menstrual rhythms, but even faster rhythms like heart rate variability. So the other like big aha is how important when we do something is. So interesting. And that's because I like all I have the worst circadian rhythm you know i had lime since i was born so like everything was screwed up and night is day and day is night to me i mean i get energy at midnight and all I, I can stay awake for two days on nothing just and then i'll go to sleep and i it's not healthy i can feel it you know and uh but uh you know and i think it's kind of like the shift work and, and all those things i think there's there's a lot to, you know, doing what evolutionarily we were supposed to do when lights went out, you know, we didn't have TVs going and, you know, all these lights and EMFs and throw all that stuff in there and all these toxins, pesticides, you know, you name it, um, we're getting bombarded. So I, I, I really think people need to supplement, I think just standard nutrients that, you know, from the food ain't going to do it anymore you know, because we have too many assaults on our body. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard it many times, like, well, I eat a good diet, or I eat a balanced diet, or, you know, however, someone would, you know, mention that, but most diets are going to have holes somewhere, you know, so like choline. So one of the, again, like nootropics, the cholinergic system was, again, one of the early things, right? So things to boost acetylcholine, basically, because acetylcholine, is, you know, like for the audience, think of that as the neuroplasticity molecule. So when it becomes important to like learn something new, our brain will release acetylcholine almost as a message saying, hey, this is important, pay more attention to this, right? So to make that we need choline in our diet. And 
the Institute of Medicine doesn't have an RDA like for vitamins, for choline, but they have an advised amount. And they, um, when I've seen things published on it, they estimate somewhere just above eight out of 10 adults don't get enough choline in their diet. So it's not like they're getting none, but day in, day out, there's a shortfall, right? And if there's a shortfall in that, we just can't do all the things, you know, the liver needs that, cell membranes, mitochondrial membranes, and then this neuroplasticity molecule. So, you know, one of the things I think of with nootropics or especially with our products is what, um, you know, what things even in a good diet might benefit by augmenting kind of the pool of those nutrients. And often good things happen when we fill in those gaps. You know, we don't have to do two or three times that. Choline's again, like caffeine, not a more is better but making sure that your, your tanks are full and maybe you've got a little surplus to draw on if you know, something happens where we have to learn a lot more. Right? Yeah, or it's interesting. Like I found, you know, I got addicted to aspartame. I'm telling you, you know, it's an excitotoxin and it's addictive. And all of a sudden I started stuttering so bad. Like I couldn't carry a cell phone. I could not answer my phone. I was going to go to um a stuttering clinic and then i read an article saying aspartame caused stuttering and i went off that two weeks later no more stuttering and then if i would accidentally get some in a in a drink or something i would just start stuttering immediately you know but it just shows that and but it was very hard to get off of i didn't want to you know because it it's I, i think it's more stimulating than caffeine at least for me and uh woke me up but i not great, but it was overstimulated and I stuttered, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing with all that stuff. But uh, what would you say are your kind of your, your go-to, you know, tropics or things you would tell, you know, uh, anyone, hey, these are the, the core things you have to have to get in your, in your system. So, um, so in, within like the nootropic community, there's, um, this saying, your mileage may vary. And the idea being that, you know, we're all individuals, you know, that biochemical individuality sense. And so, you know, what we've seen in the studies that Neurohacker Collective has done is that um, when we say we make a, a formula like quality of mind or quality of focus, we'll get some percentage of people that are super responders. They, they just get a way better response than average. And then we'll have a lot of people with a good response. And then for some people, it just doesn't work. So I I think one, like before we get into recommending what to do, I think it's important to understand that we don't all respond the same way. People that, I mean, they take the tiniest bit of a supplement and they're like, oh, I'm jittery. I'm like, give me a break. (laughs) But yeah, then other people take a whole bottle and go, well, nothing's happening. Right. And and so I think, I would invariably start with the brain unless there's a good reason to start somewhere else in part, because if I was coaching people, I'd be asking them to make some behavior changes, you know, so I I want the brain to have more resources through that time period. So I would start personally with call your mind, which is a a very comprehensive nootropic stack with, you know, a couple different forms of choline that can get into the brain, caffeine in that just right amount, you know, some great, I I, I do like all the choline, uh products I, I think they're key and we like to use a lot of those yeah yeah so that for your audience you know when you're looking at what cholines are best to get into the the brain because um sometimes in research i'll see the 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 phrase brain essential nutrients and, and the idea is there's some things the brain can make and a whole bunch other it has to pull from our bloodstream right so we have to you know supply it outside the brain and and cholines are one of those things and, and alpha gpc and um, citicoline, you know, so those are the two that can easily get into the brain. They're used somewhat differently in a, a really complicated biochemical cycle. So those I think of as the two best nootropic cholines. And the, but the other thing, like if someone, you know, okay, I don't want to take those, like, and you're willing to eat more egg yolks, right? Like egg yolks are really rich in- Yeah, are they good or are they bad? Yeah, you know. Right, so, you know, I wouldn't say eat, unlimited that, but eat enough to make sure you're getting, you know, good dietary intake of choline. Cause like I said, we can kind of guess 
on average, most people are running 100 to 200 milligrams short a day of what they need. So gotcha. again, are, you, are you getting any any pushback from, you know, the FDA seems to be, yeah, with supplement, or say meds, they're really cracking down on anything. If it's safe and effective, they want to get rid of it. And it seems the same with supplements. The um, only thing that's, um, that the FDA, I mean, they still haven't approved, um, you know, things like um, the cannabinoids, right? So there's lots of like everything from water to you name it has those, but they're, they still haven't essentially said that these are dietary supplements. And the other thing that's happened in the last year is um, N-acetylcysteine, which, you know, it's been used in functional medicine, integrative medicine for decades and decades. They all of a sudden um, said, hey, we don't think this is a dietary supplement because it was um, used as a medication back in the 60s. Yeah, but it was because people were using it safe and effectively for COVID was the problem. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it, it makes me sick to tell yeah. you the truth. So that's, and they didn't outright ban it or anything like that. They basically just wrote a letter saying, you know, this is our position. And then I know amazon.com moved then to just remove any supplements that contained it. They leave so, everything vague that they can enforce whatever they want. Kind yeah, of so it but, was a shame because it's, I mean, it's a great um, nutrient, super safe. It's, you know, very well studied. Um, so we had it in two of our formulas and switched it out for L-cysteine instead, just so that we wouldn't be dinged on Amazon. Yeah. And, there, and there's so many, um, uh, you know, supplement companies, you know, we're kind of in that space and, and it's like, we've tested people's supplements and some of them have nothing, none of what's supposed to be in there. And the claims are crazy. And, uh, and I, I still get your product. It just, I, I think you guys done such a great job of uh, formulating, you know? I think we also, um, I think we're very unusual. Like before we launch any product, we've done basically what I, I would call N of one, you know? So we've made up small batches. I've taken it. I've got some other, you know, kind of friends in the collective to take it, you know? So we had, well, we had mentioned the Xenolytic before we started. So the Xenolytic that we're testing right now, I, I've already taken, right? So before I would ever, you know, move to- well, trust me, I've almost <laughs> killed myself doing, trying to find toxic doses of things, yeah. yeah. And then um, and then once, you know, once we kind of pass that stage, we'll make enough to do a small study, open label, so not placebo control, but we'll do what we would think of as a safety, tolerability, and does it work study, right? So. Um, by the time we move a product to market, we've already, you know, often made adjustments to the formula to make sure that whatever we're selling does what it's supposed to do. And I mean, in my that is so that's, far and above what yeah, in the supplement nine percent of the supplement world, you know. Yeah. yeah, and so because of that, you know, we don't launch a lot of products. We don't have a lot of SKUs, but we stand behind what we do have and offer. I believe it's a hundred day money back guarantee. Because, you know, like, you know, like I mentioned, there's a subset of people that are non-responders to things. We don't want them to be dinged, but we're confident that most people yeah, will and get it. And I'm sure they're getting benefit, even if they don't, yeah. you know, think they feel it. And, and, and we have, you know, people also fill out, you know, like their um, overall average uh, energy sense of well-being and then 10 symptoms, frequency and severity. And they'll say, well, no, no, nothing's changed. And we go back and look, well, wait a minute, you were a two here. Oh, yeah. You know, we so saw that. Know. So um, I'm sure like you are aware, like, um, like screen times, digital eye strain symptoms. So when we were um, testing out quality of vision is what we call it, but it was put together really for screen time stress, right? Because our like, especially when um, COVID hit and screen time leaped up, like I saw statistics that an average person was on a screen 13 hours a day, um, you know, so crazy, right? Wow. And, um, you know, so quality vision was very much made as um, protection for that. And so when we were doing the study for it, we had people do a, like a baseline digital eye strain questionnaire. And then, you know, we then every week we had them recomplete another one. And what was funny is some people noticed like, some people would have gone from a crazy high score, say 28 to 30 down to a five and say, well, I didn't notice anything, <laughs> right? Where others, it was, you know, like they were more attuned to it, so. 
Yeah, no, it is funny. I think it's an evolutionary thing. See, like you don't want to remember bad things. You know, it's like I think even the relationships, all you remember is the good things, right? It's like you don't want post-traumatic stress for everything you do. Well, and the other thing we do a week after our study stops and people have been off whatever that the, the product that we're testing for a week, we'll email them back. And quite often, that's when they noticed what it was doing. Go, Damn, I didn't realize. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. I think it's totally true. Well, hey, um, I think you're doing great work. Uh, keep it up. Um, and can you uh, name off your websites and products again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, one thing that our... Um, that we wanted to invite your audience. Um, if you go to um, neurohacker.com slash guide, you can get a, a free neurohack, of basically um, our guide to neurohacking, right? That touches on awesome. a bunch of the big picture things. So, you know, we'll definitely do that. Um, like I said, we're neurohacker.com. From there, you can, you know, find our collective insight, but um, or you can find our blog, our collective insights podcast. But, um, you know, if you're using, you know, um, the Apple, like iTunes to find our podcast, it's Collective Insights. And um, our products, our, our brain products, our premier one is Qualia Mind, but we have a, um, a, a fewer capsules, less expensive, still a great nootropic called Qualia Focus, that as an entry level, I highly recommend it. We've got for people that are on computers a lot, the Qualia Vision product, for people concerned about healthy aging, we have a product, Qualia Life, that's got the NAD portion, mitochondria, a bunch of things we didn't get to. Um, we've got a great immune product, which I, I like personally take every day called Qualia Immune. Um, the idea everyone's behind, immune system is shot. I'm telling right. You. And, um, and there's this thing within immunity called um, basically trained immunity. So think of it like exercise for our immune cells like certain compounds make um, especially the innate immune system. So macrophages, NK cells, bigger, faster, higher performing. So we created Qualia Immune with that in mind. So it's not um, things, it's not geared so much to take when you get sick, though there's things that um, would work for that. I, I think of it much more as exercise for your immune system. So and oh, then I, we, I like um, we have a product called Qualia Night, which is, um, I talk about as a nighttime nootropic. So it's something you would take at dinner time that's got a lot of nootropic herbs, but ones that are more calming. And so it, it, it generally gets categorized as a sleep product because that's the side effect of being calmer and more relaxed going into your evening is usually it's easier to fall asleep and we get better quality sleep. So, and then we just launched Qualia Skin, which is a, uh, Basically, um, like beauty from within would be the category, but um, I like the idea of eat pretty. It's, it's basically a food, um, lots of super fruits in it and other um, ingredients that are designed to, to basically create healthier, better looking skin from the inside. You know, I, I have not seen that one. I got, I got to check that one out. Oh, yeah. um, just have your team email us and we'll get you, you know, a couple bottles. And that, that's, that's one that we recommend like it's slower to change things from the inside out. So yeah. that's one, our study on that, we did for three months before. Really? Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, studies aren't cheap, you know? And, yeah. uh, and you guys have studied all your products and published and uh, it's very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks for having me on. It's been a, a pleasure. Yeah. It's, it's so nice to meet you. And, uh, and I, I do think you're just, doing it the right way. So thank you and keep it up. And thanks for sharing all the information. My pleasure. Great. All right. Take care. Have you joined the conversation yet? We'd love to hear from you and learn how this empowering information is supporting you and your loved ones. See the comment section below and join the rest of the community in discussing what they're learning in, in this peptide summit and really take an active role in, in your health care. Hi, this is Dr. Kent Holtorf with another episode of the Peptide Summit. This episode's for uh, practitioners out there, not, not so useful for the uh, patients and the, and the public. Um, but we have uh, Don Winsek, who is the owner and founder of True Body Wellness, um, with uh, they basically custom make uh, supplements. Uh, Don, thank you so much for, for being on. 
And I think this is a great service for practitioners to kind of bring their practice to the next level. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Right. So a little bit of, about Don. Uh, he's president and owner of True Body Wellness, a uh, supplier of private label dietary supplements. Uh, he's had positions as vice president and president and CEO of a multiple uh, product manufacturing businesses. He has a background in engineering and a master's in business. He started True Body Wellness in 2001 with the goal of making high quality and effective dietary supplements available to customers for private labeling, uh, allowing the doctors to go to market with confidence and building their brand and success uh, really in this growing market. And it's becoming more and more complicated, and but there is so many amazing things that are that are are coming out and it's just i think the whole field has just expanded you know so much it used to just be you know a couple of basic uh, supplements but he's you know leveraged education experience and product development and manufacturing to build a network and what i really like we've been using them for a number using him for a number of years is that he can go to the to the uh, manufacturers that have like you know what you really need let's say you want a cream or you want a oral spray or a particular type of uh, supplement and go to this person while well, these people are, are better for for this style and and also help you with uh, you know uh, basically formulations where and I think the biggest disappointment starting out was and, and everyone's like well this should have more of this this should have more of this mm -hmm. well I can't make a capsule this big you know and uh yep. So, and then also, I think, well, once you kind of get into it, the FDA regulations have gone crazy, but, um, and that's where really your help has been just tremendous, where we don't have to go searching through or getting, getting hit for, you know, mislabeling and things like that. So, uh, uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, again, we, we've loved your service and uh, uh, tell how you kind of help, help doctors. No, man, I appreciate that. But you said it's a, it's it's a actually a very big market. It's a growing market. I mean, in the it's like a hundred twenty billion dollar worldwide market. Just dietary supplements. U.S. is about forty five billion dollars, and it's growing at uh, you know pun intended at a healthy you know six to eight percent a year. I mean, for that big of a market, they kind of grow. That's a, that's a, there's lots of opportunity. You know, we kind of look at it. Um, we want to talk about is this is. Uh, you know, opportunity for maybe doctors and healthcare providers to add more revenue to their, you know, you can add more money to their income stream and profits. Uh, you can bring more value to your customer. There's no question. You can bring, you know, extra health uh, programs and things that work better for your patients and clients. And uh, you can build your brand. You, know, you can add some things to your brand and their, their trust to you. So yeah, and, and uh, you know, those are the things we see. And yeah, the way I, I look at it is that it's a win 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 that, you know, it's basically instead of putting the money in the pockets of these, you know, big supplement companies, and there are there's some good ones out there, yep. but their stuff is expensive. I mean, they have all this overhead and, you know, it's like all these, you know, uh, you know, ex executives that they have to pay and things like that. And so uh, the stuff gets very expensive. So you can get really the higher quality and you can tweak these formulas let's say you know you have a favorite formula from a company and you're like well you know i'd like to maybe just have more of this or more of that or add that uh it's it's a great opportunity to to do that and i think too and the patients get it cheaper right and you're putting the money in your pocket instead of that that big you know supplement company and and the big supplement companies are kind of becoming like big pharma you know <laughs> They are. Uh, they're they're getting pretty pretty powerful in that too, um, and uh, I, I think you get you know, more involved and also really see the see the difference that you know when you research uh, supplements and find something new and you're able to make it exactly as, as you want it. It's much more satisfying, I think. Yeah, you mentioned um, th there's an issue of trust too. I mean, literally, friends of friends of mine hesitate buying supplements because they're not sure what they're getting. They don't know what a company. Oh. They're not sure was they really in the capsule. But here's a chance to leverage your, your leverage your trust, your patient's trust to say, "Yeah, I trust you. 
And so you work with the right, the right company to bring a, a very quality and known product to them. Uh, they'll trust it. They'll buy it. And they'll actually probably pay more for it because now they, you know, they can, they, they, they trust your brand, they trust your advice, and they trust the product you're bringing to them. Yeah, it, it is such a difference. And when we've taken the time to test other people's stuff, um, and it's not a good track record. And no. people with, you know, companies with good reputations and we're like, there's nothing in there or 10%, 20%, 30%. Yep. Um, and we're like, that can't be. And then we check it again, you know, and we don't ever really say anything, but uh, we just stop using them or, you know, let's say it's a, uh, like with the peptide, a competitor or something, but some we've had where, look at, they're just blowing smoke. Like, you know, it's yep. totally unethical. And the claims too are, are crazy. Um, but uh, but uh, the claims, the claims they're... are a good point because the way you get, get into trouble with the FDA and the FTC for that matter is the claims you put on your label and how you market it, you can get a lot of trouble with your claims. That's you got to be careful. You cannot claim you cure any disease at all. You know, you, 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 that's that's what the FDA looks at. They look at what's, as you mentioned, what's in the bottle is what's on that label is that actually in the bottle. If it's not, you've got problems and what you claim, you know, you start claiming the cure cancer and you've got serious issues. So you do got to be very careful. Yeah. And, and you never know. I mean, there's so many people and you're tempted to make claims. Let's say there's a study showing this helps osteoporosis. But if you say it, um, they, all these other people over here are saying it, but it may be you that they come after. They tend to come right. after <laughs> that you know, smaller, mid, small, and then they, they're kind of like Rome, uh, you know, devastate one village and then the rest <laughs> of them surrender, you know? Exactly, yeah. And they don't want to go up to the big guys because it's going to be a fight. And, uh, but I just shake my head at, at the amount of claims that are out there and what, what people are, are saying. But, uh, and, and two, I, what we've noticed is that and we never check like uh, or Costco. It's like people like we'll have melatonin from you per se, even mm -hmm. just a, like a single like sublingual melatonin. And people go, oh, melatonin doesn't work. We'll try this. And they're like, oh my God, it totally worked. Yeah. You know, and and so, you know, some people, oh, I can get this at Costco for, you know, $3. Well, that's what it's worth probably, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, and I, I think that's that's a nice thing um, that you know what's in it is is in it, and and that you also with your knowledge can recommend things to enhance a particular formula and, and work with the doctors that way. Yeah, there's definitely certain ingredients you can add that um, you, know, you, you combine different ingredients so they have more synergy, they have better better effectiveness. So those are some of the things we can bring to the table. And, and that's like, it, and it, it's funny, like the doctors in our office, it's like, like they, they kind of do the same thing. They're like, well, we, we need more of this in there, you know, more of this, more of that. Like you can't yeah. have the thing that has every, everything in it, which, which is, is a bummer. That's the problem with supplements. They're kind of take up a lot of space and some things are mm -hmm. like, are like chelated minerals, right? Uh, I mean, the yeah. problem is there, that makes it such a big molecule where you could triple the amount of just like magnesium oxide or whatever, you know? And so you get twice as much absorbance from the chelated, but you can give four times the amount in the capsule of not chelated. So it's kind of like, you know, weighing those things. And, and uh, I, did, I think it's fun uh, to do as well and, and get into it. And when you, you know, and, and there's so much now I think great research coming out on supplements, you know, and, and you would think yeah, more and more. that with modern medicine, everything's meds, 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 but the way the whole system is, we know it's all rigged and the studies that people are more natural, 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 because they find that these meds are, you know, in five years, they say, oh, shoot, yeah, it's causing cancer or, or whatever, yeah. or tons <laughs> of side effects, but you would think that over the years, things would become less natural or even look at the foods, you know, and more science-based, but um, it is becoming science-based, but natural. Yeah, no question. Again, that's what speaks to the growth, 
especially now, you know, obviously we're coming, still coming through the COVID period. So everybody's looking better at more at their overall health, immunity, you know, how they just build up just general health. And so supplementation, that's why it's growing so fast. Yeah, and I guess the, the FDA world was, was really mad, I guess, that um, the immune supplements like went up like fivefold or something, and yep. so they weren't too happy with that. And, and you know, NAC, they banned the fish because it is a drug, um, but so many people are getting NAC for COVID that they banned it. You know, if something's yeah. safe and effective and cheap, they're going to ban it, yep. <laughs> basically. And they're coming after supplements again. Um, and hopefully they, they won't. I think the backlash would be too bad with that. But they're really It'd coming after huge. compounding pharmacies right now, uh, especially sterile compounding and peptides and that. You know, again, if it works and is safe, yep. it pisses big pharma off you know well the other part if it works and it's safe and pharma can't control it that's when you got that's when the fda tries to shut it down yeah and and people like fda is the watchdog of big pharma give me a break there <laughs> yeah you know, it's know. like that's big pharma pays their salary yeah yeah uh, so, interesting thing just want to say with the fda the fda does regulate dietary supplements but they don't approve dietary supplements that means that they set the rules, you know, good manufacturing, GMP, good manufacturing practices. They set the rules, but it's self-regulated. So your manufacturer follows the rules set up, but does, they don't have to submit any product to the FDA. So if you ever hear a product's approved a supplement is approved by the FDA, they're lying. It's, they do, FDA does not approve dietary supplements. Unlike pharmaceutical drugs, they do, they have to. So it really counts, it puts the, the manufacturer self-regulates themselves. So that's where it puts a lot of faith and trust in the manufacturing process. Because um, now they all, you want to always look for someone who's uh, GMP certified, which means a third party auditor comes out and does it. But I have personally seen just because they're GMP certified doesn't mean they always follow the process. So that's where I, these were a true body. We always work with manufacturers that not only are they GMP certified, we personally, I personally know each of them. I know the owners, the management team, and I trust them. It's trusting the people and the processes to make sure they're, they're delivering exactly what they say they're doing. I, so it's, it's I think that that is, that, that's that been huge. And I've learned um, because, you know, and now like, you know, for uh, other things we buy, we, we go out there and check, but who has the time to do all those things? Right. Especially right. you find a supplement company, and, hey, they sound good. And it reminds me when early for 20 years ago, I started a beer company and uh, we actually won a, um, we had a hangover free beer. We had double blind placebo controlled studies that showed yeah. hangover free. And as soon as we got it out, the FDA, the Bureau of Alcohol Tobacco Firearm said, nope, can't make a healthy beer. But right. uh, then we did an energy beer. We won a silver medal in the World Beer Cup and a bronze in the World Beer Championships. And then we had to scale up, right? So we went to this company and well, they, they seem good. And we paid them by the case and, oh my God, it turned horrible. And <laughs> then we went to a trade show and people go, everyone knows not to go with them. Everyone knows not to yeah. go with them, you know? And it, well, we ended up in this lawsuit and blah, 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 you know? So that's, that's what you help these doctors avoid is that big expensive mistake, right? Yes, exactly. And, and so that's, that's what I, I found. It's what you don't know, you don't know is that's where it kills you. Until it's too late, exactly. Yep. Yeah, and so I'm sure you, you've you've been through it and saw all all the problems, and you weed out the problems. I mean, that's that's huge, and and we found that. I mean, your pricing is just uh, so much better than you know n you know the overwhelming majority of, of people out there, and and quality is the key, you know. And, and no problems where it's like, oh, we're backlogged three years, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, even with the supply chain, you've been doing great because you have a number of choices too, right? Oh, yeah. So um, you have a it's been a challenge. It gets more challenging all the time, especially bottles and, you know, one of the things you got to remember. Simple stuff. It's like we're a third world country. Yep. Simple stuff. But if you have five, six ingredients and you're missing one, you got to wait and hold it. But so far, yeah, we have dozens of suppliers. So if one's out, we can move to the next one. 
And so we've been hold, we've been doing pretty well with deliveries. That's been challenging, but we've been holding our own. No question. Great, great. And when you find it, what what is the typical doctor's practice that you work with? Uh, it's either a, most of it's focused on uh, with our doctors. It's mostly focused, believe it or not, on overall health and or weight loss or weight management. Uh, because generally, because you know, let's let's face it, right? You see the statistics with COVID that um, oh, 78, yeah. 70, 78 percent of the people who died were basically obese or morbidly obese. So uh, they find the most success with um, weight loss or weight again, weight management. You got to be careful what you say when you're doing labeling. <laughs> see, yeah, weight already. management. Yeah, so and you got to watch it. Do you have any any conventional doctors or are they more of the integrative type? I guess it's kind of label, I guess, if they use supplements that make them integrate, you know, or do you have like standard physicians that say a urologist that does a prostate formula or something? We, we have most of them are chiropractors, uh, believe oh. it or not. So the chiropractors uh, do very well in this area. So that's our biggest base. Then we have a few doctors and they're just general practitioners. Um, and so we have some that focuses entirely on weight loss and others weight loss plus overall health. So they'll, they'll buy multiple products from, you know, uh, like superfoods. So this way, just general, you know, drinking superfoods to get overall health and, um, digestive enzymes for, for, you know, um, stomach health. And so it varies, but I, again, I'd say a dominant one really would probably be at this time is weight management products gotcha gotcha and and it, it is you know you find something that works and it uh, i i think it just you know you need now to be a successful doc you need multiple revenue streams and you know it's not about everything you can get out of the patient it's it's that you know if you put the time in to learn about all these things and talk about them in the patient because they're going to benefit from them because you know, we found that unless you have them in the office, right. um, the patient, and you can write down, go take this, take this, the, you know, 99% chance they're not going to get it or they're going to get something totally wrong. Right. Um, and, you know, they'll look around forever trying to find it and trying to save a dollar or whatever it is, and they end up not getting it. And where the convenience of the patient is just, Boom! You know, all in the pack when when they're there in the office. Um, I, I think it's just such a a win win that uh, it's it's a way to go. I think even so much. I think it's it's much better than you know. There's some of the companies they have the website where the doctor you know right. writes for it and then gets a kind of a kickback, which really is not legal. But they the uh, they're not enforcing the Stark laws, but there's some bigger um some of the companies won't do that because officially it is not legal to to do the kickback i mean right. buying them and making them yourself is fine um but i, I think because the the doctor will have something on the website to show it's theirs like they they're making money from it because it's you know when you give it to the patient it's not it's totally honest it's like look i'm selling this to you right where right. when you send someone to a website it's kind of dishonest in that hey i'm sending you somewhere else but i'm getting money back for it well we found though the, the ones our doctor our chiropractors have the best success it's part of a plan so just not really selling a you know a, a supplement we, we st if we stick with the health, the weight management there's a whole plan there's a diet plan there's an exercise plan and the supplement is part of it. So where that brings value, brings value to the uh, you know, patient because now they have a holistic plan, which is good for them. It works better, has more successful. It works great for the healthcare provider because it's really a plan. You charge more. You've got a whole package. They probably come back once a month, once every two months to see how they're doing. So it's, it's, it's more than just selling Here's a bottle of a supplement. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I can't, I'm the worst salesperson ever. And was I won't sell anything. I I don't sell. I just I basically prescribe what I think is right. the best thing for them. And I know doctors tell you we hear that like, oh, I don't you know, I'm not comfortable selling. I'm like, don't sell. I don't sell. Right. Yeah, you know? don't sell. Yeah. 
here's a program, here's a plan. Let, you know, let's work through it. This, this is, you know, uh, do what you do and do the whole, the holistic approach because that's where the, the most success is. So you're selling and you said, yeah, you can, I'm not sure. I don't know the charges, but you could be doing a hundred dollars a month for, for, you know, patients now that are helping them and helping your revenue stream when they come back. But again, it's not just a supplement, it's a whole program. Yeah. And instead of them going to trying to get at Costco or getting something like it, and then they're not on it, you don't know if they're taking right. it or not. And, um, and it's, it's never the same, but it, you have kind of a seven step plan. I think you, yeah, we we're mentioning. So number one would be just that. Well, first is have a goal. You know, what, what are you trying to, where's your speciality? What are you trying to do? Is it weight management? Is it, um, you know, heart health? Is it, is it brain function or a healthier brain? So first have a goal, health goal in my opinion. Do, do you recommend for a doctor start out with one or maybe a few or what, what do you recommend? I think just one because uh, we'll, we'll get into it because how do, how do you, like I said, how do you sell it? How do you market it? That's very important early on. But so first start, what's your goal? And then once you have a goal, don't just think of a supplement as we just talked about, think of a plan, run a program. You know, you just want to make it whole, you know, food is, uh, you know, how's your diet? How's your exercise? What other things can you do? Oh, by the way, these supplementation will help achieve all these goals. And the third, you, you need to, you know, you need to pick a supplement. You know, so let's talk about, it. you know, we can help you with that. And you have your thoughts on your, what you read in terms of what dietary supplements you believe will help or what ingredients will help support the plan. So that'd be the third step. The fourth one, probably initially, if you've never done it before, it may even be the most important, your marketing plan. <laughs> How do you plan to market it? Because it, with supplements early on, you know, or it, it's, there's a lot of them out there, right? A lot of choices. There's Costco juice. There's all kinds of places. So you need to know how you're going to market this. Uh, uh, and that's would probably be the most important first step. When you have success, now you can add things easier because now you know it's working. But I, yeah, think that's but a very I, I don't think you really, it's really the marketing part is just you recommending it. You know? Very possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and well, like I said, like marketing. Us, we, don't, we don't really sell. I mean, people can buy it outside of our practice, but 99.9, .9, you know, it's people in our practice and then they'll tell someone else. But um, so like we don't need like a, you know, marketing online or anything like that. It's right. basically the doctor saying, hey, this is what you need. This is what you need, you know, yep. um, and that's the, the biggest thing is the doctor saying it, you know. Yeah. And it could be too, not just that, but putting a little brochure together. Oh, by the way, here's our weight management plan. Here's our heart health plan. I mean, that's marketing. That's just, you know, it's an easy sell once you're in your office to say, here's a program. You know, why don't you take a look at this? You know, we can, we can talk about this. That's, that's what I mean by a marketing plan. You know, understand how you're going to present it to your patient and uh, client. But after that, you have to, you know, try, I would, then private label, private label the, the product because you want to protect your brand. You want it to be your brand. So, you know, put your logo on it, put your name on it. And it just brings more credibility. You, know, you, you, you can't go to Costco and buy, you know, Dr. Haltor's vitamin C. It doesn't exist because it's your brand. Uh, so I'd say branding is the next step. After that, uh, to me, obviously, just as important, pick the right manufacturer, pick the right source. You know, uh, understand That's that. So true. So true. Yeah, because like you said, it's it's, it's there's a lot to it. So you know, again, from our you know, our point of view, you know, we can bring you, we can help you all the way from picking the ingredients, picking the formula, uh, the label design, the manufacturer, the manufacturing of the product, and the shipping. All you know, and we can do it from soup to nuts, and you just worry about what you do, and again, we'll help with the formulation. And, uh, and you can start too. Like you said, we have standard formulas. Maybe they're close enough. Maybe they're not exactly what you want, but start there. Prove you can do it. Once you can do it, then you can always uh, go to the next step and customize. And, yes. uh, so we must so. drive you crazy with all our super custom fineness. <laughs> weird <laughs> ingredient. And <laughs> but so you definitely, uh, yeah, it's been a challenge. <laughs> Some of those ingredients, I don't know where the hell you found them. 
And then I don't know how well, I found there it. There is found so it. much literature coming out on all these supplements. I mean, there's finally studies on all these things, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I love it. We do our like bone restore through you. And, and I just, I keep thinking of this endocrinologist who was just always all over us. So, you know, we'll suppress people's TSH and your bones are going to just dissolve, you know, and then <laughs> they're just getting the, uh, basically the, uh, the DEXA scan, the bone, and the, uh, the bone mineral density just going up and up and up, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's like, yes. And they're like, a supplement can't do that. What medication <laughs> are you on? You know, let me put you on Fosamax. Like, no. And, or, or it was like a lot of times too, they'll go, oh, that Fosamax Max is working or whatever. And like, oh, I haven't been, I haven't taken it for two, three years, you know? And they're like, well, how could that be? You know? I know. Well, yeah. I actually have a little personal story. So I, I, one thing I struggle with, the only medication I take, and it's way reduced, is for blood pressure. But about 10 years ago, I, I met a, a, a PhD in nutrition, and we talked about blood pressure. So he recommended a supplement of L-arginine and citrulline and a few other things. He said, take this. So I started taking it. Six months later, I go to the doc, and my blood pressure is way down. And he goes, what are you doing? So I explained to him the supplement. The doctor had no idea what the supplement right. was, no, no, but he no. noticed that in six months, it actually had an effect. And my the medication I take now is one fourth of what I used to take, which is always good because the you know, long term right. impact of, of pharmaceuticals are really unknown and they're not good over time. You know, so. We actually had uh, our, a, cardiolo a, a cardiologist start ordering uh, the same supplement when he noticed our patients that we would send to him. Uh, the yeah. cholesterol were down. They weren't taking their meds, and yeah. uh, he's like, he was like one of the few that said, "What are they doing? Wait a minute, they're all taking the supplement." So he started yeah. bringing the supplement in. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So and it's nice to get an, an open-minded uh, uh, specialist, especially right. Yeah, exactly. So, so. It would yeah. So any hot ingredients uh, that that are coming out. That uh, I mean, I guess weight loss is always huge. Immunity now because of COVID. Right. Um, weight loss. Believe it or not, other things for bone. You know, you talk about bones and joints and collagen. Collagen is super hot. Collagen peptides, you know, normally coming from bovine cows, uh, but or, or even fish collagen. That's hot. Uh, I just went to a supply side summit where they talk about. Oh, the doctor has to go to that. It's like. Oh my gosh. It's, exactly. It's just gigantic. Yeah. It's amazing. So there's always and, new ingredients. But mushrooms it, too. Mushrooms as their overall health are. are oh, and are, the studies coming out too. on those. I mean, yep. they're they're equal to meds, you know? Almost. Yeah. And, and without exactly. the side effects. Yep. And but it is interesting if you go to like supply side west and you go to someone has, oh well, you know, low minimums, and they're like, you know. Two million or something. Like that. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. With the standard, so that's that's key. Is you got you know the low minimum orders and and that I think do. people can get started. Yeah. Well, that's I mean you mentioned that's why we're we can bring a lot to the table because we go we can have low minimums, but we can match the manufacturer what you need, so you can know their their, their expertise. So not only do you get the great quality, but you also get good pricing, good competitive pricing because you're you're matching their special. Or the special their manufacturing expertise to what uh, whether it's a liquid or a powder or a capsule or tablet, we we can match it up to the right manufacturer. And and I, I feel bad too because you know I'm I'm kind of a loyal loyalist guy and we'll have our supplement reps come in and they're like why aren't you carrying our product? Well, I got it for you know less than half price and <laughs> so, and, and more of everything in there and they're like okay you know. <laughs> If I knew that, I'd be charging you more. I'm, I'm yeah. undercharging. Yeah, oh, sure, I shouldn't tell you. Um, exactly. But uh, um, yeah, so some of the, you know, these supple companies are, there's ones that are good, but they're expensive. And other right. ones that are cheaper seem to be, that's kind of what it's worth. And I, I think you've kind of got the best of both worlds, I think. Yeah, I guess and, we try, absolutely. And in a little hand holding, which I think is, is key because uh, you know you can't be an expert in everything, and right. and it's and it's tough, and you don't want to. 
especially when you first put your toe in the water, you know, um, you need someone there to, to, to kind of guide you. Especially it's amazing how a label could be four inches by six inches, but the complexity on that label, that the, that's the one thing and the tears of doing this, how hard a label can be to get it right and not make mistakes. Uh, four by six, that's it. And yet that can be an amazing challenge to get that label correct. And that is something you can get nailed for and have a big headache. Absolutely. And yep. so, yeah, you don't want to go do that on your own and just think, oh, here, this is what the other labels look like. Uh, has to be a certain font, certain size, and um, absolutely, FDA has clear regulations and very, very clear regulations on how that label is not only supposed to look, like you said, the font, the organization, uh, how the supplement facts panel got to be laid out. Uh, it's all very well controlled by the FDA. Yep, yep, they're they're making anything <laughs> more difficult to, that they can. Um, but yeah, you've worked so great for us for so many years and have when we've kind of grown with you too, you know, yep. so we started out small and then so you work great with that and no difference when we're ordering higher quantities and it just gets better. So no, I appreciate that. Yeah, yep. you can kind of do the, the whole gambit, which is, which I think is great. And we're always, of course, leaning on you for for knowledge and hey how, how do we improve on this and you know also you know fillers and and things like that labels of course yep. so it uh saves a lot of money you don't have to go to a you know label attorney <laughs> for exactly uh and you know, all the stuff will just kill you and yep. it seems now like everything is just with medicine i mean the overhead just is skyrocketing so I, I really like the fact that you're kind of a one-stop shop and you can kind of get every, everything done there. That's the value we that's the value we try to bring. Couldn't say it better. That's it right there. Great, great. All right. I guess on on that, yeah, I just um well, you know, I've worked with Don for many years, I've just found it invaluable for uh all our supplements and to just feel like a like a team, you know, and uh yep able to uh i you know i'll put our supplements up against anyone's you know and uh and and we hear it all the time that oh i took this and it didn't work like yeah <laughs> uh and uh and so it, it's also a confidence thing you know and, and I'm, I'm very add i want to see a result you know and people will switch the same thing like they'll come see us and Let's say they're really sick. They've seen pen doctors and da da da. We get them better, then they go, "Oh, I'm pretty good now. I can go back to my insurance HMO doctor." Yeah. Like, okay, well, we'll see you in six months. Exactly. And, and it's the same thing with the supplements that they go, "Oh, I found something close, you know, at whatever CVS or a line," and they come back and go, "It wasn't working the same." Yep. Yeah. So uh, I I thank you. All right, you're welcome. Yeah. And I thank you for your business and your great support. Yeah, it, it, it's been great. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks for the uh, sharing the information here with uh, the docs on the uh, on the summit. And uh, how, how can they find you? Uh, it's pretty simple. It's tr truebodywellness.com. That's T-R-U with no E. Body, B-O-D-Y, wellness.com. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so... Highly recommended, and uh, yeah, I don't think you can go wrong with uh, we're we're working with Don, so uh, it's got my highest recommendation. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, appreciate you being on. All right, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Great. All right. All right. Take care. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we start the next interview, who do you know that needs this information? Uh, by sharing the peptide summit with others. You could really change someone's life, whether it's for chronic illness or having them look and feel younger. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and click and share the share button below the video to help us spread the word and empower your friends and loved ones. Hi, this is Dr. Kent Holtor for another episode of the Peptide Summit. Today we'll be interviewing um, Jean-Francois Tremblay, I'm sure I butchered that, 
but uh, he's going to talk about peptide bioregulators and up upcoming therapy. Uh, he's did his undergraduate studies in biochemistry and also mechanical engineering and kinesiology. He then pursued his graduate studies in, pharm uh, in pharmacy to finally complete his master's in pharmacology. Uh, his interest in peptides and their applications started over 20 years ago. Uh, he has consulted privately since then anti-aging, sports performance, and general health. Uh, five years ago, he started his own company specializing in the synthesis of peptides. Uh, you, he's a wonderful character and makes everyone smile. So I, I welcome you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Francois. Uh, thank you for being on. Um, hey, no, hey, thanks to you for having me. Yeah, so uh, we'll talk a little about bioregulators. What, what the heck are peptide bioregulators? <laughs> well, basically, uh, the first ever peptides that were discovered uh, and that a lot of people, like Epitalon is one of them, so to start off with, uh, they were discovered I, I couldn't find any studies that are older than 30 years, but uh, it's that uh, Russian doctor uh, actually uh, like almost 50 years ago. And it, they came out of, at the time, the Cold War and all that. So all those US, they did it. The, the uh, government asked them to find something to make their soldiers better. So is a, is is a mili uh, he was a military and a military doctor, so he started uh, to search and he came about uh, peptides. Uh, the the first one being epitalon, then timalin, and then he realized there is a bunch of them. So that that's basically how it started back there. Now I'm not sure if the Russian were and just, very happy just for with that. Because, uh, we'll call it uh, epitalin and thymulin. Just so people oh, know. Oh, but oh, we yeah. could talk about that. There is a huge difference between Timulian and Timalian. Uh, <laughs> a lot of confusion on, on that. But I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, so that's how they started. And they found, he found that they had a profound effect. Again, with the Pitalon being the first one, uh, first with mice, then with uh, dogs and monkeys, and then humans. And he found uh, anti-aging effect, but and it's mostly known for the telomere thing. You know, it length, lengthened the telomere. Yeah. So the, but the that actual telomere. part, eh, it was done like 12, 15 years ago, and I'm not sure they had the right ways or the accurate ways to measure telomeres. And I, I wouldn't count on that actually at this point. But it has proven so many good effects that you cannot discard it, even if it doesn't, if it wouldn't do nothing for the telomeres. Uh, basically, so, well, first, that's how this, it started. And again, you discover, and right now there is a list of about, it discovered more than 25, but there is a list of 25 that we know what they do and we know they have a positive effects because it did discover more, but found that they had no physiological effects. Maybe they were byproducts of a bigger peptides. We don't know. So right now, and I know that he released a couple of years ago that he found like 50, over 50 more, but now he was in the face of finding which one do something and so and then he could start research on those ones and, and uh, when you say they found these so where are they looking for these basically they're they gland, glandular or organ extracts and that that's one of the beauty of it they're all very small peptides two three or four amino acids uh and in a funny way, not only the bioregulators, the, the smaller peptides are the ones who have the bigger impacts on the body. I'm thinking about GHK. Uh, by the way, Kevinson, when he wrote about GHK, he didn't discover it, but he said, well, I wish I had discovered that one too. <laughs> he, he loves it. Uh, uh, you have the TRH, the tyrotropin-releasing hormone, 
three amino acid, but and despite the name, is it has a very small effect on the thyroid, but a player. Yeah, it does a lot of things. Uh, a lot of things that are not related bone, directly hair, to the thyroid. Yeah. So, you know, it's those smaller ones, but those ones, yeah, so uh, they, they're extract from organs or system. And actually, epitalon, known again as anti-aging, is actual, actually the bioregulator of the hormonal system. Uh, so you have timalin, that is the, the, the bioregulator of the immune system. And then violin is two and the spleen by the same token. And then there is one for the liver, one for the kidneys, one for the lungs. Uh, there are two or three for the brain and nervous system. So, you know, and, and basically each organ produce its own peptide that regulates that same organ. Uh, to, to uh, And they, they work a bit like, uh, Adaptogens, you know, if a system is yeah. out of whack, it's going to bring it down. If it's not working well enough, it's going to bring it up. So that's another yeah, nice thing. Yeah, I find that a lot with like, we call you know, BPC-157, body protection compound, that if they're uh, hypercoagulable, it brings it down. If they don't coagulate enough, it brings it up. If their mm -mm. blood sugar is high, it brings it down, or blood pressure, and it normal. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Well, it, generally speaking, that's the beauty of peptides, that there are some, you know, they're intelligent in their actions. Not intelligent, like you cannot play chess with them, but the, the, in their mm -hmm. actions. And that brings about fears from some people because there are peptides. I, I divert a bit, but I think it's important, like BPC-157 or in Beta-4, that are good to be used in like, for example, in cancer cases. But a lot of people will jump because they say, oh, but what about the angiogenesis uh, it yeah. can produce? Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of it. They, they don't push their actions, the peptide. There will be angiogenesis if needed. So if in a case of cancerous cells around it, and the angiogenesis is not needed, then it won't happen. It will work for what it's needed in within the realm of what it can do yeah. as a peptide. Yeah, the angiogenesis, I mean, so does vitamin D, you know? And, yeah, uh, and, and now lately they, 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 they have thought, well, maybe it's there to help actually, you know? It's yeah, because they'll because, find you know, more thymus and beta-4 around the cancer, so they say, oh, it must be caused the cancer. Well, it's like exactly. every time I see a fire, I see these firemen, so these guys must be starting the fire, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. there you go. That, that, yeah. that's, that's the concept that was, by, wrongly interpreted before and now people are catching up to it. So basically they're very intelligent in what they do. So that's why it's rare to have, uh, to have side effects from peptides. I'm not saying you cannot have effects like autoimmune response, for example, but that's not a side effect of the peptide. That's a side effect from your condition. Yeah. And not, you, you understand, need, like, like people yeah. that are allergic to peanuts, uh, that the, the allergy is not a side effect of the peanut. It's your condition right. that bring about those Yeah, effects. they have an immune dysfunction that, yeah. Exactly. So I, I haven't found actual side effects from peptides. They're always brought about by the condition where sometimes you have to be careful. But uh, as, as, as doctors, it's the kind of compounds you can use and you don't have to worry that your client or patients will call you at four in the morning yeah. for yeah, an emergency. When I, I train doctors, I say, you know, you can't really screw it up. So don't. Exactly. Know, you know, yeah. And, and more so BPC-157, uh, TB4, I call them more proof peptides. Meaning that in, if somebody comes to you and you don't know what's wrong, give him those two and yeah. something good will happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are kind of the core too. <laughs> And so, nice. so, you mentioned a lot of the um, uh, uh, epitalian or however you want to pronounce it. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, like, you know, the studies showing like menopausal rats, you know, they start menstruating again mm -hmm. and had actually had babies. 
Um, and we've been using them for fertility and we haven't really seen someone start menstruating again, but their, um, uh, their um, uh, FSH and LH will come down yeah. and their um, uh, AMH will, which tells a, a, a very reserve will actually go up. So it does seem to anti-age the, uh, the anti-malaria yeah. hormone goes up and, and, so and they're that, more fertile. Sorry. Yeah. It's interesting. In that sense, I've used it a lot many years ago when I was still training people with uh, with women uh, where like in physique uh, competition or, or any kind of very demanding competitions where they had a very strict diet. Sometimes they would take things that would put their hormonal system off. Oh, yeah. There's, substances there's and all that. And, uh, and the actual stress of training. So right after the, the competition, I would put them right up on the pitalon and in three, four, five days, everything was coming back to normal. And they would sleep like crazy, <laughs> 12, 13 hours. But you know, it was a system pushing yeah, them to sleep. And and too, back there to you normal. go. Yeah. And, and like it would put them back on track very, very fast hormonally. And how about um, the epitalion versus pineleon, different effects? Yeah, of course. Pineleon is a brain peptide uh, and it does have an effect on the nervous system. So uh, we started to use it, not me, I'm not a doctor, but a few practitioners I keep up with and, you know, feed them uh, on uh, actually serious cases of uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Like yeah, because those are both or, from the pineal gland, correct? Exactly. Uh, pineal yeah. long, no, it's from the actual brain. I don't know why they call it pineal long. I don't think it's from the pineal gland. Or might be, I'm not sure about this one. But the effect is in the cortex of the brain and the nervous system. So in uh, any case of neurodegenerative uh uh, conditions, they, they have a good effect, but uh, in therapeutic dosages, not in preventive dosages. So uh, basically meaning, again, for epitalon, the, the classic dosage is like a total of 100 milligrams twice a year. And I'll come back why only twice a year, but, but keep in mind, that's, you know, that's uh, anti-aging protocol. And it's basically a preventive. You, you yeah. prevent aging yeah. and uh, age, age related diseases. Uh, so, and you see the full effect when you look at the studies by Kevin Sun, it's over 12, 15 years where you see all those results. And uh, so people, many times they start using them and they tell me, well, I didn't feel anything. Well, okay, well, we, if you start smoking today, it's going to yeah. take maybe 10, 20, 30 years before the cancer show up. Yeah, but, and I'll just mention but the it other is, study. It is happening. <laughs> yeah, like uh, my mom said that too. She smoked five packs a day. She goes, oh, so-and-so got, never got cancer, you know. Yeah, well, um, not but, yet. Um, uh, yeah, the study where they gave the epitalion with uh, thymusin, uh, thymulin, uh, on cardiovascular patients, significant cardiovascular disease, um, over 65, I believe, 100 and something patients, mm -hmm. followed them for 15 years. And the ones on the treatment, uh, basically their heart function got better, dramatically less cancer, dramatically less cardiovascular disease, uh, they lived longer, less morbidity, uh, better quality basically, of life. It's pretty amazing. Basically everything that normally goes down yeah. goes back up. Uh, and and uh, uh, survival rate increased by 67%. No, they're, they're amazing. Uh, about timalin and timulin, they actually are very two different peptides. Timalin with an A, it's a two amino acid peptide. And that's the bioregulator. Timulin is a product of the immune system, the same as thymazine alpha-1. Right, right. So to understand the concept, uh, timulin would be to the thymus what insulin is to the pancreas. So if you have uh, diabetes, you take insulin, 
it will regulate your sugar levels, but it won't do nothing for the uh, pancreas. So the timulin will regulate your immune system. That's why it's, it's a very good peptide, but it won't do anything to regulate your thymus as timalin with an A will. Yeah. So yeah, and, that's when it's available here, yeah. Uh, well, the problem, timalin actually, uh, most of the time you'll see timulin sold as timalin. Uh, the end result is good, and that's what you want, upregulation yeah. of, of the immune system. But uh, the point, we made some timalin, and we found out that it's uh, the two amino acids, it doesn't dissolve in, in water. So if you buy something that's it says timalin and you can dissolve oh, it really? in water. Water soluble, maybe that would absorb orally then. Because uh, that's a big uh, problem. With probably sublingual yeah. in that case. Usually if they're more uh, uh, that, fat, yeah. uh, like hydro uh, fob, then the, the, yeah. they can't be absorbed uh, sublingual. Yeah, that's the big problem is they're very polar and, and hydrophobic. Yeah. So hard to get them to absorb. And a lot of people are just putting them in nasal sprays and just assuming they're sublingual, assuming they're gonna absorb, but you can't. And, it, and you again, know. you know, they're not that expensive, but they're not cheap, you know. Yeah. Uh, why, you know, just inject it. That's where you get the most bang for your buck. You get 100% of it and done. And, uh, you know, diabetics, they do it like many times a day and they're fine with that. It's no, it's. Yeah, it's yeah, actually, usually you know, women are fine. Men, <laughs> the bigger yeah. the guy, the less they're gonna Yeah, get. suppositories would be good, but then again, I'm not sure most men wouldn't be happy about that. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. What what other um, bioregulator have you found effective? What uh, um, uh, personally, I've therapeutically okay, epitalon, timalin, and timulin uh, in cases of uh, cancer, and of course in anti-aging uh, uh, protocols. Uh, Pinealon, we're using a lot now. Uh, Cartalax, which is the joint and um, articulation uh, peptide, uh, is is good. I, I wouldn't say amazingly good, but there is that one Russian study done by Kevinson where they had four groups. They gave one group uh, the Cartalax, the second group they gave um, that cartilage uh, supplement that you buy at the pharmacy. Uh, a chondroitin or glucosamine? A glucosamine. So they gave like the classic 1500 milligrams. Then a third group where they gave both and a, a fourth where they gave nothing. So they found that cartilax and glucosamine, which is actually a, a good supplement, had pretty much the same effect on joints pain and they measured a lot of things. But they found that when you use them together, then you have a synergetic effect and bang, you get a bigger effect mm. and uh, on, on the joints. So that one, if you want the most out of it, you take it with- uh, Yeah, uh, you different mechanisms and shit. Uh, yeah. What, what, and, or go ahead. And have you found uh, Vesugin? Uh, I have some of that. Was trying it for blood vessels. Because, you know, I yeah. haven't a lot of experience with it yet. We make it, but not uh, on paper. It looks great, but I cannot talk a lot of experience on this one yet. Yeah. So I tried that in the one for the kidneys. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So don't know. Yeah. The thing is, you don't. You don't know. But uh, you never know, uh, of blood work. Usually, what I've found in general, the difference between preventive dosage and therapeutic is there is a ratio, a ratio of about one to five, up uh, one to 10. So like epitalon, we saw good results in cancer, like almost overnight, but they were taking 30 milligrams a day and nonstop. They wouldn't stop after 10 days. Yeah. Uh, same thing, you know, if it's therapeutically, again, just like pump them up, 
uh, as much yeah. as uh, and, they can, and they, they can and they afford. tolerate it. Yeah, it gets a little pricey. Um, that's that's the thing. I've heard you mention like the thymus and beta four study on how high they went. And yeah, uh, it's one study that was done in 2010 with thymus and beta four. They went up to 1,260 milligrams. So like, let's say you work with 10 milligram vials, that's 126 vials. So of course yeah. they did it uh, IVs. And after an inhuman, so they, after two weeks, basically they concluded that it was armless with a few minor side effects in some cases. But overall, and, and obviously they concluded we won't try higher because nobody will ever use that much. Yeah, and that's a yeah, so, thousand, because we're using microgram doses, that's thousand times. But, uh, yeah. No, but, but try that with anything out there. Try that with Tylenol. Try it with water. No, you can't. Not I mean, <laughs> yeah. No, so basically, except for a few like L37, which is uh, antiviral and uh, uh, it may have serious side effects if you take yeah. too much. So, uh, like, a few, a few you have to be careful. But yeah, the L37 we'd start very low because mm. I was looking and I'd lie myself and started L37. So I could not find any dosing uh, except for rat dosing. I'm like, okay, mm. I'll try this much. Did, oh my gosh, way so much. It just killed the oven. So I had the biggest hurts. Mm. I was ready to jump out of my skin. So, uh, and so we give a, fra or a tiny fraction of that dose, but I, I, I do like that peptide. But yeah, that's one you got to be careful. Be careful with slam people with. Yeah. No, 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 no. But uh, generally, like, uh, yeah, no, I don't see. Uh, again, as I expressed before, it's basically okay. Let's say you have an autoimmune uh, condition you may have a reaction, uh, an autoimmune response to the actual peptide. So, you know, you have to be careful with those. But those are not side effects from the peptide. They're side effects or an effect from the condition. Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. And I really found this out in myself. It will get people say, you know, they get a big well when they do the injection mm -hmm. and say, okay, it's allergic, you know. But I found in myself when I was sick, and my immune system was off, I would get the biggest welts. And then as I got better, I would inject and not, would never not get the welt. You know, so really when we see people get kind of that welt from it, it shows they have immune dysfunction. Exactly. Um, uh, I don't think it's a standard allergic reaction. No, no, no. And, and yeah. many times, if it's serious as a reaction, because I've seen a couple of times actually uh, people have uh, uh, very bad reaction. Yeah, like, I mean, you could be allergic to anything, but yeah. And, general, but you, at that general. point, you introduce time as an alpha one for a few days or week, and then you can start the actual peptide therapy if time as an alpha one wasn't there. And usually, you can. Yeah, well, once you get the immune out, system uh, back yeah. in balance, then they don't they don't have that. So, like when I give talks on peptides and go through all these studies that the typical response that doctors are. Why haven't I heard of these? There's you know, hundreds I of get, studies. I get that. I so get that a lot too. <laughs> what's your thought on that? Well, big pharmaceutical companies, they knew about that all the time. They just shut up about it. Um, now now they're, they're in the game of peptides. Uh, they found a way through probably uh, very expensive lobbying because peptides, you cannot patent them per se. Because you know they're humans produced, yeah. but now they went around that. And if you look at the latest patents of peptides, they patent the the way you make it, which is easy to go around. But they patent the application of. So it's in the title uh, a patent for this peptide and its application, and then they will list everything they know it's good for. So what's the implication is since it's patented, now they put it on the market. So you as a doctor, let's say you prescribe uh, time as in beta four, then you send off your client to the pharmacy or a compounding pharmacy. 
I'm not sure if that will be required by you to write why you prescribe it, prescribe it but most likely the, the, the pharmacist will ask, what is it for? Or maybe it's going to call you. So if it falls within one of those conditions, then by law, it will be forced to sell to the patient the one that is made by that pharmaceutical yeah. company. And what I don't understand, I've seen these too. It's like they're, yeah, uh, they're taking peptides out of all this research and then, and then getting a patent on the application when I thought that would not be allowed because it's if a person in the industry it would not be obvious that then they can patent it. But there's studies on it showing it does this and that, and then they get a patent on it for that. So it seems like, I'm like, how can that be, you know? Well, that's, um, that's the sickness of our uh, pharmaceutical system now. Basically, it's... Yeah, it's like... Shouldn't be, but... Uh, 40 years, and then they patent it under for a condition. There you go. That's, and that's what they're aiming at now. And that's why they got into the game. And that's why you see things happening slowly. But, you know, like with TaylorMade, they say, okay, you cannot make this one, this one, or this one anymore. And they're slowly getting yeah, into I, that. I worry about compounding pharmacies. And they have the thing with the... You can only or they had a list that you couldn't uh, compound. Now they're going to list that this list you can compound from. There's going to be very few things. Like they said uh, things like, oh, you can't compound quercetin because we have a drug for that. They're, so uh, I, they're I, going I to use the same argument. Like, it's are so... you kidding me? You know, and or yeah. they'll say it's difficult to compound. Well, difficult for whom? Right. Yeah, let, for let, let, but, let, leave it to us if it's difficult or not. <laughs> yeah. And I think com there's going to be very few things and, or they'll say, well, if someone takes too much, they could have a problem, you know? And, and with these doctors that were debating that this should be allowed, uh, they would say, well, they wouldn't even look at the literature. They don't need to look at the literature. Um, yeah. Like alpha lipoic acid, they said can't be given IV. Uh, um, and they just, eliminating everything. They said they weren't going to touch the hormones, but that's going to be on the list. And I'm very worried that T3 is going to be gone because they're going to say, oh, it's not necessary. We have Synthroid. Well, that's what that, they did in Canada. Yeah. So you cannot find T3 anymore for many years. T4, that's it. Synthroid, T4, and that's the only thing. There is still, like in Montreal, there is one pharmacy, compounding pharmacy, where I get my... Uh, uh, armor uh, extract and this is it and most uh, endocrinologists uh, they know they say no you ask them they're going to say no t4 is that's all you yeah need. and you know i've written a, numerous reviews on how t4 doesn't work for anyone especially any sick person um and with hundreds of references you know, but it's still like, no, 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 if you don't need it. I'll say it's dangerous. It's like, are you kidding me? And, um, and as yeah. a practitioner, you, you should know. And because I have a doctor I actually got suspended for nine months because he prescribed the, uh, the, the, the extract. And what, the, you know, I, he said, yeah, on paper in studies, yeah, they do pretty much the same thing. But he said, if you ask the patients, how do you feel? And 80% will tell you they feel much better yep. with the extract than with the synthetic T4. So the, yeah, the blood levels, yeah. they're both or, good. Or with straight T3, the, it's like they had bipolar patients that were treatment resistant. They tried on average 14 <clears throat> medication with no improvement. They gave them straight T3 uh, and 80% improved and 75% uh, had total resolution of symptoms. I'm sorry, 35% or something like that had total resolution of symptoms. You know, T4 doesn't work in these patients. They don't uh, utilize it. But anyways, I'm getting my- And, and the extract, you have the T3, you have the T2, and, and most probably some cofactors we don't even know about yet that support. The, the, so it sounds like very hopefully upcoming thing and it doesn't get quashed by, you know, Big Pharma and the you know, medical board and FDA are all kind of in the yeah. um, So 
Yeah. So with uh, kind of in closing, I, I think this is a really upcoming thing. Well, where do you think it's going to going to lead? Well, I'm just going to say this. Why do you think so many U.S. and Canadian doctors open clinics in Mexico and in the Caribbean? Uh, it's not because, yeah, of course it's nice. <laughs> Being Canadian, uh, I would love to have an office uh, down there, but that's not their first reason. It's for that reason basically so they can continue to offer the best treatments without being bothered by uh, FDA yeah. regulations. Yeah and it's even I think you know in this whole integrative space or whatever you want to call it you know a standard doctor was oh there's no evidence you know uh, which is crazy it's it's more evidence-based than what you learn and you know. And, and um, me, I, uh, it's, it's actually a sad thing that's happening in medicine in general you know, 30 years ago, when I was young, I would go see, because as a doctor, what's the first thing you do? First thing, when you see a patient, you ask him questions. No test, no nothing. First questions. Yeah. And if you're good, that just with pretty. that, you know what's wrong with him. But now the system, like, it doesn't trust you anymore. They force you to do all those tests to back up Yep. Your diagnosis that you had probably within 10, 15, depending, but very fast. You know, after, if you have a doctor that has a bit of experience, you say, yeah, this is it. This is this. Sometimes you will need a couple of tests. To, maybe it's lupus. Maybe it's fibromyalgia. Let's look at it. But you have a pretty good idea. Now the system forces you to back up everything you do, why you do it and everything. And I, I find it amazingly sad because it's like you have that, all that formation, that knowledge and experience, and suddenly they're telling you, no, we don't trust you. Yeah, and everything comes down now to in terms of like protocols mm. that especially hospital based or anyone affiliated with you know, Kaiser or whatever it be. Mm. You do this, do this, everything is memorization. And it's, you know, the art of medicine is gone. And I think at some point it's going to be put all their labs and symptoms in a computer. It's going to be art. Yeah. It, uh, Doctors uh, be gone. AI. That, that's where it's yeah. going to. And that's the thing. So all these patients that works well for a patient fits in a little box. But if they don't, that system breaks down and that's yeah. where get, the doctor goes, Oh, you must be in your head, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> that's a classic. Yeah. Um, basically they are in the limbo. Like, yeah. And which I think is where peptides ha have a big place. And I think you'd, you'd agree with that. If things would go as they should, the future of medicine, and I'm talking five to 10 years, no more, because things are moving fast. You would go see a doctor and probably 60, 70% of his prescriptions would be peptides. And soon, not now because uh, with the, or uh, biomes, you know, the, the, the probiotics yeah. we have, uh -huh. uh, not, now they're mapping it, but it's gonna be like the uh, DNA, you know, you map it and you know, 20 years ago, say so that's it, now we, we got it. Then epigenetic came. So I think there is an epigenetic, not an epibiome that goes yeah. with that interactions. Think, but once they get yeah. down uh, that path, that's going to be a, a mainstream. It should be a mainstream in medicine. But, it, but it's going to get more complicated because they're finding the virome, you know, the bacteria pages, the viruses of the bacteria play a big part. So they're- Exactly, they it's very complex. It's not, it's not for yeah. tomorrow, but I have big hope because things are happening faster and faster, another five, 10 years, and they should have a pretty good idea of what to do with that. And that's gonna be a big, big line in medicine to, to use. I think it's gonna be very right. important. So, so just kind of uh, in closing here, you'd say um, Epitalian's probably the main bioregulator Epitalon, uh, it's kind of uh, hormonal system, you know, you, you that, yeah. that regulates that's the, the uh, most experience with and and, and timalin. Well, even if you use one that it's called timalin and it's timulin, it's good. It's gonna basically because in those uh, uh, aging studies and it figures 
Et puis, talent is good. You add tamaline or, or violin, which is, and you can inject it's water solute. Uh, if you have a strong immune system, you will get less sick. So, hence, uh, healthy, yeah. more healthy, and yeah, probably you live longer. You know, yeah, and then also that immune system goes along with monitoring the body for cancer. There so you go. So it's all the cancer. So the the main ones in the anti aging protocol, epitalon, and timalin, timulin, violin, timazin, alpha one. You know, one of those will do the trick. Uh, that combination, it's a winning combination. Yeah, I think those are the most studied as well. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we like the combination. And, and the other ones in terms of prevention, like the one for the liver, the one for the kidneys, for I would use them in a preventive approach like Epitalon if you had a, a familiar background. So let's say you say like half of my family, uh, they got uh, uh, diabetes. Yeah. Well, well, okay, maybe that's not so much genetic. It could be you, you, you pass to your children the way you eat. You, so it may not be that genetic after yeah. all. Yeah. But anyway, if there is a condition that Everything you really, then yeah, you could use preventively the one for the pancreas. Or yeah. if, it, if in your family there is a weakness, weakness for the lungs, then yeah, don't. I, I wouldn't suggest everybody to use them all. Yeah, then you'd be taking so many. Yeah, yeah, but just to pinpoint one thing or two that you see as kind of a weakness uh, in your family, that's a good indication. And then you can throw in those in the preventive uh, uh, protocol. Gotcha. Great. Yeah, we'll see what the, the future holds. And I hope we'll uh, be talking more about all these and... Uh, uh, hey, that'd be my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you so much. Again, uh, love your personality and uh, and you're always searching for, for new knowledge that is wonderful. And so I'd like to thank you for um, being on with us. Hey, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Before we move on to the next speaker, please let us know in the comments uh, below about what you're, you've enjoyed uh, most so far. Uh, have you learned something new? Is there a particular speaker that inspired you? Well, let us know and feel free to comment on uh, other people's posts as well as uh, get to, to get the conversation going. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, this is Dr. Kent Holtor with another episode of the Peptide Summit. Today I'll be interviewing Dr. Amber and she'll be talking about novel peptide therapy options to boost mitochondrial health uh, for brain power, body composition, and better recovery. Um, Dr. Amber is a licensed naturopathic doctor at Metro MD Institute of Regenerative Medicine in Los Angeles. Um, she trained in regenerative medicine, detoxification protocols, hormone testing and treatment, bioidentical hormones, uh, anti-aging, peptide therapy, IV nutrient therapy, She's a private practice in Redondo Beach, um, where she specializes in peptide uh, therapy and bioidentical hormones. Uh, she's worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and athletes looking for performance optimization and has really used peptide therapy um, uh, to augment her practice. And also uh, she treats chronic infections such as Epstein-Barr, Candida gut infections. Uh, she's used peptide protocols for weight loss, you know, body uh, composition, cognitive performance, ADHD, um, autoimmune disorders, and many more. She's a physician member of the International Peptide Society and has a peptide certification through American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. She graduated from Bastyr University in San Diego. Uh, she's passionate about blending natural medicine and modern technology to provide therapies that truly help patients get answers and outcomes for their health concerns and diagnosis. She's passionate about educating um, patients on peptide therapy and works with uh, patients. She also has an office in Hollywood um, and she does a lot of uh, telemedicine as well, which is really big now with the COVID issue. So I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Amber. Thank you so much for taking the time and being with us. Absolutely, yeah. So 
So great. Tell me just a little background. How did you get into uh, peptides? Yeah, so I, I learned about peptides actually through a book that I was reading. Uh, it's called The Testosterone Bible by Jay Campbell. And also through some podcasts, I, I actually didn't hear about it through practitioners. It's you know, not as well known. Uh, a lot of doctors are really just hearing about peptides. And so I heard about it. I started using some of the, the growth hormone analog peptides, some CJC and ipromorelin on myself, noticed profound changes, uh, you know, dug into the research, decided I need to get trained in this. This is really powerful medicine for patients. I was already doing a lot in the bioidentical world, uh, women's hormones, a lot of Dutch testing, bioidenticals for men. Uh, and then, you know, found that peptides really just complement that so beautifully. Yeah, uh, I think that yeah, they're really synergistic. And you said you tried the um, growth hormone secretagog. So, you know, growth hormone gets a little, you know, it was kind of a big thing taking, but the FDA, it's the only drug you can't give off label, and uh, which is really where no one's died of, you know, you know, growth hormone overdose. But so these peptides, it will boost your own growth hormone. And who do you use that on? What what do you find with uh, with those? Which which ones in particular? Yeah. There are many combinations of them, yeah. but um, uh, you find those helpful for what what type of patient? Yeah. So I work with a, I work with a lot of women. Big complaints: sleep issues, can't sleep, uh, and then you know as a follow up to that can't lose weight. I have a, a trainer that I work with in Hollywood who sends me women who are really, you know, their diet is clean, they're training five, six days a week, and they're just not able to drop the weight uh, through doing all that. And so adding in something after we've kind of addressed pillar one, what's going on with the hormones, uh, balancing that, and then adding in something like CJC and ipromorelin. So uh, those two growth hormone analog peptides can catapult their results as far as fat loss goes. And not only that, it will give you that deep restorative sleep, which we know will help regulate hormones just by that alone. Yeah, so it basically, it's, instead of giving the growth hormone, you're stimulating the hypothalamus pituitary to produce. So you're basically anti-aging that, you know, that, uh, that master gland yes. and it tends to do a lot of you know other things and then also improve sleep um do you use uh epitalian as well or delta sleep inducing peptide i have used yeah i have used epitalian uh and the one thing that i love about that one is it's the it's the one molecule that i know that increases natural synthesis of melatonin substantially over time and we know that that's protective for immunity and so many things think about covid who's susceptible to covid those low in melatonin those uh people who are older and they're low in melatonin so i do love that one uh dsip i have used on occasion for i have a couple clients who fly internationally for work. And so they're, they get these flip circadian rhythms all the time and they really need to just recalibrate that. So I've seen that work really well there. Uh, but the, honestly, adding in, sometimes uh, we'll just start on ipromorelin, but I really find that the combination of CJC and ipromorelin is the most effective. The way that I like to explain that to patients because peptides are such a foreign you know, concept when we're explaining it to somebody who's never heard about it before. I like to talk about the CJC as almost like the, uh, the production. So the producing of the growth hormone and that's signaling the pituitary, hey, let's produce more. And then I like to think about the ibramrelin as more of like a delivery truck. So let's get it out to the body. Uh, and they work very closely in tandem. If you think about how Amazon works, they have their manufacturing plant, <laughs> their delivery trucks, and, and that's- actually very good at ex explaining it, yeah. Um, I'm sure patients appreciate that because it's just yeah. like so foreign, but yeah. Yeah, so one's a growth hormone secreting peptide, one's a growth hormone secreting hormone, and they work very well together. Yeah. And I found that, you know, one, I'm sure you found, if people don't sleep, they don't lose weight, you know? And that combination of what you would treat mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, 
chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, chronic Lyme, and they just don't sleep. But that combination of delta sleep producing peptide, uh, epithelium, and the, um, uh, the uh, growth hormone secretagogues, all of a sudden they get some deep sleep, which is key. Yeah. That's, that's really where the magic happens. Because when you improve the sleep, you improve autophagy, you improve brain function, you improve everything. And we also know you have growth hormone receptors literally all over the body in the brain, in the gut, in the muscles. And so that, those two peptides, when somebody is not feeling recovered, restored, not waking up rested, not getting that deep sleep, hormone regulation is off, just adding in those two alone, I find just produces tremendous effect. Nice, nice. And nice things that how the peptides are very synergistic is the BPC-157 um, will basically increase growth hormone receptors on all the cells in the body. So you get again, syner uh, the synergistic effect. Yeah. So, so what got you into mitochondria? Can you talk a little bit about the importance of mitochondria? What are mitochondria? I'm sure people have heard about it, but what really are they? Yes. So I love to use analogies and this is the analogy I use as my patients uh, in explaining what mitochondria are. And I've worked with some athletes uh, who I bring up the word mitochondria and they're like, mito what? And you know, they're training intensely. They should know of, of anyone, yeah. So uh, essentially mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. We know that from eighth grade biology, but they also have other functions. So they help to protect the cell too from oxidative damage. And the best analogy is we live in LA. We're both in LA right now. And in LA, we have a power plant that fuels this entire city to work every single day. And if immediately in this moment, the power plant can discontinues working, we couldn't plug in our computers, our Wi-Fi box. We can't run our dishwasher. You know, everything stops in the city of LA. Nothing has power. And so in a cell, we think about LA as the cell, the power plant is the mitochondria. Uh, really, we need to make sure that we're continually producing that energy uh, for the cell to function. And, and, pe and people think, I think of like energy, think of exercise, yeah. but it's every function. And you think, especially the tissues that need the most brain um, and like, their uh, you know, immune system, and even cells need energy to die. And you talk about aut autophagy, when they don't have the energy, they can't go through what's called apoptosis. So they hang around and that's when you get cancer. Yeah. So not enough energy, you don't actually get rid of the old cells and they turn into cancer. So it's pretty amazing. It's, it's um, uh, counterintuitive, but it affects really uh, everything. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. There's, there's a lot of medical literature and A4M talks about this and you and I are both well versed on how uh, mitochondrial dysfunction is a driving force behind so many of these chronic illnesses now and it's not really being addressed or talked about. It's so interesting that, you know, we know things that are mitochondrial toxic. So NSAIDs, pain relieving medications, Pharm most pharmaceutical drugs are, ph are toxic to mitochondria, as well as alcohol. And so you think about those three things, most people have come into contact with those in the last 30 days in America. So not only uh, as we age, our mitochondrial function decreases, but then we come into contact with these substances, we need even more support to overcome that. And I, I totally agree. And there's, you know, so many things we just can't get away from BPA. Uh, and we'll check people's basal metabolic rate. So how many calories they burn per day when they come in. And, you know, you get the woman who can't lose weight and there are people, oh yeah, you're just eating ding dongs in the closet, you know, they're exercising. And we find that they're about 25% lower metabolism than they should be for their weight. And, you know, they're like, see, I told you, you know, it's like, um, and it's mitochondrial dysfunction. Sometimes, you know, the thyroid boosts that, but there's other things that also uh, affect the thyroid, uh, affect the mitochondria. But yeah, and it's, you know, the theory of aging, it's all fix the mitochondria. You fix such a wide array of, of issues. You do, yeah. It's, it's really fascinating too, 
looking at the role of hormones. I mean, cortisol, part of the metabolism of cortisol and creating cortisol, it happens in the mitochondria. And you think about the role of cortisol and weight gain and L-carnitine being that amazing molecule that shuttles those fatty acids that we burn into the mitochondria to be burned. So fat, when you look at fat loss, uh, body composition goals, you have to look at mitochondria in my mind. Yeah, and I, I agree. And you look at diabetics, we find, and also all the studies, you look at the conditions with mitochondrial dysfunction, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, diabetics, they all have mitochondrial you know, dysfunction, autoimmune, anyone with inflammation, oh. and, you know, and everyone's inflamed. Yes. And then you start talking about the gut, you know, the whole gut brain access, like, I mean, everyone's gut is so messed up. Mm -hmm. And I, even people who are consider themselves healthy, we find their just gut is so leaky and causing that inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, and they just don't feel great. I think everyone I know is either, you know, like you go to a party and talk to them, well, they feel terrible. They have a, you know, family member or a friend and just, oh my God, my doctor says I'm fine and put them on statins, but you find you fix their mitochondria, cholesterol goes down, uh, you know, their risk for cardiovascular disease, much, much better uh, prevention than giving them a statin. You know, they don't have a statin deficiency. The, actually, statins, they decrease mitochondrial function. We CoQ10, which protects the mitochondria, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and yeah, it's kind of a classic, the, you know, people get muscle aches and brain fog, memory loss, mitochondrial dysfunction. And the doctor goes, oh, but your cholesterol is lower. Why not fix the problem, fix the underlying problem? Yeah. Awesome. So what, what types of things do you, do you do? Well, what's your first step? You come in um, and you treat a lot of women or maybe you know, can't lose weight, not yeah. feeling great, not sleeping. And how do you approach that patient? Yeah. So generally we're running a hormone panel, which is going to be a comprehensive panel where we're looking at the, the cortisol levels. We're looking at melatonin levels. We're looking at what are their sex hormones uh, and then checking thyroid because that's a huge player for so many women in weight loss issues. So and the levels they're told they're normal, right? Right. And you find that they're not. Yeah. Yeah, and this and they could potentially have completely normal levels and lots of symptoms too. So uh, that's subclinical picture. So yeah, really, I you know run a hormone panel, uh, you know assess what's going on depending on the situation. A lot of women are on bioidentical, or they'll be on birth control, mm. potentially another pharmaceutical medication for anxiety or depression, and then, uh, you know, have alcohol consumption, potentially a pain reliever, you know, BPA. And I look at that as, man, their liver is just suffering with all of these things that are taxing those pathways. And so a lot of what I do is liver support of uh, detoxing hormones. It can show up on the skin really just supporting them there. So that's kind of pillar one. And then looking at, uh, since I'm trained in peptides and I know how to use them in an effective way for women, we can add in other uh, solutions to help their mitochondria. And that could be anything from, uh, you know, a supplement that boosts mitochondrial function. So adding in things like PQQ, resveratrol, CoQ10, a lot of those really important, uh, you know, protective, factors. Or we could talk about peptides that we use for, uh, for mitochondrial function too, like MOTC is an amazing one for, for or, loss. Or let's just go back for a second. You mentioned toxins. So I just want to mention one toxin that people don't realize. Tylenol mm -hmm. is so toxic and there's a bunch of studies showing it may be the number one cause of autism. Wow. Um, yeah, and it's just toxic to mitochondria, and uh, it's it, it's a major issue. And you talked about other things for mitochondrial function, like it sounds like antioxidants. Why? How do antioxidants help mitochondrial function? Yeah. So the mitochondria, uh, we have DNA in the mitochondria. So we have DNA in the nucleus, and we have DNA in the mitochondria, and essentially. Uh, the mitochondria produces energy, yes, but they can turn into, the mitochondria can turn into like a battleship where it's trying to protect the cell. And if we have overwhelming amounts in a, say a Tylenol overdose, uh, that 
that DNA will be damaged. And that's a problem because then the mitochondria are not working appropriately. It's like the whole city of LA will shut down uh, from the prior analogy. And so protecting against oxidative stress and damage in the mitochondria will preserve the ATP production. It'll keep everything flowing. And when we have an overwhelming amount of reactive oxidative species, that's a problem. That'll damage our mitochondria. That puts us in a really dire situation. Yeah, and so yeah, the mitochondria, yeah, they make the energy and they, they cause oxidative stress, so they make the energy. And so when you have oxidative stress, otherwise just kind of stops it. You know, it stops the production. And, uh, and I think, you know, a major thing finding, you know, in aging and all these illnesses and, and everyone's just incredibly inflamed, right? And probably yeah, the number one suppressor of mitochondrial function is, you know, there's toxins, a lot, a lot of things, but inflammation is just seems to be a key. And have you found just, it seems to me like everyone just has so much inflammation. Um, and, and so really everyone has mitochondrial dysfunction. Yeah. You know what I really, when I think about the whole situation about the research and the literature, and we know all these diseases are associated with mitochondrial dysfunction from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, uh, diabetes, uh, you know, all of these things. It's really the future of where medicine is going to go is, is providing us, uh, the people who are going to fare well are those who have the tools on board to protect these biological systems like mitochondria. There's some things we cannot avoid. We can't avoid all plastics. We can't avoid all toxins. We can avoid some of them, you know, on purpose. But it's going to really be about bringing things on board that help support the body. I mean, we're going to fare way better uh, preventing cancer, preventing these chronic degenerative issues. And this is going to become, I think, in the next 10, 20 years, pivotal. Like this is pivotal if you have access to these things and know how to use them. I, I, I totally agree. And it's interesting. It's like you talk to most doctors and you learn, you know, biochemistry and, and school, then you forget it. Now we're having to relearn it because we actually um, utilize it. Mm -hmm. And, and I really agree because people were keeping people alive, but are they living better? You know, there are nursing homes and these chronic neurodegenerative diseases now, if you go to someone like yourself and they go and they get their mitochondrial uh, mitochondria tuned up, they're likely going to prevent those diseases 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road and have a great life instead of being in the nursing home and fragile and having, you know, neurodegenerative diseases and uh, osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease and dementia and you can really prevent that. And we're, we're finding, and it's interesting, you know, how standard medicine is, well, let's wait till it gets bad enough and then we'll give you a, a med and we'll, we'll keep you alive and try to stop, you know, we get so it doesn't get worse. But prevent it beforehand, it's, it's just life-changing, literally. It is. Yeah, it can turn around your entire, yeah, destiny, future of your life. And what's more important than your your health and well-being if you think about it like with covid that's really brought that to the surface for many people is you can lose your job your car your house but if your health is in a dire situation i mean that is really the most important thing is you your well-being yeah and, and i had it myself where you know in chronic lyme was so sick i i was like i would give up you know anything to feel because you can't use anything yeah. and we have some other super rich and but they're so sick like what's the use you can't use your private plane you know it's like and it's so your your health is is key and we we forget that and i think until you lose it you just take it for granted yeah yeah, yeah. so maybe we could talk about uh one of these really pow powerful molecules that we're using for mitochondria which is nad yeah nad yeah. Uh, there's all different forms of NAD, the NADIVs, but essentially what is NAD? We could talk about that. Yeah. So the um, uh, nicotinamide um, dinucleotide. So yeah, tell us, tell us about that and, and how does that work with the mitochondria? 
Yeah. So NAD is that really important coenzyme, right? And nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, uh, but essentially it, it powers the, the cell to continue producing energy. Uh, and it's an, involved in a redox reaction, but I love, so there's different forms of NAD that we can give to people. We can give NAD IVs, we can give NAD intranasal, we can give uh, NAD in a patch form, transdermal, we have sublingual forms, we have precursors like NR and NMN, which we can give. Uh, we can also talk about 5-amino-1-MQ, which is like dear to my heart peptide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but yeah, so with, with the NAD and it uh, really, I think taking NAD so it just doesn't absorb very well. I don't think sublingual even. Um, some of the precursors, I think the nicotine uh, revenue decide probably the best, the precursor. But you're doing going right to the source and finding the IVs doing IV NAD getting the best results. Can you tell us about some of those things you've seen and yep. what you use that for? Definitely. So I like to use, of course, the, the bioavailability of an IV is just uh, compared to none. It, it just, it goes straight into the cell and right into the bloodstream. And so what NAD does is it helps the brain cells to age well. And so we know that by introducing NAD to those cells that were, it's like giving the cell a spark plug to recreate energy if, if they were having, uh, you know, kind of sluggish mitochondrial function, it'll, it'll actually even upregulate PGC1-alpha, which is that molecule that we talk a lot about going back to biochemistry. And that protects against oxidative stress in, in the cell. So it's so valuable. Uh, we're using NADIVs for addiction. Uh, there's, you know, where you can go through a whole week of NAD IVs back to back. We use them for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, any type of neurodegenerative condition. Uh, athletes can benefit because we know that um, muscle tissue has just way more mitochondria because it's powering, uh, needs that energy to fire. So, I've seen athletes use it. I really like the back-to-back -back IVs for someone with a more serious condition. So when we're doing like four or five days in a row, somebody advanced stage Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, somebody who's, you know, really uh, trying to avert an addiction to alcohol or, or, or something. And I and like to use, use the NAD IVs more in yeah. Yeah. Oh no. I was saying it's just it's interesting when I give you know, lectures on peptides. Like I almost, especially to the public, and you say all the things they work for. It's it's a little embarrassing because it sounds like snake oil. Like, well, how can it work for addictions and Parkinson's and for athletics? Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Why would it work for addictions? Yeah. So it's balancing, it's balancing those brain chemicals um, and it's working through. So if you think about, you know, why is autism related to uh, poor mitochondrial function, right? It's, it's an issue with those nerve cells. We know that nerve cells also have way more mitochondria than, than typical cells. I think the comparison is like a, a normal cell in the body has about 1,000 to 2,500 mitochondria. A, a nerve cell has about 10,000 plus mitochondria, so way more. Uh, and so if we have any sort of issue with mitochondria, it's gonna show up in two places first, the brain and the muscles, brain fog, fatigue, muscle weakness, lethargy, no motivation to work out, right? So. In, in the case of addiction, any sort of, um, you know, think about like mood disorders and do you think about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, why is it impacting the brain? Well, you have a lot of nerve tissue that's playing a role in that conduction and it can absolutely impact uh, those conditions. So yeah, I haven't used it specifically for addiction in my practice. I've used it more for a neuroprotective uh, for some of my Alzheimer's Parkinson's patients, but there's a clinic in San Diego who does phenomenal work 
uh, yeah. on, on addiction with NAD. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it works great. It prevents, like it reduces the withdrawals and that. Yeah. But yeah, if you're going to do addiction, you, you got to like do addiction. I mean, totally different right. clientele. But it's, it is amazing. It, it, it works for that. But yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, we'll do big panels, like sounds like, like yourself and, you know, look at immune system. And we find that like autistic kids, their panel, their immune system, all their dysfunctions look just like a chronic Lyme patient, look just like a chronic fatigue syndrome patient. And that ultimate, you know, everything's a vicious cycle, especially with mitochondrial dysfunction, that everything starts breaking down, which causes nothing to break down. And, but you get at that commonality, you fix the mitochondria, you're going to fix a lot of things. Yeah. What, what, what has been your, some of your biggest success stories? Ooh. So I had a fibromyalgia patient who, uh, I actually was using LDN with her because she also had depression. And so that's lotus naltrexone. It's a opiate blocker at very low dose and it modulates the immune system. So it, um, so all these chronic illnesses also have immune dysfunction where Th1 immunity is too low, Th2 is too high, but that causes a lot of inflammation, which then causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And then once again, we're back to mitochondria. Back to mitochondria, yeah. So we, we use some LDN. That's a great simplified explanation of what it does, but it helps increase those endorphins in the brain through adaptation. So we block the receptors transiently at night and then ends up improving mood, helping with pain, all these things. So the LDN, I've used NAD with her. She had marked improvement in pain, uh, went from probably eight or nine out of pain to two or three within a matter of four weeks, which is amazing. Wow, well, think of her life how much you changed her life yes yeah that was a powerful case uh, and she was told i'm sure you know we we actually published our results and this was 12 15 years ago that people saw on average 7.2 physicians without any benefit and then they came in and by the fourth visit 80 percent got significantly better but you know they were told that oh it's all in your head and then they start believing it and, you know, like, oh, my, am I just lazy? And then their friends abandon them and they're, oh, you know, they look fine, just exercise and eat better. And it's a, it's a terrible list because doctors, you know, in general, if they don't know how to treat, it doesn't exist. And it's patient's fault. So I'm sure when they come to you and you're like, hey, I, this is a real illness and I'll show you the dysfunctions and I can treat it, mm -hmm. uh, just right there, I think is very powerful. Yeah. I there's so much power in explaining to someone that the symptoms and what they've been going through is really a metabolic cause. When same with weight loss, it's a metabolic issue. It's an insulin resistance issue, which is driven by mitochondria and other mechanisms. But the, the insulin piece is why things like MOTC, which is mitochondrial peptide, that it's so amazing for uh, insulin sensitivity. And they actually found that children who had obesity had really low levels, like a third of the levels of MOTC that they should have. And MOTC is that peptide that helps uh, with insulin sensitivity and, you know, shuttling the glucose and the fatty acids into the cell through the GLUT4 receptors to be burned for energy. And they were low in that. So we know that, you know, mitochondria plays a huge role in the obesity issue, the, the chronic disease picture of insulin resistance in America. And, and we're not talking about that. And we need to be offering solutions and, and addressing that. And so I think it's just pivotal to finally bring the mitochondria into the spotlight and, and treat that. Yeah. So you're kind of breaking the cycle because once they kind of get the insulin resistance, then they actually get increased inflammation and suppress mitochondria. They actually suppresses thyroid function, metabolism drops. So now they get more uh, weight gain and more insulin resistance. So that's why it's so difficult for people with insulin resistance and diabetes to lose weight because they, if they also you know, go on a diet, it basically, the thyroid senses that and, and basically gets lower, metabolism drops. So it's, yeah, you have to intervene and fix their broken mitochondria because they're not burning any calories even though people 
think all they're doing is just eating all day, but really it's that inflammation and mitochondrial dysfunction and you fix that and they're like a new person. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm like a regular person. You know, they see their friends that are skinny, just eating crazy. And, uh, and it's, yeah, what percent of the population is obese and it's just, it's going up. I think the only country that's more obese than us, I think is Saudi Arabia, where, where they can hide under the big, uh, you know, <laughs> clothing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But it's, it's, it's bad. And uh, what, what do you think the whole obesity crisis is, is from? You've kind of mentioned a number of things, but what, what's your, your thought? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because in America, we're one of the most industrious nations in the world. I mean, we've created more novel companies, business ideas. We're one of the most creative nations. We've done so much in terms of innovation. We've got Microsoft and Google and a lot of these things have started in America. And so we've created this, um, and I've worked with people on Wall Street and I've worked with, you know, entrepreneurs and people are building their businesses and it's, it's a burnout culture. And so we're burning ourselves into the ground working to accomplish something. I know I, med school is exhibit A of that. So uh, I think it's really about, not to say that you know, I'm so am ambitious and all for hard work, but we need to help the body support itself through that. And that's looking at mitochondria, what's happening with chronic stress, uh, sleep deprivation. We're not able to do that autophagy in the brain like we need to do. And that plays a role in setting you up for something like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, down the road. And so what are the things it's not, it's not, telling people to, you know, not be ambitious, but it's like, what, what are the things that we can bring on board for you to help you support, support you? And I don't think that conversation is happening enough with really high level go-getters or, or people who have really high stress jobs in LA, you know, and who's using NAD to support themselves when they're tired. I know I am, but a lot of people don't know about that. So uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, a cortisol, issue, sleep deprivation, chronic stress, cortisol, uh, you know, we know that that causes abdominal adiposity and that visceral fat, which is poses risk. So I think it's a lot of things mitochondria we already talked about. Um, so you, you think stress plays, plays a big part. And, and it's interesting with the cortisol and when your body like tries to make cortisol, it secretes Cortical control from releasing hormone, what actually really is a huge stimulator of mast cells. Yeah. And so stress equals inflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation equals mitochondrial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so we're we're back to your to your core thinking. Everything comes back to mitochondria. Yeah. And then the one thing that you mentioned earlier that was really uh, valuable is how immune dysfunction plays into that. So the effects between cortisol and immune regulation, there's a very tight link right there. And so chronic stress, I, you know, why do we, so many women after the age of 30 have autoimmune conditions? Well, the thymus gland involutes, we're not producing those thymus peptides, we get set up for yep. a perfect, perfect storm for autoimmunity, right? So- Yeah, and it's interesting, you look at, you know, I don't wanna bash on doctor, you know, but like endocrinologists, they don't, look at the immune system mm -hmm. and they don't think let's say you have Hashimoto's or other autoimmune I mean they say oh they'll just treat the thyroid but you find you know that you look at their immune system and really you can look at the immune system and tell how healthy a person is mm -hmm. and with dysfunctional immune system they are going to get all these diseases of aging yeah, and after when the you know the thymus the involutes and when we're 45, it's basically a fraction, about you know five percent of what it was, and so that immune system's off, which then again causes the the um, all that oxidative stress, makes you much more prone to autoimmunity. Worse with women, you know, so they tend to get autoimmunity, and instead of just like you know going after the damage and say, oh, we'll try to limit the damage. Why not try to fix the underlying immune system, which ties right into mitochondria. The immune system basically uh, affects the mitochondria, the mitochondria affects the immune system. Mm 
So you kind of got to look at everything. And so do you use immune modulating peptides? Yeah, so I've used the, the thymus and alpha, not only in myself, but in patients. And I have seen that one be pretty uh, prolific and effective. Also, the other one that's not really talked about a lot I've used is LL37. So that one upregulates that uh, catholicidin in the gut. So it essentially wakes up the surveillance system in the gut to say, hey, let's get candida out, let's get any gut infection taken care of, because usually the patient will have a low secretory IgA and their immune system is just in the tank and they're not able to actually, you know, identify and kick out the gut pathogen. So I I found that one to be really effective. And now uh, let's, uh, with that, so L037, it's an endogenous antimicrobial peptide. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty amazing that it has such wide array of effects. For instance, studies show that it kills the Lyme cyst better than like the antibiotic tinidazole, which is for that. It works against yeast and parasites and yeah, they find it's low. So you find you, you give it to patients um, and you find, are you looking for infections first? Are you yeah. finding that? And um, dual test GI panel and look for the gut. And, and what are you finding in that? You're finding a lot of patients just have significant parasites or dysbiosis or candida? Candida is a big one. I see a lot of people with candida, especially if they have a history of eczema, psoriasis. It's usually driven by some sort of candida overgrowth or you know gut microbiome imbalance. So we'll address that. And there's a multi-pronged approach, but peptides are just bringing in a, a new level of what we're able to do uh, for patients. Because I've, I've put patients on you know, gut healing protocols, leaky gut, candida protocols. And I just haven't seen anything work as quickly as adding in something like LO37 or TA1, the thymus and alpha-1. It's just, it blows my mind that we're able to actually reintroduce those peptides that are bioidentical to the body. We already make, you know, thymus and alpha and thymus and beta, but to, to add in more of a good substance or add in a signal to help our body make more of what it yeah. knows how to make. And like just it. to explain, so thymus and alpha-1, thymus and beta-4, they're thymic uh, peptides. So as we were talking about, the thymus, it basically, it from age 15 on, it just keeps declining. And so your immune system gets worse and worse. And that's about age 45 is when you start seeing, you get the immune dysfunction, and you start seeing all those issues. And, um, and so the thymus and alpha-1 really increases that thymus, the uh, TH1, and it's approved in uh, 30 countries or so for HIV, cancer, because this side of the immune system not only fights infections, it monitors your body for cancer. And then thymus and beta-4 is a modulator, and then um, BPC-157 lowers that TH2. So you can use these peptides and, and follow that immune system and you find everything gets better. And I don't know, you probably see, you know, SIBO and everyone's like, oh, treat the SIBO. But, you know, there's that gut brain axis, but also the brain gut axis. And I find I, I got in so much trouble with the SIBO guys. I said, I think it's a symptom, not a cause. Because mm -hmm. it's, it is, you get, you basically treat it, it comes back because you got the gut dysfunction from the immune dysfunction that's causing, so you, you know, you can treat it, people feel better, but you still didn't fix the underlying issue, the reason they got SIBO, yeah. That's fascinating, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really, yeah, digging deeper, a little bit deeper, it's the immune dysfunction, it's the mitochondrial dysfunction, it's this really paramount, pivotal, underlying, you know, I, I talk about it like it's seven layers deep. Weight loss is the issue up here, but down here, we got a lot more going on. Yeah, it's like you don't even, yeah, it's it fixes every uh, underlying. You find the gut plays a big role? Yeah, so I have loved using BPC. Uh, I've used the injectable, but I've also used the capsules in a lot of patients for leaky gut. I've found that to be more effective than so many uh, other leaky gut protocols uh, or sometimes in tandem, but usually just BPC alone is just really effective. Yeah. And, and so just so a little plug, shameless plug. So, yeah, we now have the BPC 157 out as a supplement. Um, yep. 
And then TB4, thymus and beta-4, big molecule that again modulates, but it's too big to take orally. It needs to be injectable. But so we found the fragment that actually is orally available and active. So it does all the same things as thymus and beta-4. We did take out the part that stimulates mast cells. So uh, that's, and it also, it's shown to specifically heal the tight junctions. Um, wow. So you get kind of that um, double, the BPC lowering the inflammation, fixing the tight junctions, and we're coming out with KPV added to it. So we're kind of getting off, but it's a, a melanocortin, um, uh, trouble like al alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. So I don't know if you've heard of, you know, melanotan 2, which is like the Barbie doll peptide where you get tan, you lose weight, and you have increased libido. Um, and then PT-141 for libido, which works for erectile dysfunction, if nothing else yeah. works, but it's also very anti-inflammatory. Yeah. But the problem is, is if you take it for inflammation, you'll get tan, which can be good, but I don't know, you may have found it different, but if you're older, it can make all the dark spots darker. But so we oh, took yeah. out the, the small active section, there's only three amino acids, that has all the, uh, the anti-inflammatory properties, but doesn't cause the uh, uh, increase in melanocyte stimulation. So we're adding that orally and it is so anti-inflammatory um, that or you put on, you know, let's say psoriasis within a couple hours, it's, it's so much better. But so that should be coming out in a couple of weeks. Again, shameless plug, uh, but um, okay. yeah, so, um, so with, with the gut, well, what other uh, peptides do you use? Brain peptides, do you like? Yeah, so I have used the C-Max and the Selenc. Uh, Selenc for very specific for anxiety, C-Max more for increasing that BDNF. I've used that in medical students. I've used that in myself just for improving retention and memory. Uh, this could be really effective as well. Have you experimented with those? Yeah, yeah, and uh, we like them, and yeah, and C Lang, you know, very calming. Um, it can be subtle and used over time. Then there's cerebralisin, yeah. um, which I know you've used, and everyone uh, find can work very well, even in like end stage Alzheimer's. Had studies that dramatic improvement, but had to be given IV. Um, mm -hmm. But we are that will be coming out as an oral supplement probably in the next month. So we're excited about that. So and, exciting. Yeah, yeah, that we'll be able to, because uh, for everyone, it's like the peptides were very big and all of a sudden we're worried that, you know, the FDA, I think it's big pharma kind of says, hey, we, you know, we, we don't want to lose all this, all this business. So they're putting pressure on uh, to stop compounding pharmacies. We, and compounding pharmacies may go away. We may not have bioidentical hormones. Um, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> very, very scary and they're doing it behind the scenes. And so we don't know how long. So we're trying to move to bringing these out in a, in a different uh, modality where, right. but uh, I'm worried, but a lot of people just don't know. And, you know, uh, the power of big pharma. Um, let's see. Um, so how do people, what, what would you recommend to a patient? They're like, um, I've been all these doctors, I'm not feeling well. Um, they can call you, they can do telemedicine or do, who do they look for? Yeah, like how did they find me, reach out to me? Yeah, or, or how would they go about finding a doctor if they want someone in their area or? Yeah, so if they're looking specifically for peptide therapies, they could go to the International Peptide Society uh, or A4M, they have a network of doctors. You can usually look up uh, who's a functional medicine doctor or who's a doctor who would be trained in peptides near you. It's, it's few and far between. There's quite a few practitioners that are not trained in it. You and I both are very well versed and you know, are prepared to use that in practice and are always learning too and experimenting on ourselves yeah. with peptides, which is part of the, the experience too. But yeah, they can. Uh, they can go to either one of those sites. Those are pretty reliable places to find a practitioner. Uh, there's some functional medicine trained practitioners. You can go to the Institute of Functional Medicine 
uh, and locate and a doctor. A lot of society is popping up because, and it's interesting that we're now having, you know, been doing this for, I don't know, 20 years, you know, you kind of, it was a small group. And now it's, you know, cardiovascular surgeons in there and they're realizing that they're, you know, and they're just not satisfied of just doing the standard stuff. So I think it is the way of the future. And one of, I think the good things about this COVID is they really expanded telemedicine, correct? Um, and before um, you had to have a license in the state where you would connect with that patient via telemedicine. So, um, but now they rescinded that, hopefully it will stay and because it really opens up access. So you can go to a doctor anywhere in the country, like a patient can say, hey, they want to see you in you know, Florida or whatever it may be. And you do a video first visit before you had to see the patient and they would come out. So um, I, I think that's, that's a, a great thing. Um, Huge win. It, yeah, it's, it's already happening. Like patients are flying, if they live in Florida and their doctors in California, they're gonna fly anyway, just for that initial visit. They're already doing it, it's gonna open up access, I agree. It's gonna be helpful. Yeah, and I think it is hard for patients to figure out because you know, with the internet, it's, hey, who markets the best that, you know, and it's, it's scary. Some of the things are being said out there and, uh, you know, people that say, oh, they're doing this and you go, oh my gosh, or, or I'm sure you've had this, they go to a so-called integrated functional doctor and you're like, oh my gosh, they messed up. And it's giving everyone in our, you know, in, in our, uh, group or the way we practice bad bad name you know I love but, uh, I think you see that with everything um, yeah. but uh, nice nice so um, and did, did you ever do standard medicine uh, so I I as far as like conventional med medical school or practicing conventional yeah. medicine yeah practicing. Well, I'm, I'm really cool both. yeah I had I have not, I have only looked through the lens of uh, holistic functional medicine. That, that's been, I was lucky because my last year of med school, um, I, I was out in San Diego. I was in Seattle for quite a while and training there. And then I uh, came down to San Diego and did a lot of clinicals. And I got exposed to this entire world of regenerative medicine and joint injections and IV therapy and NAD. And, and then, you know, upon graduating peptides. And so that excited me. I actually, I was going to go the conventional route and I job shadowed a bunch of practitioners. And what I really witnessed was the insurance-based model, the 15 minute visits, six prescriptions, walking out on a seventh one, you know, just, I was really depressed thinking about doing that the rest of my life and considered changing my route. And, you know, the doctors are doing the best they can. They're amazing practitioners in, in a lot of ways. It's just the system that's broken. System, so I just didn't want to be a part of yeah. the system. Yeah. And they so can't do this stuff. You know, it's, they have nine minutes and they're judged on, on how cost effective they are, which means not doing testing, not doing therapy, seeing as many patients as they can. So they're, they're, they're stuck. It's not that they're bad people. It's, it's a bad system. And really the doctor and like HMO style who cares the least makes the most, you know, and uh, for us like yourself and it's, if we don't get the patients better, we don't get patients, you know? Exactly. Yes. And so, you know, you, you have to keep learning. And, uh, and I think it is nice. It's now, you know, people 10 years, what do you do? I'm like, Oh, how do I explain this? You know? <laughs> and because, if you mentioned, I mean, I was not going to say alternative and that means no evidence. And when I first got get sick myself and found, Hey, I'm not getting better. I don't want to go to this alternative. And I went to these so-called alternative uh, comfort. I'm like, Oh my God, they're more evidence based than what they're teaching me. Right. Mm -hmm. And now at least I think the medical students, everyone is getting exposed to these things and seeing the difference. Cause I do think it is more evidence based and it's really just practicing better medicine. And I think that's what we do. Absolutely. And I'm a huge fan of uh, looking at the research and the evidence. And I was trained that way, even, you know, very, very, very much so. Um, you know, sourcing what is NAD effective for, what are the research studies, what, and then 
it brings us back to the biochemistry, which is so fun about going to A4M. It's just, I get to dive back into all these pathways that I forgot about since med school. And now they're all relevant and they mean something to me. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's weird. Yeah. It brings you back to, you know, second year of medical school or yeah. most of that. Oh, forget that. Just wait for the drug rep to come in and tell me what med. And, you know, now it's like so algorithmic. They have this, I can give them this drug or this drug, you know? And so it's, yeah, it's, I think being a medical detective, it's, it's much more satisfying, um, you know, I find. I think that's what practitioners do in this fine. And so much more satisfying seeing patients get better that have been so many other standard, you know, good doctors, but in a bad system. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Uh, keep, keep up the great work. And uh, it was very nice chatting with you. And thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Do you feel like you might miss any of these incredible interviews? Um, don't want to miss them. I know it's uh, very tough to who has the time to sit in one uh, fell swoop and watch all all these uh, great uh, uh, physicians, you know, talk about their their secrets with peptides. Um, but yeah, you know, with all this great information be shared, you can I can certainly understand not being able to sit through all of them at once. But don't worry, you can uh, pick up your VIP all access pass at a special discount rate right now. So you can have a lifetime on-demand access to the entire summit and all the bonus gifts as well. So go ahead and grab your VIP access now by clicking on the button below so you can watch, listen, and even read the transcripts at your own leisure.